Good morning, everyone. My name is John Duvall. I'm actually the current president of the Kentucky Maple Surf Association. Glad you all could be here today. This is a wonderful crowd to have for our in-person uh, Maple School again. I uh, just want to do some quick uh, introductions. I'm John. This is Dave Barker. He's our vice president. Uh, we have Kaylin uh, Colston. She's our secretary. Uh, other board members is Richard Hines. Uh, Jeff Webb is in the back. We're missing Jimmy uh, Sizemore. He is at the top of Mount Kant, I believe, right now. And uh, Seth Long will be here a little bit later today. I believe that's all our board members. So uh, Dave's going to give us some uh, announcements, and then we're going to get started. A great day of education and learning, and lots of fun today. Um, so it's really exciting to see this many people here. Um, so John and myself and Kaylin, so we're kind of new to KMSA. I mean, KMSA has been around for a while but it's kind of been reincarnated from um, its premature death because of COVID, I guess, kind of the, you know, kind of went by the wayside. And also, I think Seth was the original president of KMSA, and he just, I think he got inundated with a lot of work, and so he wasn't able to spend, you know, maybe as much time as he wanted with the organization. Um, but so we've, we've kind of like reinvigorated the organization for this year, and, and I think this kind of you know, amount of people here kind of shows what the interest is. Um, and I, I know a lot of people are here just out of general interest, maybe you're not big producers, um, but it is nice to see like there's so much interest. I think a lot of people are surprised that you can you know, even make maple products in Kentucky. Um, so it's, it's nice to see that there is so much interest. Um, so if, you, if you're not currently a member, uh, you can sign up for a membership on the flyer. I think there's, a, there's either a QR code on there or a link to sign up. Um, so the benefits of being a member, I think, are, you know, there's, there's several. One is, <clears throat> I think the most important is, it's just, you know, it's a wealth of information. A lot of camaraderie. Um, a lot of people start this, you know, their maple journey pretty small and then, and then grow as time goes by. And you're always learning. And I think that's that's one of the interesting things about it is you're always learning about the process. You're always learning new techniques and what other people are doing. And so by becoming a member, you know, it's a wealth of information that you get from other people to see how they've accomplished you know, what they've done and what they've learned along the way. Um, and being in the South, there's, I think we even have our own unique set of challenges, <clears throat> apart from typical maple production in the Northeast, uh, because of the weather. And um, so I, I think it's interesting to be able to talk to other producers in the area to find out what they've done to, like, overcome some, some of the challenges based on the weather. Um, so how many people here are actively, have actively made maple syrup or in the past? So it was last year the worst season you've ever had? Because it was, I think it was for us. Um, we've had a couple of bad ones in the past five or six years, but last year was absolutely terrible. It, was, um, it started out looking really good. We had a hard freeze in December and I remember thinking during that when that freeze was going on, going on that it was going to be a great season. You know, start up cold. That's to me. That's always what signals you know start of a good good season is when it starts out cold and starts to warm up. So when that cold spell like started to thaw out, I was like, yes, it's going to be a great season. And we had some good runs after the thaw, but then we just had a a spell of like. You know, it was a week of like 70 degree weather, and it's just like this is terrible, you know. And um, so, but getting back to my original thing, so being able to talk to other, you know, other producers in this area and find out how they deal with some of these issues, I think is is useful. Um, so we've got some, we've got a great lineup of speakers here today to talk about different aspects of syrup production. Um, some basics, some more, um, you know, some more technical aspects of it. Um, so I think it's going to be a, a good presentation. 
So our first speaker is going to be Nate. Is that right, Nate Hassel? Yeah. Okay. Nate is a is a huge maple syrup producer in Ohio, and um, Nate has really taken maple almost to another level, um, just in the in the size of his operation and also what he's done with like aftermarket value added products. And um, this will be really interesting to hear from from Nate. So. Nate, come on up. Okay. Thank you. I'm uh, I'm excited. I'm uh, excited for you guys. Um, last night, Fred and I grabbed some pizza. I hope you don't mind. I asked Fred to help me and his wife Cheryl. They've been helping me for about 12 years growing this business, and they've seen everything from. We had, uh, you know, firewood evaporator. He's kind of watched us grow, and Fred and his wife Cheryl really helped build our business. And I thought it would be good because he's going to give me some truth up here. <laughs> and then you can ask any one of us questions. But uh, we went to grab pizza last night, and we sat there, and somebody had recognized us and came over, and we sat with some producers here. So if you're in the association, and you help put this event on. John, stand up, stand up. This is uh, what you guys have done. This is important, education, camaraderie. So yeah, raise your hand if you are in the association and you help put this on. This is a big deal, great job. So last night, we sat down and as we started asking people questions, um, we realized that you, know, you are where I was. And you're all learning, you're just starting, um, or you have 100 taps, 50 taps, 30 taps. I'm here to tell you, that's okay. Like, you don't have to apologize to me. I was you and I've been there and I've spilled sap down my boot in January and February. So, Hopefully this can be relatable. Um, I think I'm gonna talk more about the humanity of things than I am the techno technology and maple production. There's plenty of people here that will be able to talk about that stuff. I'm gonna talk about the stuff no one wants to talk about. As a business owner, you know, farmers are entrepreneurs. And we're gonna talk about some of those things. And, I realized one thing I said last night is I started talking to everybody and they were kind of apologetic. Well, I only have 30 taps. I said, this is great. You guys haven't been ruined yet. <laughs> Nobody's given you a bunch of ideas that, you know, Fred, I'll let Fred talk a little bit about some of that. But I had, I got up at 2.30 this morning and went downstairs because I, after meeting everybody, I had a whole plan on what I was going to talk about and then I realized there's probably some better things to talk about that will be helpful for you. And that's what I'm hoping for you is that at the end of this, this is helpful, it's an encouragement, um, and that you're excited. And you know, you guys were here an hour before it started, the parking lot was full. This is great. The excitement for Maple in Kentucky was great. So we talked about the association. I realize also that my father gave me such a head start. <laughs> And I want to be clear that large scale is all perspective. I am not a large scale maple syrup operation compared to some that I've been to. It's very humbling to go to a place that has 260,000 taps. And you realize how small of a producer you know, we are, even in, in the southern part of the United States. So it's very humbling to go visit. And I encourage you, any one of you, if you ever are up in Northeast Ohio, I open my doors, I want producers to see. I will, that's the only thing they let me do anymore is give tours. <laughs> I've been fired from every job. I get to give tours and make YouTube videos. Those are the only two <laughs> things I get to do. But you are all welcome. Because uh, David Marvin, who owns Butternut Mountain Farm, and Bruce Bascom, who owns Bascom Maple Farm, they did it for me. And they were not, they were open and welcome, and they <coughs> would ask questions and they were open with information. And I think you'll find that uh, the people who hoard information and are, have fear that somebody's going to steal their customer, 
Um, hopefully we'll go through that a little bit, that that is just a human nature thing. It's not the reality of things. Um, so Nate, you consider Ohio Southern? Um, part of it. I mean, Cincinnati's pretty much Florida. I mean, <laughs> Yes, I, I do. Uh, we're fortunate to be on, on Lake Erie, and I like that we should have some interactive uh, discussions because I'm here for you, not to get up here and tell you how awesome I am, and I actually want to talk about a lot of the mistakes I've made because I think that will help break down any sort of um, ideas of what being a farmer and an entrepreneur is. So in 2011, I was introduced to my mentor, and I had a professional career. I was very good at what I did. Um, and I thought a lot of myself. And my mentor, who introduced us, we went to a coffee shop in the harbor, which on Lake Erie, there's some ports. And in Asheville, there's a coffee shop called the Harbor Perk. And my friend Mark said, hey, I'd like to introduce you to somebody. And we went down, we had coffee, and I thought, very highly of what I had built. Um, and I'd look back and I'd say that's age appropriate. I was very proud, but what we know is limited as individuals and what we don't know is unlimited. And to have a mentor, the one thing I will say is the patience he had to sit across from us. You know, I was a man, but I was a snot nosed, know everything you know, finished grad school in business, I'm a scientist, I'm a chemist, and darn it, we make the best bourbon barrel aged maple syrup, and this man's super wealthy, and obviously super wealthy people get there by stealing from young entrepreneurs. <laughs> That's how he got his money, so therefore, I didn't want to open up. I didn't want to, I thought, well, he, of course he wants my business. How, give me some words, like how, Oh my, yes. <laughs> oh my, yes. And my sister would agree with that. Like, how, like, how much did I, th I thought a lot of myself. <clears throat> and he said, well, Nate, I work for coffee. So anytime you would like to meet, uh, I'd like to come in and, you know, I'd be happy to talk. I work for coffee. Six months later, I was finally ready for that coffee. Because we had hired some people, and as soon as you hire people, it's a whole other world. <laughs> and what you expect and uh, Tim came to the farm and met my father and uh, we sat down at a little wood stove in the original sugar house with my family and we're drinking coffee and I'm telling them about all the problems I'm telling them about how Tanya doesn't understand margins she's in charge of production and she can't understand how to make a profit and Tracy she's doing this and this and this he listened to me for an hour <laughs> and then uh, he said uh, Nate, I, I know exactly what's wrong with your company. And I was like relieved, because I had been looking. And he goes, oh, could I have a cup of coffee? Yeah, yeah, I run over, get him another cup, and I sit down, and so you were about to tell me what, what's wrong with the, the business. And he goes, yeah, I, I know exactly what's wrong with the business. It's you. <laughs> and I have to tell you that was a relief, because I was looking everywhere else. <clears throat> I'm responsible for everything and I was trying to put it on others, and boy, it was a relief. I drove home, sat in my driveway, I cried for a half hour because it was such a relief to finally know what the problem was because you can't fix it if you don't know. That was one of the most eye-opening moments. What do you, I, you would agree, Fred, one of the most eye-opening moments of the career or of building this business. I tell people it's an overnight success story, 20 years in the making. We'll get into a little bit of the maple and how we grew it, but I, I wanted to kind of establish this a little bit because you go to these things and everybody goes up front and tells you how brilliant they are and you know there's no such thing as a self-made man which leads me to 2018 it was the hardest year of my life uh, we had built something amazing I didn't think would end we were the first company to scale bourbon barrel aged maple syrup and we had uh, started getting large orders. Um, we probably had no business getting these orders, but we did, and we made it work. And for a couple years, it worked really well, and we were getting $8 for an eight ounce bottle of um, 
bourbon barrel aged maple syrup. So if you think about that as one dollar per fluid ounce. And we were just riding high. I can tell you the first time we got that first check, you know, paid for the first order, it was, uh, I checked my bank account. Because every now and then you know you can get on your bank account and you can listen. And the little automated voice would talk to you, you know. And I listened to it and it said, you have one million, da da da. And I was just like, wow, honey, listen to this. And then, you know, I go through it, listen to this. And the next day I had like $37 because I had to pay all my bills. <laughs> but <laughs> you, you remember these moments. But the reason I'm telling you about 2018 is because it was the hardest year of my life because that customer canceled the third year or the fourth year. We only got three years of that project. And I had already bought the syrup. I had already put it in bourbon barrels. And I owed everybody money. I owed Fred money. I owed my grandmother money. <clears throat> I don't wish this on my worst enemy. The amount of pain and agony of not knowing what to do. <clears throat> I don't wish it on anybody. And I talk about this freely because I don't want anybody to ever have to go through this without knowing you can reach out and talk to somebody. But I was having thoughts a grown man with three sons should not have. Because I wanted the pain to go away. And I kept trying to get back. Because I'm like, that God, I've gone through this so many times. I could always get back. You know, you could work really hard. I could go manic and work like 10 men for a week, not sleep. And I kept trying to get back and I couldn't. And I, I looked back as I was re reflecting on this last night and early this morning. I'm so thankful that Kelsey called 10 men. And he showed up, and I'm like, what the heck are you doing here? He's like, we need to talk. And we sat down at a table, and he's like, I know what's going on. He's like, let's grab a pen, and grab a paper, and let's start making a list. And I could not use the <coughs> pen and paper. That's how uh, clouded my mind was. I couldn't write it. And he, uh, he said, this is way, way worse than I thought. He said, you need to go see somebody. And I did. I went and got help. I went to a counselor, and they prescribed me some medication. I believe it was called Lexapro. And it was the first time I had slept in probably over six months. Because when you aren't sleeping, it just compounds everything. Saved my life. Saved my life. And the reason I'm telling you this first, because I want you to know I'm human. I want you to know that the successes come with a lot of hard times, too. And we're still going to laugh today. There's going to be some funny things. I only have an hour, and I could probably talk all day. But I did want to tell you those three stories about my time with Tim and how important that mentorship was. Do you think Tim has been healthy for me? Very good. I think Tim has been healthy for me. And um, I wanted to start with that. Um, and then tell you that, you know what, uh, some of the people that were on my team at that time uh, ended up exiting. Um, you know, it's 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 my fault. I think Tim said you you hired babies and then you treated them like babies, which made it worse. And some people exited, and the team that was left with me, you know what they said? We got you. We fought back. We, oh, I'm sorry. The team that was with me fought back. They said we got you, and we fought back. And over the course of three years, we paid off. All of our debt and um, we're stronger than ever and I think the important thing is is you should know that this had to happen because I wasn't gonna listen to anybody I thought I invented accounting <laughs> right uh, I wasn't gonna listen to anybody it had to happen this had I had to get broke down all the way to the bare base bones so I could become a leader again and listen because I'd walk into a room and say, here's the problem, this is how I think we're gonna fix it, what do you think? And as a board member now, what I'm, the important thing, I've learned how to become a better board member on a, a nonprofit, but also a better owner of a business, it's really hard, you need to talk last. You need to reserve your opinion, because the quietest voice on your team actually has equal say and to the loudest voice. Guess who the loudest voice was? So now it's very different how I run my business and I had to learn this because there were probably people that would have told me had I given them the opportunity to speak up. 
So just remember that when you have quorum and you have a board, allow everybody to talk before you do. You're the president, I'm talking to you, John. Don't give your opinion, because if everybody talks, your opinion may change. And don't even nod your head if someone's talking. If you nod your head, because people want you to be happy. They want to tell you what you want to hear. They want to be on your side. But the truth is you want everybody's brain involved. If it's her brain and his brain and his brain and your brain, it's going to be way more powerful of a team than if it's just, this is how I think we need to run this organization. <laughs> That's my caution for an association. Make sure the quietest voice has equal say to the loudest voice. What else do you think would be helpful, Fred? I was just going to say, probably a lot of you are either just getting into sugaring or you know have just started whatever. My advice would be run. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're probably going to get addicted, <laughs> and eventually you're going to end up like. <laughs> When he cuts himself, he bleeds maple syrup. I love this. I'm doing what I was born to do. I'm doing what I was created to do. And let me tell you about the first time Fred came to Bissell Maple Farm and we were sitting. And I said, well, Mr. Shelatz, I can't afford to pay you what you're worth. And I, that was the truth. He had owned an appliance repair business for 45 years. And he had experience. He had experience with people. And this is a man, I remember we bought that Ford pickup truck it was an F550. I was so excited we needed it to haul sap and um, haul a tanker and plow snow. And I was so excited. And I, sent, I said, Fred, I made a deal. And I, I handed him like $7,000 to go pick up that truck. And he comes back and he hands me $1,000. I said, Fred, I already made a deal. He says, I know, but we looked it over and I made a better one. <laughs> <laughs> to have a man like that in your corner. Fred is well known within the maple industry. Uh, they know him in Vermont. They know him in Wisconsin. Um, Fred, how much maple experience did you have before coming to work at Bissell Maple Farm? I thought Aunt Jemima was pure maple experience. <laughs> 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 Slide over this way a little, Fred, so you can make sure you're in the shot. Um, one of the great things about Fred is he wasn't ruined yet. And my father and I, really kind of built this over, you know, from 1998 to, you know, 2008 is really kind of the beginnings of where you're at now. Uh, my dad had 17 to 30 taps growing up, and 30 taps was a lot. And he would make the syrup, uh, finish the syrup on the wood stove in the kitchen, filter it, and I was raised with it because his dad did it and his dad did it. And I realized how grateful I am for that experience because when I went off to college, I didn't realize not everybody had pure maple syrup. <laughs> so when I went to college, that was the, I missed it more than anything. So I'd come home in spring break, and I'd put up 300 buckets. And then I'd leave. <laughs> and my dad would have to do all the work. <laughs> this is also how I bribed my college professor so I wouldn't flunk out of college. I'd come back quarts, <laughs> quarts of maple syrup. Um, actually, I found the smartest person in the class and always studied with that person. It's really how we did it. But one of the interesting things is the first year, Fred kind of observed. He was really interested because Fred raises beef cattle. Um, always, he'd raise hogs if Cheryl would let him. Um, always in ag, had, had a herd, would do um, hay. So this is something in Northeast Ohio, it's pretty, it's in our culture. And Fred watched the first year, and the second year, he just made an observation. Because my dad and I, we are polar opposites. He has a green thumb. I do not. That's why maple's good for me. I can't kill a tree. It's been there 100 years. It's got a good chance of living. So my dad and I are polar opposites, which is great. But Fred goes, why don't you guys, uh, why don't you guys tap your trees before the season starts? So here we've been doing it, my family's been doing it for six generations, and here's an outsider who's never done it, making an observation. Give your opinion as to how we, uh, how would you describe how we decided when to tap? Oh, well, it was painful. <laughs> <laughs> well, we always tap when the crocuses do whatever, I don't know what crocuses. 
we never tapped before President's Day and blah, blah, blah. And uh, so that year we tapped, we started tapping. January? 10,000 taps. We probably started tapping between Christmas and New Year's. We were making syrup the first week in January. And, oh, really? So we had the best year, I think, ever. But, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a process. Uh, it was interesting. It was fun. The uh, growth, right, in the last 20 years of the experience, we went from buckets to tubing with vacuum. Uh, convinced my dad it was okay to tap a, sh a soft maple because you don't tap soft maples with buckets. That's that was, and there's truth to that because the sugar maple has probably 50% more sugar, which is less water you need to boil out. So I understand his perspective, but once you're on vacuum, we we realized that actually the soft maple we call them red. We'll say soft maple and red maple interchangeably, but there's probably silver in there. That's 60 to 70% of what we tap. That's at our farm. We also tap in a Boy Scout camp. That's there are three sugar maples in that system that I found, uh, but it's predominantly soft maple, and that was a change for us. And how many people here tap predominantly soft maple? Is the syrup okay? Yeah, it's a little darker. I found uh, it'll run sooner, so the sugar maples will run a little later. So the sap will run sooner on the soft maples. And at the end, the soft maples will, the chemistry will change a little bit while the sugar maples are still giving you good sap. But there's that sweet window in the beginning. And uh, the syrup at the beginning and end, there's a market for any syrup, just so everybody knows. But I think it'd be a good time to maybe talk about barrel leaf syrup and then open it up for questions. Because my, I really want to help you not bloviate about it. Uh, so, this actually ties to Kentucky, but not in the way you would think. First person I ever bought bulk maple syrup from was Irv Gingrich, an Amish man in Middlefield, Ohio. Uh, and his family makes some of the best syrup I ever had. And I remember writing a home equity check for $20,000, and you know, it was like $3 a pound. And I, re I will always remember that. It was the first time I ever bought syrup from another farmer to keep up with orders. And I will talk about how that's okay. That's okay. I'm not lying. I'm open about it. In fact, my customers like the fact that I'll never run them out of syrup. And my relationship with those farmers is important because I wouldn't have a business otherwise. But he called me up and he said, Nate, I've got some syrup here from Kentucky I'd like you to try. Really? They make syrup in Kentucky? <laughs> this is probably about 10 years ago, 10, 11 years ago. So I drove over there and there was about 20 drums they were white plastic drums, and um, that's at the time was probably twenty five, thirty thousand dollars worth of maple syrup sitting there. He said these these fellas in Kentucky made the syrup, and they went and got food grade drums. The reason I'm telling you this story is because you can be penny wise, pound foolish. And I tasted it, and it had a lemon flavor. Ooh. But it was a natural lemon. It was like dumb, dumb sucker, like floor soap lemon. Like the fake lemon. Like, because at the time we made barbecue sauce that included lemon juice. So Irv was thinking, he really wanted to help these guys. They had sent samples up to Bruce Bass, and he says, I can't use this. And I thought, holy cow. These guys didn't want to go buy drums. So they did what the logical thing would be, and go find some cheap, Food grade drums, but what happens with plastic is it's porous. And whatever was in there was probably never heated to too hard using these little eight gallon, you know, casks. And we'd fill them with hot syrup. It was awesome. Anybody who tried it, by it, I mean, it, it was a completely new market. I thought I invented this, I did not. The man who invented bourbon barrel aged maple syrup in this country, his name is Steve Stallard. He owns a company called Bliss Maple, pronounced Blee, and it stands for because life is short. And that man invented it 10 years prior. He had a 20 year runway before anybody figured it out. And uh, Steve and I have become pretty good friends. Uh, we started a craft maple syrup festival and invited him. And he was the first honorary person to get that uh, award. And we call it the Stevie. 
and uh, because he's actually was a trailblazer. And I, I bought, there was three companies making it, and I bought everybody's and I tasted his and I said, man, this one's the best. So I tried to make my flavor as close to his as possible. So what eventually happens is your sales go like this and your barrel supply becomes an issue. And right now, there's a secondary barrel supply issue. Um, makes you wonder how some companies are making a bunch of bourbon barrel aged maple syrup when you can't get barrels, <laughs> right? But uh, if you have the right relationships, you can still get barrels. But eventually we had to go with bigger barrels because they ran out of the small ones. Do you know why people use small barrels? Because you can move them? That's thinking like a maple farmer. <laughs> you have to get more surface area to the maple volume. You get more surface area to the maple volume. Uh, even on the distillery side, you get more surface area to the spirit volume, which means that you can make a sellable product quicker. So instead of a four or five year, you can make it in eight months. And the way that's made is the oscillation of that uh, alcohol goes in and out of the oak, and it goes in what color? What color does it go into a barrel? Boy, you know, this is the state to ask this question. <laughs> because you could ask that in other states, they don't know. You, I heard 20 people say, clear. And it comes out what color? Amber. Like a brownish. And Kentucky. What color is sap? Clear. clear. What color does it come out of the evaporator? Brown. Do you know how similar uh, the processes that are actually occurring is, is they take an oak, white oak, American white oak barrel, they char the inside. They're actually charring and burning oak sugar. And that oak sugar is what is giving the flavor to the spirit. When we make maple syrup, we're actually controlled burning the sugar to give it the color and flavor. It's caramel. I love caramel. Bourbon's about that caramel. Maple's about that caramel. I didn't know that going in, but all we're doing is mixing maple sugar with oak sugar. And it's very interesting how well they go together. This is the one product that, out of all the craft maple products, it tastes pretty good. There's a lot of them out there. And uh, this is the one that I think has the most staying power. But eventually we ran out of small barrels and we started to have to go on big barrels. And if you fill a big bourbon barrel full of maple syrup, you get something that tastes like maple syrup and smells like bourbon. And then we tried all the things that you're thinking, well, why don't you use a barrel more than once? Because you can't even use a big barrel once. That's why I'm very curious how people are making barrel aid syrup with big barrels. So what we do is we use a big barrel three times. <coughs> and it turns out that a 30 gallon or 25 gallon <coughs> bourbon barrel with maple syrup gave us exactly what we wanted. So we would make two of the 10 gallon barrels and two of the 55, get 53 gallon barrels, we'd mix that and that gave us the flavor that we wanted. And we found out that the, the formula for the small 30 gallon barrels was exactly the same as three 53 gallon barrels. So we work three times harder than anybody thinks we do. And I used to keep that a secret and then I realized no one's gonna work that hard. <laughs> no one's gonna work that hard. And I, and I guess I wanted to talk a little bit about barrel aged syrup because here I am, 1,200 taps in Northeast Ohio. How can I make a difference? How can I sell my product? How can I beat the people who I look up to and I go, wow, these guys are packing a lot of syrup. How do I, we change the story. Change the story. First year we did a food, uh, food show in the IAC Center in Cleveland. We had a booth and we took every maple product we had, buddy. We had maple cream, maple candy, maple peanuts, maple pecans, uh, maple cream. Sounds like Bubba from Forrest Gump. About like the <laughs> <laughs> maple candy. We had every maple product in our, our booth. We were so proud of all the products that we made. And what would happen was is people would like walk by and they're almost like intimidated. And we went back the next year and we said, well, no, we're not doing that. We're taking one product. I had the barrel aged syrup at that time. We just took one product. And they voted us best new vendor. <laughs> <laughs> like didn't even know that we were there. And then we were the best new vendor and there was a line. 
we confused the consumer with everything else we had because we were so proud of all the products. Really good products, excellent products, amazing products. But the consumer was just inundated with all this maple. We just changed our story to, hey, we got bourbon barrel aged maple syrup. Would you try, like to try some? Just ask the question. People can react how they want. It's either yes or eh, right? You're going to get a face. Don't react to it. It's, it's their loss. So give samples. If you sample it, you will sell it. And we had a line, didn't we? And that built our business. Bourbon barrel aged maple syrup really built our business. And um, I guess the, that is the two things they asked me to talk about is how we went from small to a larger size company and talk about the barrel aged business and how we do it. And, um, we're really good at it. We do it for a lot of companies now. And we used to drive down to Lexington, Kentucky. And uh, we got gypped on a lot of barrels. We learned a lot of hard lessons. Barrels are a perishable item, just like fruit, like bananas, like apples. And they saw us Ohio boys coming from a mile away with our little sprinter we would rent from Hertz and drive down and they'd fill it up. We'd get back and fill it full of syrup and go, huh, this stuff doesn't taste good. So we had to learn to get fresh barrels, not decoration barrels. And we learned a lot of hard lessons, and I wanted to share them. And I think, I hope at the end of this, I can save you a lot of heartache, a lot of, uh, uh, tell you the mistakes I've made, so, yeah. Um, when you're done using your bourbon barrels, uh, is there a market for that used barrel for it to go back to the distillery or go back to a, a maybe a beer maker or a, another? That's a great question. The question he's asking is, after you're done using the maple barrel, is there a market for that barrel? Is that the question? Absolutely. What's that barrel worth after maple's been in it? Is it more or less than bourbon? Should be more. We lose about a quart of syrup per barrel. Should be more. Um, there is definitely a market for it. I would partner with a spirits company, a smaller distillery. I would get together as a group and I would try to buy, because what we'll do is, as humans, somebody will say, I got eight barrels. The first thing you're thinking is, man, I don't need eight. Uh, no, thank you. Don't do that. Say yes. And then call your friends. Share it. Co-op. Um, I think one of the important things I wanted to share today was the idea that success is limited. Is, that's called a zero-sum fallacy. And this is common especially in any, any industry, in office settings, in jobs. We think in terms of there's only a limited amount of success. That's a fallacy. What's a fallacy? Falsehood. A falsehood that's readily believed. I'll give you an example. If Nate's doing well out here selling barrel aged syrup, somewhere out here somebody's just getting gypped. That's a fallacy. Because we found that it brought new people to the maple industry. I wasn't stealing everybody else's maple customers. I was actually bringing people that never wanted maple, but they liked bourbon. That's interesting, right? But the zero sum fallacy, if someone's successful somewhere out here, that it's a balance, that is a lie. Success is not limited. So you're close knit. Everybody knows everybody. You should be encouraging each other. You should be helping each other. If you're successful, you're more likely to be successful. Is this a common thought process? Even in offices, if I have somebody in my company, not the team I have now, I have a rock star team. But in the past, if someone's getting a little bit more success, oh, we gotta, you ever heard the term, knock them down a few pegs, bring them back down? Why? Why? You should be happy for that individual. If any of you have success, I want you to be better than me. Why should I be rooting against anybody in, the, in this industry, in any agricultural industry? I brought Fred up here and haven't let him talk much. <laughs> and I, I, I really would like to give Fred the floor as much as possible, so any questions, feel free. Have you tried putting uh, sap in the barrel, either pre or post RO prior to boiling? 
No, but I already know by trying to make maple sugar with bourbon barrel aged maple syrup, the actual uh, flavor is held in the water molecule. And once you run your evaporator, that's gonna leave with the water. So uh, we figured out that the flavor is actually held. If maple syrup is 66% sugar and the balance is water, the water is what actually holds the off flavor. The lemon, the lemon's held in the water. So in all reality, if you wanted to, you could have taken that lemon syrup, diluted it down, made it right back into sap, and recooked it, moved, removed the water, are you gonna get it all out? No. No. There's something called an, well, in this case, um, until you remove all of the water, you're not gonna remove the off flavor. That's why, uh, can bourbon barrel aged maple syrup ever be 0% alcohol? <clears throat> this is Nate the chemist talking. I'm asking. No. No, it cannot. Because there's something called an azeotrope. Those darn azeotropes. They hold on. It's basically water will bond to alcohol and it will not let go until all the water's gone. So you can never get it down to zero. Has anybody seen a, or a, a drum of maple syrup or a pail of maple syrup expand, balloon up, wasn't in the proper storage? Anybody ever see that? Oh, geez, Brandon has. You've seen it. What's causing that? Fermentation. There's actually a lot of naturally occurring alcohol in maple syrup. We don't particularly like it. And then once it becomes alcohol, it becomes what? Vinegar. Nobody wants to cut into their pancake or waffle and taste vinegar. <laughs> However, if you make maple vinegar and they know they're getting vinegar, that's a whole other story. Same so, <laughs> go ahead. Have you worked with any distilleries on doing like specific small batch stuff with their? Yeah, I. Let me. Uh, can you <coughs> ask your question in a different way? Sorry, I'm from Bar Street. Um, <laughs> um, have you worked with a distillery using their particular barrels to market their particular product for like small batch? Absolutely. Her question is, is, have we ever worked with a distillery to make small batch, uh, a small batch bourbon barrel aged maple syrup? It's actually uh, become a nice little business for us. Uh, we're all not blind to the fact that the craft brewing industry, is it declining or increasing? What was that? Increasing. Craft brewing? Decreasing. Yeah, it's, it's not a, uh, we grew, uh, basically we've, hit the peak, and now we're on the tail end. So, so many people got into it, invested into it. They get to the end of their career, they want to retire and start a brewery. They started a lot of breweries, and when you have a lot of something, what happens to the price? You can't get the margins. I'm not saying the craft beer industry isn't a good industry to sell your barrels or partner with just maple syrup and beer. What I'm saying is, is there's another industry that's growing really fast that is really, has a lot of ties to this state. Distilling, uh, it's growing fast. So a lot of people don't have a product to sell. They start a distillery and they have to wait. And then they'll get a couple barrels. But you can give them a product right away that they can sell in their stores. Somebody can walk in. If you don't like bourbon, you may like bourbon barrel aged maple syrup. You have more market to sell your brand and move it, and that is something I highly recommend. There's, is there a lot of distilleries in Kentucky? <laughs> you guys, there's plenty of business in this state, and I highly recommend barrel aged maple syrup as a way to get higher margins for your syrup. How long do you keep your maple syrup in the Oh, this is the truth. This is a great question. How long do we keep our maple syrup in the barrel? And I think the industry knows this, we just don't want to say it. Um, how long does it take us to get flavor in, a, in our bourbon barrel aged maple syrup, Fred? A couple hours. Yeah, a couple hours. <coughs> does anybody like that story? Wow. Now, I can make barrel aged maple syrup in about two hours. Wow. Here's the deal. Nobody likes that story. <coughs> so how long does it take to get the flavor? Yeah. Time doesn't matter. <laughs> Does it matter for bourbon? Yes. Yes. People love that story. They want to hear how long. I'll leave it in that barrel however long you want. 
<laughs> so if I have customers that want me to make barrel aged maple syrup for them, I will ask them, how long do you want me to leave in the barrel? I get the flavor in about a day. So how long would you like me to leave it in there so you can tell your customers? Because what do the customers care about? Yeah. What do the customers care about? Story. 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 What should you care about? The story. <laughs> Farmers, we're funny. We think because we make it that our opinion matters. <laughs> our opinion does not matter. I'm going to say that again because that's kind of a profound thing and it's been a hard lesson for me. My opinion on maple syrup does not matter. We're going to say it together. <laughs> Are you ready? My opinion on maple syrup does not matter. The sooner you get your head around that, the better off you'll be as a business owner. <coughs> because I used to get farmers that would walk into our store and go, bourbon beer, I'll eat maple syrup, I'm not going to buy the bourbon beer. I don't even like it. What was the attempt of that woman? What was she attempting to do? Discredit Why would you say it loud? Discredit you. Discredit me. What, what else? Drop the price of sales down. Yeah. Remember the scale? Zero <laughs> sales. And I thought to myself, I'm like, whoa, that's good, because you don't buy it. No one in here buys maple syrup. Yet we think our opinion matters on maple syrup pricing. It's, you can get things two of three ways. Good, fast, or cheap. Pick two. And farmers, we want all three all the time. What do we call a customer that wants things good, fast, and cheap, Fred? Amish. <laughs> That there's a greater than zero percent chance that we get canceled by making. <laughs> I was gonna say a bad customer, <laughs> but yeah, bad customer. Don't be a bad customer. But I, uh, let's ask questions. I, I do want to. His insight on this is so important and valuable for you. Go ahead. When you were scaling up, you said you started with buckets, presumably that was on your own land. Mm -hmm. And then at some point you were buying syrup, not even sap, I guess, but syrup mm -hmm. syrup for some people. So in between, I'm way down on the sure. smaller yeah, side. So where are you using thumb taps on a neighbor's land? Mm -hmm. But so do you have any experience and information or um, help on how you might lease taps or did you lease taps from anyone in between? Yeah, so the question is, have we, how would you go about approaching somebody about leasing taps? What's the most important thing about making syrup? What do you need? Trees. The trees. You need sap, but you need the trees. And I think I'm going to talk about this a little bit, but make sure if I don't answer your question, because I do this sometimes, I go on a tangent, but make sure that I come back to it. Because um, I want to talk about, at about a thousand taps, you break even. That's on vacuum. And that's selling bulk syrup, but I highly recommend building your own market as much as possible, but I'm gonna say that again, at about 1,000 taps, it's a break-even venture. I don't care how uh, much cotton candy you sell. Um, cotton candy is very profitable, but 1,000 taps on vacuum, you break even. Yes? And that's assuming that $1 an ounce price, correct? No, no, that's assuming the bulk price. The bulk price. Yeah, you'll get your money back in the effort that you put in. So I know that we're not all there. I was you, and I thought I could go and build my business by doing 200 buckets here, and 200 buckets there, and 300, and you, you're, you become a star. You're just making a star everywhere, running all over the country. And I, I guess I'm trying to help you, like cut, you know, save, save you from the pain, if you want to be saved from the pain. <laughs> like, I wish, that I would have just went out and borrowed the money at the beginning and put 2,000 taps on vac vacuum because I would have made my money back with less hassle, less energy, faster. But we don't like doing that. See, the, the reason I've been able to build this business is because I'm stinking stubborn and I won't quit. My biggest weakness is I'm stinking stubborn and I won't quit. So I'm just trying to help you understand that I put five additions on my sugar house. By the time I built my addition, it was too small the day it got finished, before it was even finished. 
I kept doing addition after addition because I kept solving the problem that I see in front of me. And I remember Tim coming the first time he looked around and he goes, <coughs> under his breath, this is way too small a building. Our building now is 40,000 square feet. I thought that was going to be big enough. In fact, at the beginning, what did I think? Rent. I had to rent for boats. I thought I was going to have to do boat storage rent. It was huge. It's one acre building. It's an old General Electric plant. We actually need, we're putting additions on that. I thought that was going to be big enough. It's not. We think about this maple season. We don't want to think about in five maple seasons. And if you're an equipment manufacturer, so I do want to talk about the difference between educators. We are all a community. There are educators that are helping us learn how to hold our sap, make better syrup. There are producers and there are equipment dealers. And we are all a part of this. Everybody has a different part to play. And we get really upset when they cross over into my area. But the truth is, if you're an equipment salesperson, what's the most frustrating type of customer? The person that just looks at now. And you're trying to save them. And what do they think? They just want to sell me a bigger evaporator. Get my money. That's what it is. It's all about, right? Hey, there's some like that. So we assume they all are. The truth is, they want to ask you questions about where you plan to be. And sometimes we have a hard time seeing it, visualizing it. So when somebody starts talking to me about, hey, I got this lead on 50 trees over here and I got to drive 20 minutes and I'm thinking to myself, I did this, man. It sucks. Go find 50 acres. Put tubing on it. Lease it. Borrow the money. <gasps> oh. I built my business with cash. I, my wife and I, my wife's a school teacher, first grade teacher. We've lived off her, her income for 20 some years. Every dollar I ever made in my professional career, because I didn't want debt. I didn't want debt. Now, some of you are going to go home and say, honey, Nate said we could just borrow money and do whatever. <laughs> I did not. I still need a business plan. But we all want to be debt free. Da, 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 and, you know, it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. Right? Pastor said debt's bad. Well, your home and how you run your home finances is very different than how you run your business finances. And we try to bring our home finances, this is where we get the zero sum, because there's a limited amount of money. It's kind of where it comes from. Well, if I want to pay my cell phone bill, I don't need Netflix. Got to keep it balanced. Got to balance it. Well, that doesn't, you know, you, of course you have to have a budget. But if you borrow the money, you're going to pay back that money faster if you do it right. Pennywise, pound foolish. Now, I know we have a lot of beginners. Find out if you like it. That's Fred's point. Fred, yeah. your point. Well, well, Nate's been chasing that rabbit around the barn <laughs> to answer your question. On vacuum, 50 cents for reds, 75 for sugars, but if you're in a highly competitive area like some of the guys in Vermont, they've paid as much as a dollar and a dollar and a quarter a tap. Um, Nate said, Fred, don't say anything stupid. It's really hard. <laughs> there are a lot of good Amish producers. Yeah. <laughs> so it was just, it's a kind of a joke. Um, bourbon barrel aged maple syrup propelled the business to the next step. And we've been all over, Vermont, Wisconsin, tasting bourbon barrel aged maple syrup. And I'm not kidding. Nine out of 10 of them, you taste them and you want to spit them out of your mouth. And it's because they cheat. Just that simple. They'll take a, a, a wooden barrel, they'll put their maple syrup in it, they'll dump a quart gallon of, of, uh, of bourbon in it, shake it around, let it sit there for three minutes, and it's bourbon barrel aged. It's garbage. So make it right if you're going to do it. That's make yeah. It, make it right. That's I a mean, good point. And, and he'll help you. Heck yeah. But we were at a show, and I don't even remember which one it was, but uh, you know, when you're at some of these shows, people are walking by you, and you're over here, and they'll go, and keep walking. You know, they, want, they want to make eye contact. So I said, yeah. 
we're not doing so good at this place, so got a, what was it, a, like a ketchup squeeze thing? Oh, yeah, yeah. Got it there, and the guy's walking. Hey, stop. Suburban barrel aged maple syrup. You want to try some? Open your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and what did every person do? Every person. Fred was squirting bourbon barrel aged maple syrup. Really? When you hit their thing? Because there. people are so afraid you're going to potentially that sell them something. The yeah. you know. If you don't uh, want it, keep walking. If you want it, we'll sell you. And we sold a lot. But, you know, you got to make it good. You don't want to make junk. Yeah, and you can't take bad maple syrup. Put it in a bourbon barrel and have it come out like your maple stilts get. You know? So what I gonna turn into gold. What he was trying to say was, get good fresh barrels. As soon as they dump uh, the stuff out, get it the next day. Not and we fight them. The distiller doesn't care. No. They don't understand your world. They want to wait until they you want to wait until they got seven of them and they dumped this one six months ago. A week tops. And if it's a bad weather, you know. You have to train the distiller. Who has to train the distiller? Yeah, and they'll try to convince you, no, it's gonna be fine. No, dude, we do the syrup, you do the bourbon. I'm telling you how to make good bourbon barrel aged maple syrup. How long, we had a fight. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was ugly. I mean, trying to find a good supplier, and we finally have, and uh, trained them a little bit, and now we can call up, and, when are you gonna make the next dump? And, such and such a date with the next day. Don't let them tell you. I mean, we have a reason. Don't, you know, but thank goodness we've had people that we were willing to say, hey, here's our problem and communicate. Go ahead. I think actually you just, you just answered it. We do small scale barrel aged in five down barrels. <coughs> the biggest problem is finding a suitable barrel to someone that's selling a barrel. Uh, we found, well, let's phrase it down about two weeks ago. What do you guys look for do you when you when you want to cork that pull that mung out of the barrel you want to wet mm -hmm. if i see my reflection that's a good thing all right well i pick up most of them and, and many times there's actually not liquid in there but it's it's glistens or it's right it's still wet yeah okay yeah it's, you, and you put your flashlight in there and it it's it's wet you know it's okay. it's moist yeah. but you can't let them dry uh, number one the leak all over the place <laughs> How hard is it to make syrup, and how fun is it when it leaks on the ground? Now the dogs like it. <laughs> so this is, uh, I guess, my last saying for you. I know I'll come back to you. Um, what's maple syrup good on? Everything. Everything but the floor. <laughs> Everything but the floor. Go ahead, Brady. So I was over in Virginia this week, and the ATF was involved in it. Now over there. So people are making, you got one producer over there who's kind of ruling for everybody. He's making them hot. And somebody complained to the ATF and so now they're involved. And in Virginia, they're, they're doing bourbon and rye and whiskey. And so they're requiring them to send it off to the lab and pay $2,500 for each single one. Because one person was you know, way too much alcohol. Now, so now this makeup industry wide. Yeah, I mean, it's bound to happen. So yeah. sadly, uh, Warren Buffett didn't come up with this, but it's the three eyes. You first have the innovators, like Steve, that comes up with a good idea. Puts bourbon barrel, you know, maple syrup in a bourbon barrel, so he innovates. Then the next eye, what's the next eye? Imitators. Imitators. The imitators go, holy crap, look at that, he's making a $1.25 a fluid ounce, I'm getting in. And now imitators come after the innovators, and then it's the third eye that ruins it for everybody. What are they? Iris. Idiots. <laughs> it's the idiots. Yeah, that's uh, their greed. Their avarice is uh, what uh, Warren Buffett says. So greed will ruin it. Yeah, yeah it's, oh, it's going to happen. There are idiots that see money. I'm not motivated by money at all. Um, there are people that are, and those are typically the idiots. We saw it in 2008 with the housing crisis. Why do you not just put a little bit of bourbon in your syrup? I don't, I don't oh, it's illegal, syrup. number one. So the, the question is, why don't you just put bourbon in your maple syrup? Yeah, because that's what you're getting out of the barrel is, the, my understanding, you get the remnants mm -hmm. that you're bringing out of 
the charred. Let's barrels. take it a step further. Why don't we just get fake bourbon flavor? <laughs> No, that's cheap. That, that would be cheap and cheating. I'm, oh, I'm saying so that there's, a, a, there's a limit on cheap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like we, we can be cheap, but not that cheap. No, I'm just, no, I'm just curious about why it. I won't. It's called a cordial, and by definition, but is the flavor different? By definition, the tax has already been paid on the stuff that's in the barrel. If you're buying liquid bourbon and dumping it in maple syrup, you are creating a alcohol product. Very good. Do, it all the time in balls. <laughs> Do you sell it to children? <laughs> I don't know that there's an age limit on bourbon balls. <laughs> I should not have asked that question. <laughs> Junior, you're 10 years old now. It's time you learn. <laughs> it's called infusion. Uh, yeah, infusion by definition means to pour into. I want to actually infuse a barrel. You're actually pouring the maple syrup into a barrel. You're infusing the barrel. If you look at the actual base of the word infuse. Mm -hmm. I don't like infusing syrup. It's my personal preference. Well, that's the stuff you spit out. I mean, it's bad. Well, what happens is, is greed. You just confuse as soon as you tell somebody you can do it, as soon as you tell somebody you can do it, what everybody, you know, there's no, there's regulation on it. I don't particularly want more government oversight. And that's what you'll create, and that's what's happening and in, that's in what Virginia. A lot of people are doing. They're dumping it in the barrel. Yeah. And they might be getting a Oh, it's been happening for a while. But they're dumping it in there to give it more flavor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the real problem is they suck at getting barrels. They don't have the relationships. Listen, I have competitors out there that are taking business from me. I know it. I don't even want to talk about it. Because anyone who buys it, they deserve each other. <laughs> they deserve each other. If that buyer at that large grocery store chain sees the price versus somebody who actually gets splinters, what's worse than a wood splinter? Metal splinters from the rings. Like it sucks moving barrels around. The per that buyer who looks at the price of my competitor and goes and says, I'm going to buy this because it's cheaper. They deserve each other. The people that buy, they deserve each other. Guess what? The customers that I want, we deserve each other. Well, the problem is that once you taste the bad... And I'm not, it's not about the alcohol. No. It's about the sugar on the oak. The taste. You only use a barrel one. Once you taste bad bourbon barrel aged maple syrup, then all of a sudden, everybody's bourbon barrel aged maple syrup. You ruin the market. It's garbage. So I'll never buy it again, and I'm going to tell my mother and my brother, you know, and so you've lost market share. And Can so you dump bourbon and maple syrup and make a good flavor product? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, part of it's, it's a story too, right? I mean, this is a this is a process. It's a story, right? About infusing the, the syrup. But right? you see the world as you see yourself, and your perception is it's your reality. There are people that, if they buy something cheap, it was a good. It's a good product. So the product Those things. Is part of it, like. What's the question? So the, the process part of it, when you're putting it into the barrel, you also <coughs> got like the char and the charcoal of it. I mean, I know you filter it afterwards, but do you think the charcoal actually gives it some filtering, changing, like taking some stuff out of it as well? No, I actually think that it gives it vanilla. <coughs> There's a lot of vanillins in white oak. It's brought out through the burning process. Anybody who says they use a barrel over and over is a fraud. So the syrup is pulling more out of it. The water in the syrup. I fill barrels hot. If you fill a barrel hot, what happens to maple syrup when it cools? It shrinks. You create a vacuum in that barrel. If you create a vacuum in that barrel, you're pulling out of the oak into the syrup. So cold packing a bourbon barrel doesn't work well. Using the barrel over and over doesn't work well. I know there are people out there that will rationalize I'm going to use this barrel over and over so I can say it's bourbon barrel aged maple syrup and then I'm just going to dump bourbon in it. I make four million gallons of bourbon barrel aged maple syrup out of this one barrel. And they think that's rationalizing it. I don't even want to waste time with it. Like it's already happening. I want to talk about the positive things. I just don't want to create frauds here. They're here already. Not in this room, but they exist. They're going to ruin the industry. We're all going to end up not being able to sell a product. 
because of bad actors. And by the way, those are the people that get into something, and they get out real quick. They're not even gonna stay in the industry. So my family's been making maple syrup for over 100 years. My name matters. There's a lot of people that see a quick buck. They're in, they're out. How do you fix the story so that you can separate yourself from the face? I tell the truth. So I tell the truth on everything. Fred and I get in our box truck. But is it on your bottles? You have something on your labels that says this is a real deal? or? I don't. I think uh, marketing is more or less, unfortunately, there are ways to say things. Think about this. Let me give you a great example. There's 4 million gallons of maple syrup made in the United States on paper. Probably they figure it's more like 6 million gallons. If maple syrup goes from a tanker to a specific company not to be named in Vermont, gets put in bottles, and on the back of the label it says, no, 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 Vermont, what does the consumer think? Vermont. It's ambiguous. Remove ambiguity. If you want Kentucky maple syrup and you put Kentucky on the front of the bottle, what does it have to be? It has to be from Kentucky trees. I'm telling you this because the consumer is dumb. They are dumb. We're dumb. We're consumers in other areas. We just happen to know a little bit about maple. If I put maple syrup in a jug and it says Ohio maple syrup on the front label, what does it have to have in it? Ohio maple syrup. If I buy maple syrup from Kentucky and I put it in my Bissell Maple Farm jug, and on the back, it says, I buy from firefighters, teachers, engineers. I partner with farmers. And it's got Jefferson, Ohio on the back label. I have to have a label. It's legal. Unfortunately, people will think, because on the back it says Ohio, that all of the syrup from our facility is from Ohio. I have, there's things with the regulators. I have to do things legally. It does not say if you're Ohio maple syrup in the front of my jug. It says my address on the back because if somebody gets sick. How many people have died from maple syrup? Zero. Zero. But the state says, the federal government says they still need to be able to get in contact with you. Let's just say a bumblebee flies into the syrup, you put it in a bottle and somebody ingests a bee because they are, you know, they're allergic. They have to be able to trace it back to you. That's law. This isn't like Nate's opinion. I am proud of the farms that I partner with. I am not um, hiding from it. And there's a lot of farmers that have their own markets and they go buy syrup from another farmer and it's like, you think it's a black market deal. Don't tell anybody. I'm buying syrup from you. Don't tell anybody. Why? It's because that's how you don't buy it. You aren't the customer. Do you know how much business I get because a farmer runs out of syrup? And I don't even want it. I get a call almost every, I get several calls every Thanksgiving. Yeah, our farmer, he's, uh, he said it was a bad season. Okay. Yeah, that's always the excuse because they think that's going to work. Should you ever run out of maple syrup? No. Should you ever run out of maple syrup? No. Do you want to make money? I should have started with that. Do you want to make money? <laughs> You're not the customer. But what, 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 I had this too. I did, I had this too. I didn't want to put somebody else's syrup in my jug. And then I realized that's a freaking benefit. How many maple families do we partner with? Bunch. Hundred. I eat at their dinner tables. When I'm in town, I don't have to get a hotel. I, can, I stay with these families. I've known them for decades. If you're a grocery buyer, or a big buyer of maple syrup, do you want the guy that makes all his own syrup who's gonna call you in November and say he's out? Or do you want the guy who knows everybody? What do you want? What's got your job on the line if you're a, a buyer? What would get that buyer fired? Unfortunately, in corporate America, everybody goes to work every day thinking about how not to get fired. So if I run my grocery store out of maple syrup, what's gonna to happen to me? I'm gonna get fired or get yelled at. Buying from small producers, this is, the, this is the crux. I want to be authentic. I am authentic. Is every, every drop in my jug for me? No. I bottle more maple syrup than the state of Ohio makes. 
How in the world can I get every maple farmer, even in Ohio, to sell me their syrup? They won't. And that's okay. They got markets too. Does that make sense? I'm telling you it's okay to buy from farmers. I will help you. Call me. I'm not going to run around, by the way, and say, yeah, I sell them all the syrup. So if you want to buy, we're all worried about losing business. There's so much business out there to have. Somebody else had a question. Well, kind of so the lady in front of me. So we're Kentucky, you know, there's not a farmer down the road to buy syrup from right mm -hmm. now. So Not yet. Not yet. So do you buy sap or did you early on? So sap is very regional. You can't really ship it. Mm -hmm. I do buy sap because people are willing to sell sap. Um, I have a place that I will ship it by tanker at a Boy Scout camp and we haul it to our facility. I don't really buy sap anymore because we are organic. So I have to use organic sap. Another fraudulent thing to talk about at some point. Hey, listen, it's just a tank. I, by the way, I don't buy it, so it doesn't matter what my opinion on organic is. Guess what else? Who else's opinion doesn't matter about organic? Yours! You want to make money? Organic. It doesn't matter what you think or if you buy it. Hey, what's the difference between organic and non-organic? About four or five hundred bucks for you guys. It's a tax. And they don't know anything about maple. They just want the money. The customer in California has no idea how maple's made. I'll tell you right now that non-organic or conventional syrup is dusty on the shelf and it's cheaper. If you go to the West Coast, they only buy organic syrup. Half the maple syrup in this country is organic, or in the world is organic, half of it isn't. Are there inorganic trees? You're getting trees. <laughs> I just don't understand how you get inorganic. Oh, listen, I, uh, I, my opinion, this is one of those things where I was more interested in being right than keeping the business. And when I said I lost that big account, it's because I'm a chemist. How can you make organic <laughs> barrel aged maple syrup? It's a poisonous flammable liquid. Well, somebody figured out how to do it. They made organic bourbon barrel aged maple syrup, a poisonous flammable liquid you can run an engine on. And you know what? I was right, but I was right without the <coughs> I'm a freaking chemist. This, there's no way you can make organic bourbon barrel aged maple syrup. It's literally poison. Guess what? That was the spiral downhill for me. I wanted to be right. And it, I'm telling you, it took a lot out of me. And so I've learned it's not about what I think. It's about what my customer wants. My opinion doesn't matter. So I was right, but I lost that account. Somebody else did it. Guess what I have right now? Organic bourbon barrel aged maple syrup. So I'm convinced at this point, if you wanted to have an organic nuclear reactor, you could buy organic, you could get plutonium or uranium organic certified. I'm, I mean, as, as silly as this sounds, it can be done. You would die from radiation, but it's organic. It's from the earth. I have my paperwork. It's a government program. As long as you have your paperwork, everybody's glowing, but it's organic. <laughs> it is that silly. Stop trying to put your brain around it. You're not going to make sense of it. It is the most frustrating thing ever. The defoamers that are organic don't work. They don't work. So what people do is they put so much in the syrup. This is years ago. I mean, safflower oil. So we can get drums of syrup, and there's a layer of oil on top which actually makes it adulterated. So it's organic, but illegal and adulterated. Now, as an industry, we've kind of moved beyond that, but it is that silly. My point is, you don't buy it. Stop trying to wrap your, round, your brain around it to be rational. Is all maple syrup organic? If you pay the money. It's the most organic product out there. <coughs> but you have to have the paperwork that says you are, because that grocery buyer's butt's on the line. As soon as you try to tell somebody, it's really, you've lost it. It's really, you've lost it. No, it's really, yeah, you know that. But you aren't going to get any sort of sizable customer of any sort of um, reputation <coughs> by trying to convince them to buy your non-organic syrup that's really organic. If it's long, it's wrong. If you have to explain it in a lot of words, you know it's easy? Hey, Nate, is your syrup organic? Yes. You don't have to have a lot of conversations. I know I've gone past my time. I appreciate Can it. Tell a quick story? Oh yeah, absolutely. I got to disagree with him on one point. Oh boy, <laughs> syrup's good on everything except the floor. 
It's even good on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> we were we were in a growth spurt, and we had a new production line going on. They could bottle what, 28 bottles a minute, something. Yeah. something. So we're working all day in the woods, and you know, up early, working all day. Well, then production needed to come in at six and get started, but the syrup wasn't there. It wasn't being heated. We had, we had a basically empty drum. So we're emptying drums till two, three o'clock in the morning. Fred did a lot of all nighters with him. And uh, so the one time we got some really good syrup from uh, Vermont, and because uh, that's what we had to have. Yep. We spilled some on the floor. So I look over, and he's down there at two thirty in the morning looking syrup off. It's true. It's that good. Yeah. So, yeah, it's even good on the floor. It is true. Is this helpful? Yeah, yeah. I was hoping to be relatable to everybody that has one tap, somebody that has a million taps. It's really hard to talk about details of maple, which all of you want to know. I learned a lot of stuff from Maple Trader. Brandon was on there. You ask questions. There's no manuals to a lot of the equipment 20 years ago. You'd get it. And that was it, and you had to figure it out. But today, there's resources, there's equipment vendors. It's okay to partner with an equipment vendor that you trust and want to work with. So I know I'm into somebody else's time, but thank you. Thank Thanks you. for giving me. Probably five or six years ago, and was very involved, as was Brandon, in forming the West Virginia Maple Syrup Producers Association. So I just want to say, where you're going here, getting an association going, sharing knowledge, bringing knowledge in from outside, like Dave and other folks coming down in to, to, to teach you what folks up north, I'm sorry, what folks up north have, have figured out along the way is, is really the way to go, okay? And in the process, you're going to find, we found in West Virginia, we've got to take a lot of these, um, this knowledge coming from, from outside the state, primarily the northern states, and adapt it to our conditions, okay? We got to adapt it and make it make it work. So, um, Dr. Reckman, I'm sorry to interrupt. We're going to try to put a mic on here. Interrupt. Okay, sure. Just Whatever you want to do. There's a few folks that are right here. Well, let's fix that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 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 Can you hear me now? Yeah. And I'll try, I'll try to talk a little louder until somebody says don't, all right? So Billy called me up quite some time ago and told me about your program, asked me if I would come on over, and I, would, I said, boy, I've never been to Berea College, and I've always wanted to see it. I got over yesterday and got, to, got a tour, and I thought this would be a, a wonderful opportunity to come over and meet some of you all I didn't in any way expect the numbers that you've got in this room. You've got a lot of emerging interest in maple, and that's, that's, that's just tremendous. And Billy said that, you know, most of our folks are beginners, and so we're you know, kind of given that uh, kind of level of, of knowledge. And, he, and uh, he said, what do you want to talk on? I said, I'll talk on anything you want. Okay. A little hubris here, okay? I can talk on anything. And I hadn't heard about him for quite some time until suddenly I got the program, looked down and down, and lo and behold, uh, there's this pro talk on there on sap collection stories and sanitation. I said, that's pretty interesting. Then I kept reading and found out I was giving it. <laughs> I thought that's even more interesting. So <clears throat> you all can uh, tell me whether, whether, whether it worked, okay? Uh, but uh, I, I think we can we can get through this because we're going to talk a lot a lot of adaptations being made in West Virginia to material that was developed up north and how we can make it make it work down here. Uh, so Billy actually chose the topic, good choice, and uh, I have the title of Maple Commodity Specialist. I chose that. Okay, I gave myself that title. Oh, oh, I'm not sure what it means. I was working for the Department of Agriculture. They didn't know what the heck I was. They didn't even know they had maple down there in West Virginia at that time. And said, oh, I'm your maple commodity specialist. And the commissioner thought that was just fine. So we've been working with that ever since. All right, John, here we go. So we're supposed to be talking about maple syrup production challenges. And the biggest challenge we have is where we live. All right? This is a long way from Vermont, folks. You all don't talk like a bunch of Vermont farmers. I just want you to know that. The good news is you don't have to talk about like a bunch of Vermont farmers to make maple. 
maple syrup. But it does add some added challenges. Nate talked about being in the southern part of the producing states. Obviously, they're doing well up there in northern Ohio on that. But West Virginia, Kentucky, we're, uh, we're kind of on the, on, on the southern edge of, of, of where people can, can commercially make, make maple syrup. So we're challenged by where we are. But this is where we are. Unless you all want to move to Vermont and learn how to talk differently, um, <laughs> we're going to stay here and we're going to we're going to figure out how to how to make this work. <clears throat> I I have a recommendation. How many of you work with or have played around with weather underground? Mm -hmm. It's it's a really neat neat program. Okay, so I went on weather underground last night, having no real knowledge of Kentucky. And lo and behold, I was able to find Berea up there. And all this number, 40, 21, 46, 50, these are all individual citizens who have weather stations and bring data into, into a community weather network. And I was able to find a station quite close to here, okay? Forecast for Berea, Kentucky, Phyllis Drive, you know, and, and, and then the call numbers for that station. And, um, I was able to look and kind of see a little bit about how it might work down here. So let's take a look at, if you, if you, if you get, you know, I would like you to go home and do this, okay? You're going to find stations near you, um, it's called weatherunderground.com. Find a station near you and start, start looking at this, because it's going to give you historic data on, on weather conditions in your area. If you scroll on down through there, there, you're going to get to a point that it's usually is called uh, well, weather history for this this station, and you can you can dial in um, any particular uh, uh, monthly monthly mode, daily mode, you know, and it's going to give you averages for that month. Kind of works. Weekly mode works for us. And February 2023, I just put that in, and then it'll give you either a table or a graph that gives you the dew point. We really don't care much about that, but we do care a whole lot about about the, uh, the the temperature data. Why is that? Why are we concerned? Why is that a major concern of us? What are we looking for there? Which is freeze and thaw cycles. <clears throat> we want to look for those three freeze and thaw cycles in here. And I just use arbitrary, no no science behind this data. When I start looking at this, I say, in order to have a good sap run, I want it to be in the mid twenties. 31 won't really work. Bring us into the mid 20s at night when it's cold. And then to really get a good run, upper 30s, I say 40 degrees. So I'm, I'm looking at those two, those two, those two uh, you know, parameters in there. And this was last February, and we're just gonna quickly look at this. You look at mid 20s, you have one, uh, two, maybe three cycles where it got cold enough by these parameters to give us a good sap run. In between there, we had <coughs> days that are up in the high 60s and 70s before you get, got back down to that cold weather. Now we all know last year was a terrible year for making maple syrup down here. I have producers in West Virginia who made zero maple syrup. I have producers that 100, almost 200 trees made five gallons of maple syrup. That's just not going to work, okay? We can't live with that unless you just want to do it on your kitchen stove for your, for your family. we got to have better than that. But if we look at that, and last year was an anomaly, and this year I'm told it's going to snow like mad, and I'm going to cut and wax my skis, and it's going to be a lot of fun. So I went back to the previous year and started to look at what Maria Kentucky might look like. Okay, so let's look at, look at uh, 2022. And what I do with this, and I recommend you do this, get a station near you, print it out, screenshot it, and draw a line at about 25, and draw a line at about 40, okay? And uh, start plotting out, identifying the free saw cycles in there. Now that's the, that's the only thing that impacts that at all, but it certainly is a, is, is a, is a parameter that we, we need to meet there. And if we look in 2022, we had some, you know, nice freeze-thaw cycles, some extended periods of warmth, but pretty nice freeze-thaw cycles during January, okay? Let's take a look at the next one. January, was a, that, that's okay. We can make maple syrup in that, all right? Look at February down here. 
Oh my God, this is real good. Freestyle, freestyle, freestyle. We had a we had quite a good run of those freestyle cycles here in February. And if you look at March, well, it's kind of over here. By March, um, you had to get to the middle of the month before you before you had a freeze that would would kick things off. And, and, and the game's over at that point. Now I draw a third line in there. All right. I also draw a line at 70 degrees. 65 would probably be better. But I draw it at 70, and I indicate how many days we had when we got those 70 degree temperatures. And if you went back to the last slide, January 1st was 70 degrees outside here, okay? And then it, then it, then it got good, and we had a good uh, January, and here we got the middle of February. February 13th, we're up in the 70s. February 17th, we're up in the 70s. So um, why, 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 why is that important? to know when you have these extreme temperatures. I'm calling them extreme because shorts in the middle of winter is extreme. Um, why is that? We know why we need the free soft cycles. What's the big deal? Storage. Storage. Um, yeah, there's, basically it's, it's the rate of microbial buildup. Okay, no matter, no matter what type of bad thing it does, and there's lots of bad things. But when you warm things up, it's just like putting a glass of milk on your table. I left it out this morning after I had my cereal. By the time I came back at night, that quart of milk was bad, okay? The microbes grew rapidly in there. On the other hand, if I put it in the refrigerator, I'd still have that quart of milk for the next morning for a number of more, not forever, but when on a week's vacation or two weeks vacation, that milk would spoil. But the rate of microbial growth is greatly depressed when you keep, when things are cold. And when things are at 70 degrees, those babies are multiplying and growing really quickly. All right, maple syrup production challenges. Okay, I, I refer to it in my own kind of funny way as a race. You're tapping a tree and there's a race going on. That tree is responding. And those who were out in the woods yesterday with me, we went into this in, in quite some detail. The tree just doesn't sit there. There's a physiological response trying to heal up that, that wound. You get to take maple uh, sap from that tree from the time you tap it to the time the tree has won the race, okay? The tree has sealed it off so it's no longer giving you sap. And this, this is, uh, as, the, as the, the tree responds to the injury, it kills a section of wood in that tree, a column of wood in that tree. This happens to be walnut because you can see the dark column very readily in there, much less readily in maple. You wouldn't see it, but it wouldn't if it well on the slide. And that's one part of the race. You've got approximately six weeks. Unless you're on high vacuum and you're running your pumps 24-7 you know, and changing the parameters there, you've got about six weeks from the time you tap the tree until, until the tree's recovered. Okay. And in addition to what the tree is doing, as that time goes on, your milk is spoiled, okay? Whether it's spoiling quickly because you left it on the table or it's spoiling slowly because you put it in the refrigerator, you're getting microbial growth because it's close to Halloween and uh, made microbes look really nasty, okay? And this here is a scanning electron microscope picture of the inside of a sap line at the end of the season. You can see the buildup, the irregularity of the, the buildup of what we call a biofilm on that on the, on the inside of that, that tube. Um, biofilms are everywhere. They're just microbial buildup within a gelatinous sheet. They're, um, they're in your, inside your buckets. You feel the inside of the bucket and it's slimy. Okay. They're on the rock. You go out to fish and suddenly whew, you're up like this because it was slippery on that rock. That's a biofilm. They're on your teeth. You forgot to, you know, brush your teeth, uh, left your toothbrush on two days later. You're feeling a little bit slimy, okay? It's a microbial biofilm. And the same thing is happening inside your sap lines. Next slide. Okay. These guys cause problems to maple syrup production. The microbial buildup causes problems. They cause off flavors in your syrup. They cause it to be not quite, quite right, okay? They uh, literally eat your lunch. You're, you're there to harvest the sugars in the sap. The bacteria are there, there to eat the sugars in your sap. 
The more you let them eat, the less you've got. So your bricks of your, your sap is going to go down as the microbes build up over time. Um, we already talked about the microbes, the response of the microbes to the tree. Ooh, I've been injured. I better block this area off, okay? Compartmentalization, technical term associated with that. And then later in the season, although it doesn't have to be later, you get a maple syrup that we call ropey, all right? And um, this is a syrup that, uh, you know, you should be able to pour it and then on, you know, stop the pour and it should pretty well stop. This kind of keeps a <coughs> long, snotty, uh, gelatinous ropiness coming down. We made a tremendous amount of ropey syrup in my part of West Virginia last year. And, and uh, it, it tends to be disgusting. <laughs> to me, maybe some people really like it, all right? But all these are due to microbial build. These are four bad things that are gonna happen to you as those, as those guys build up. Next slide. Oh, we'll go back to that other one. There's one, one thing I wanted to show you on that. Um, this is, when you get a sap, it looks like that. It's, it's microbial buildup and it's souring, okay? That's, that's a 55 gallon drum of sour sap. You boil that down, you will make ropey sap, okay? And then you'll feed it to the hogs or whatever else you want to do. This is, this is a, a basically a <coughs> glass of, of a sap that sat overnight, just overnight in the sugar shack, not heated, but you can see the, the difference in there. This, I mean, you like nice, clear sap. This, I boil it, okay? This, I tried boiling it. Now I've got ropey, very ropey, very, very bad stuff. So, so it's all temperature dependent. But late in the season, even more than earlier in the season, we're fighting this, these temperatures. Next. All right, we talked about this. This is the re response of the tree to the, to the injury. We saw that earlier, so we'll just move on past that. All right. What can we do about it? We're in the southern range. We have less freeze-thaw cycles than up north, and we have more 70-degree days than up north. This is, this is part of life. And if we're going to stay and try to get into this business and be successful at it, we got to know what we can do, okay? And um, that's where the second part of the title of this talk, thank you, Billy, it was a great title you made up for me, <laughs> which was sap collection and storage. What, what, can we, what can we do about that? Brandon's going to talk to you about, about tubes, tubing collection, um, buckets, tubes, vacuum, all, all those things change the parameters somewhat, but the, but the problem still remains that buildup of microbial mass, that biofilm buildup. All right, so what can we do about this? And here I want to say that there's, and Brandon will go into this, with there's two types of tubing. There's 5 sixteenths and there's 3 sixteenths. And um, 3 sixteenths is more problematic than 5 sixteenths. We get a, not so much a bigger buildup, but you've got less area, okay? And as those microbes build up, they restrict the flow within that tube, particularly at the fittings, where you have a tube in there, you get a restriction and actually a larger buildup of microbes because of some eddying effects around that, that, that those fittings. So, so uh, I'm in West Virginia. We're a 316 state. We're 80% 316. If you go up north, Pennsylvania, New York, they're 516 states. All right. Um, they're actually pulling out their 316 tubing and replacing it with five because they had problems of clogging in those tubes. The problem of clogging is related to how fast the sap is flowing through the tube. Ohio looks like this. West Virginia looks like this. The sap flowing through West Virginia tubes is going a whole lot faster just because of, you know, steeper than, than in Ohio or New York or maybe some parts of Kentucky. Some of you guys who are right near the, near the river valley, okay? Um, you can still use 316s, and, and again, Brandon will talk about this, and I would encourage you to for some other advantages, but don't rely on natural vacuum if you don't have a high degree of slope. And again, that'll be going on later on. It's more, and, and it's more of a problem 
Traditionally, 516 folks didn't really worry a lot about sanitation, getting rid of that microbial mass, because their tubes were big enough, and, uh, and, and it kind of worked. Not all of them. If you go to Canada, they worried about it a lot, and I've been doing sanitation with isopropyl alcohol, which we cannot do right now, um, but we're working on that. Uh, but they've been, they've, been, they've been sanitizing their tubes and their tubing for, for quite some time. All right. Um, Future Generations University, where I work for, I, I do maple extension work, <coughs> teach people how to drill holes in trees. We did that yesterday, had a good time out in the woods, okay? I also do research, adapting northern conditions, to northern practices to southern conditions. I want to partner on research with others in the southern tier of states. I work with Les Over over in Ohio a lot, okay? And, and we're trying to figure out how to how to best do this. We have a, a, a research site that we work with a, pro, a cooperating producer on, and uh, on that site we have six lines. We have six different lines, and we've got 10 to 11 trees on each line. And um, for the foresters, and I'm a forester by, by training, the foresters in, in, in the group are gonna appreciate that. Can you still hear me? Okay, okay, this thing came off. But I'll hold it. Um, show us, the, let's take a look at the next line. But we got six lines, each one's a different color. Next slide, please. And we spent last year calibrating this research area, okay? So, first of all, um, if you look there, the number of trees on each line is either 10 or 11. The basal area, which is the area occupied by the trees, is pretty darn, darn close on there, about as close as we could get it. The average diameter is pretty close. And last year we just collected sap and calibrated. Because you know, every tree is not like, you know, I like to say, every tree, trees are as different as people are. Some are sweeter than others, okay? Some are stingy, some are generous. And, and, and so you gotta kinda know how this system works without any treatment applied to it. And we spent last year calibrating this system. We just collected the sap, total sap flow. And then we divided it into two different research sets. Okay, the top set and the bottom set. By sap flow, basically trying to get, the, get them as tight as we could. And this year, we're going into that, this, this system and we're sanitizing one set Okay, we're replacing the line on another, uh, one, one line is sanitized, one line is replaced, one line stays just as it was. We don't do anything to it. And we're gonna be looking at the differences in sap flow from these three. One of them is gonna be brand new. Okay, that should have very little microbial buildup. One's gonna be sanitized. We're gonna talk about how we're doing that here in a minute. And you all should seriously consider that. And the, and, and the third on each research set is just the way it is, okay? Whatever was built up there before is still sitting there, the microbial bio, you know, the microbial mass, and it'll be there. So that's, that's what we're going into this research season with, and I'm in the process of doing that whenever I'm back in West Virginia, setting, setting up, the, putting the new lines on, setting this all up, and then we'll, we'll see what, what's happening in there. All right, next. I have some research associates, okay? I'm a forester. I know the tree side of things. Diameter, basal area, I understand that. These are a couple of microbiologists, food, food science folks from well, West Virginia State University that we became associated with. And we're, we've been starting to, to send samples down there and analyze what the microbial mass is there, how much there is, what type of organisms there are, so we can, we can see you see, we want to we want to take what's developed up north and see how it works down here. We want to make it applicable. We want to if I tell you to do this, I want to make sure it works before I tell you to do it. There have been plenty of times when I've told people to do it and found it didn't work. That's a little embarrassing, and I feel bad about that. But it's always based on the knowledge we have at this time. We're going to have a lot more at the end of this season. Next slide. All right, so this is some work we did last, last year. And, um, and so this is the start of a very short season last year. Our microbial mass built up. And that's 
at the end. Uh, the blue is new tubing, and the red is one-year-old tubing. And the key here to understanding this is this scale here is a logarithmic scale. Thinking back to your old days in algebra, you're increasing each unit in there is increased not three to four, but 30 to 300. To, 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 to the next one would be, you know, it's all, it's all ex exponential increase in there. And, and we got to the end of the season, and we could see that the new line at the end of the season had four million colonies per milliliter. The old line had 26 million colonies per milliliter. So, so that old line had built up a tremendous increase in, in, in microbial mass. Now, now, we don't want to go into this season with you know, 26 million colonies per whatever unit she's using here. We want to, we want to, we want to do better than that, okay? Because if, if the higher you start, the higher you'll be at the end. And all the bad things associated with all those guys will be multiplied towards the end of the year. <coughs> all right, so we set this up. We had some old tubing. We did some preliminary work on this last year. Next slide. We wanted to know um, what kind, if we're going to sanitize, I'll tell you how we're going to do that, what, I mean, what agent we're going to use, and, but we want to know how, how um, it's concentration and it's contact time. Our friends up at Proctor have, have done a sanitation study with Cornell over a number of years, and they basically added the sanitizing agent and just let it wash through the, to their tubes. That didn't work. It, sanitation, the ability to sanitize is related to contact time, how long it sits there. Nate told us earlier, plastic is, is porous. We've got to leave that stuff sit there long enough to get to the guys that are you know, embedded in those pores. We also wanted to know what concentration. We're working off a, 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 a producer, a Arthur Kruger of Vermont, who's been working with this. And we want to know what, whether the concentration he was using, he was recommending 200 parts per million concentration, whether that was sufficient or down here do we need to go to more. We wanted to get that out of our way. And, and so we look at this, we say, okay, here's your control. That's what you're looking at, okay, if you don't do anything. If you put 100 parts per million for two minutes, you brought it on down. If you put 100 parts per million for five minutes, you really brought it down. 100 parts per million for 10 minutes. There's, have we killed all the microbes by going 10 minutes? No. No, we haven't. The ones we haven't killed are the tough ones. And they're going to be there to multiply it. But, you know, that's a, you just, you know, hand sanitizers are probably, in my humble opinion, not a good idea because the microbes that live are the tough ones. And then they're probably the ones that you want don't want to live. So, so we're, getting, we're getting down below a detectable level here. At 10 minutes, 100 parts a million. Then we go to 200 parts a million. At two minutes, we've really nailed it there. At uh, five minutes, 10 minutes, we're, we're out of business. That's 516, 316, very, very similar as far as that, that goes. So contact time, what do we know? Well, one thing we didn't know before is that if you leave it in there for 10 minutes, I put in another five, leave it 15, you've, you've, you've satisfied what you can get out of that. And we know that, you know, we want to go to a, a higher concentration here. This is adapting processes developed up north. Up north, they were doing 200 parts a million <coughs> and leaving it in all summer. Now, since then, I can provide some proof to tell, to let you know that that's a really bad idea. Because what happens to those those ones that uh, didn't get killed all summer long, they multiply and they're living on the sugars that you didn't rinse out of your tubes and your sanitizing agent has lost its efficacy. And if you leave those, this is what they're doing in Vermont, guys, they're leaving that solution in there all summer. I couldn't have told you this two weeks ago, I can tell you right now, it's a bad idea. And we're, we're you know, so this is, this is how, we, how, we, how we have to do this. Okay, next slide. All right, let's just take a look at three, three chart, three graphs here. And this is looking at what people say to me, oh, how long can I keep my set? You know, I, I work, I want to be able to boil, but how long can I, can I keep my set? 
And the answer is it depends on what, what the temperature is, okay? And um, at four degrees, the bottom line, and each, those are just I mean, yeast and mold, pseudonymous, psychotropic, different microbial species, <coughs> yeast and mold are uh, dumped together. But uh, if you look at that at, uh, at 10 degrees and 50 degrees, that, that baby is shooting up really quickly. At four degrees, you know, 40 degrees, okay, you know, uh, 30, 39, you can keep it up to five days before you hit that, that, that high level, okay? So if you look at, let's just look at mold and yeast. I, I said to people, hey, you can keep it, you can keep it 48 hours, okay? As long as it's within these, these parameters here. And, and you're, 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 you're kind of do, doing okay. You're still at the, at the low level. Certainly if you're down at, at 40 degrees or below, at, 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 you know, you can keep, you can keep it 48, 48 hours without, without a problem. But don't try to keep it five days unless you're refrigerating it. And, and, and now, you can, now you can get out there quite a, bit, quite a bit longer. So this is just some of the stuff coming out of this, this, this research. Next, next slide. I mean, I could tell you what you could do, but I wouldn't know until I, I had the numbers to prove it. Yes? Just one quick thing that I learned here a couple years ago. Even though you can keep that sap a couple of days and make good syrup, every minute you're leaving that microbial bacteria in there, it's eating your sugar. Oh, it's eating your sugar. sugar. sugar in that thing. Jerry Riggs runs all the time, and he can keep this sap at, at 40 degrees or lower for a week. Okay. Up north, they don't have to do that. Maybe, maybe they will. All right, so anyhow, we've seen this already. One night in the sugar house, how that changes. Let's keep moving. Here's another, another study, microbial low and biomass, um, mold and yeast. Again, this is logarithmic. So six on there is a million, okay? And you can see that mold and yeast, here's a sanitized, uh, unsanitized. It's higher than the mold and yeast, but not a whole lot. But the pseudonymous, the unsanitized, woo, right up there, we got, you know, about up to a million, million colonies per uh, centimeter squared. And the psychotropic, again, really, really high up there, just looking at it differently. And here are some pictures. These are interesting to me. That's unsanitized. That's what your sap lines look like with a scanning electron microscope, unsanitized top one. If you sanitize them, they're a lot cleaner, okay? You're down here on the bottom, you can see how much of that stuff was, was killed and removed in that process. Obviously, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm promoting sanitation of your, your sap lines here. Next, we sanitize with calcium hypochlorite. Um, we sanitize with that, you could sanitize with bleach, okay? Except bleach, when it decomposes, leaves salt, okay? And salt attracts squirrels. And squirrels make an awful mess of your, your saplings. Calcium hypochlorite, when it decomposes, leaves it. Calcium, technically a salt, chemist, but it's not, uh, it doesn't have the salty flavor. I have tasted it, okay? Which I probably shouldn't do. And it, and it has no flavor whatsoever, or it has a bitterness to it. And the word on the street, I'm trying to get somebody to actually do some signs on this to make sure it's correct, is that you don't have nearly as much squirrel problem if you sanitize it with, with a calcium bleach. Okay. Um, next, next slide. I don't know why this is due, that it didn't tell us anything. Let's go on. Okay. I couldn't get that out of the program. So, if you are sanitizing, if you're sanitizing with um, sodium hypochlorite bleach, there is only, I'm told, there's only one product on the market that's EPA food grade registered, and that is what's called Clorox. Not the bleach you can get cheapo in your, in your, in your grocery store, it's honest goodness Clorox. If you're using buckets, and you don't worry about the squirrels chewing the holes in your buckets, which most of the time they won't, you can use Clorox bleach. Food grade, okay, EPA registered. That previous product was a pool shot. Some of them are EPA registered, some of them are not. The one I showed you was, okay, and it tells you up here to, to um, that uh, immersion method, you want to sanitize up to 600 parts per million. 
All right, tells you how to how to do that. Um, the first method is just a rinse. The second is when you're immersing, you're, you're filling your lines. And what I'm recommending, and what the folks up north are doing that do this, they fill their lines with a sanitizing solution, leave it the required period of time, 10 to 15 minutes, and then drain them. You've already done everything there, and rinse them. All right. At which point you're ready, you're ready to go. Um, at this point, we have been sanitizing in the spring when people are pulling their tabs. Two weeks ago, I'd have told you that. After looking at some more data coming out of WV State, absolutely not. Sanitize in the fall. Sanitize in October. I sanitize in November. Sanitize in December. Um, and, and you're much, much better off because things have already cooled off and the microbes grow much slower than if you leave them leave them over the summer with the heat. So fall sanitation is the, is the way to go. We're now recommending 600 parts per million. The EPA says it's fine. So do I. All right, go to 600 parts per million. Can't hurt. It's going to it's going to do the job. Now, I, as I wade in the waters of regulation, I have just recently found out that it this compound has to also be on a state list to be legitimate in West Virginia. I don't know the regs in any other state, but we're in the process. And our Department of Ag, the Lenhart, Commissioner Lenhart, is writing a letter putting it on their state list of applicable sanitary agents. Now, if it's okay with the EPA, it's gotta be, it's gotta be okay, but technically it's gotta be on the list in West Virginia. And and, and our commissioner is, is knows how important this is to our industry and is in the process of doing that. People have been doing this with this for years before, nobody really bugged them and nobody really cared, but that's the, that's, that's the, the, the regs out there. All right, so that's what we're doing, 600, 15 minutes, and, uh, and do it in the fall. That's what I'm recommending today. Next slide. All right, another thing that we started doing last year, that's another we're learning and adapting, is we started to put small battery-operated sure flow pumps on our lines. Now, if you've got 200, 500 taps. I don't know the type of pump you need to, to, to work with on that. I know that the people we're working with are, are, are terribly small producers. They got a couple hundred taps. Putting a little vacuum on that. We're not trying to go to 26 or 24 pounds high back systems like they are up north. We're just trying to put enough vacuum on that system to keep the flow from the tap to the tank. And let me show you this next thing. There's a little pump there hooked up to our tanks. Next slide. All right, there's, there's, this should be able to turn on a little video. It's just a short one, see if you can get that to roll. Take a look at that sap coming in there. That's, that's coming in after our season was over. After your season was over, that was initiated and maintained by that little bitty vacuum pump sitting there. Sure, full pump up to 70 bucks and it takes a battery. Or some people I know have talked to you yesterday, you can use solar and you're going to get you know, a full week out of, out of a battery. Next slide. There it is. Okay. So last year we had this six line setup, right? And we were, we were looking at getting this baseline of sanitation so we knew how the trees performed so we can then go and do an experiment this year and, and prove its efficacy. Last year our season where I was at ended February 20th. Probably not that much different. You probably didn't get much more than that that down in here because I know people in the southern part of the state actually got less than that. Um, up there you're looking at February 8th, 9th, 14th, 19th, 20th. Those are our sap runs. And that's our gallons of sap collected. On the 22nd, and then it was over. The game was over at that point. We weren't, we were, we were getting nothing. We took some of those lines, we left some of them dribble off. You'd get, you know, small, very small quantities of sap. Some of them we put on um, on a little diaphragm pump 
And on the 22nd, after, you know, basically having two days of no flow whatsoever, lo and behold, we're getting sap flow again. And we got sap flow on the 22nd, 23rd, March 3rd, March 6th, March 10th, you know, way down into March, we're still collecting sap. Did it make good syrup? No. Why not? We didn't keep it cold. Okay, that was the sap I showed you in those two, two glasses. If we combine this with some refrigeration, will we make good syrup? It might be back next year, I'll let you know. Okay? That's how we're, how we're kind of uh, getting, getting to that point. But on this operation, if you tally that up, 40% of his sap collected was after the season was over for everybody else. That's a lot, okay? For a little bit of investment there, that's a lot. You just have to keep a movement away from the tap. If you don't have a movement away from the tap, your microbes and your, and your microbial laden sap is going back into the tap hole, and the tree is saying, I'm sealing it off. Okay? And as we learned last year, we collected it, it wouldn't give us much, but this year we'll try to keep it cool in that Connex box and see how we can see how we can increase our production there. At this point, this is real for us down here, this is this is a big deal. Now the folks up north have kept their pumps running 24-7 for forever, okay? They, they, they knew that. We have to take, bring it on down here, bring it to a, 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 an operation that, you know, was logical and, and with our small producers, this, this worked real, real well. And we got, we got some proof of that. Oh. Next, a uh, question? Yeah. Um, going back to your, um, the hose thing, um, like for a new hose, do you have to do anything? I, I, a new hose, you do not have to sanitize. Okay. And it also said don't rinse. So you leave that stuff in there? No. You, now I say rinse it. Okay, because it said don't rinse. Yeah. Okay. Um, <coughs> I have to go back and take a look at what. You get, you, if you put sanitizing solution in there, the big guys, we, there are people up in Vermont and Maine who run 16,000 taps on, on, on 316. You, know, you can't do that. They're, they're just letting their first sap flow run on the ground and rinsing it with sap. Your small operation, I don't like to let anything run on the ground. Just go back up and, and rinse it with a little bit of water, run that down. That's, that's what I think, yeah. yeah. You keep on mentioning water. You want to talk about the source water? Do you use tap water, spring water, and what type of water should you use? I, I, use, I don't use tap water um, because I've got an RO and there's issues related to the membranes of ROs and chlorine. So I wouldn't use that, but I use spring water. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's fine. fine. Alright, so what can a producer do? Okay. A, if you are not, change your spouts every year. Right. Take that spout off last year. Don't bother trying to clean it. Put a new spout on every year. Change your drops every three to five years. That's the line that comes down into your. If you got two, if you don't have, if you don't, if you're on buckets, then just clean your buckets. Okay. Um, but change your drops every three to five years. This is standard operating procedure at this point, and we're adapting that from up north. <laughs> Keep your sap cool. How can you do that? Well, if you've got a, collect a wood collection tank in the middle of the field, that's not so good. Keep your collection tank in the woods, put some, put some shades around it, anything you can do to, to keep it cool. I know people in Michigan, I don't recommend this, but I know people in Michigan who keep their sap underground, okay? To keep it cool, it's gonna, it's gonna keep it cool under there. Um, if you're a small producer, run it, and if you've got an RO, run it through the RO, put the concentrate in the refrigerator. Get a chance to boil. That's that's fine. A bunch of refrigerators, pretty cheap cooling, right? Um, if you're uh, a bigger producer, as I said, we got this guy Chris Grimes. He's going to use a Connex box, and he's got a got a got a, a air conditioner. Pretty cheap way of doing it. If you're an old dairy farmer and you got you got a milk tank and it's got a working cooling unit in it, that's fantastic. But keep it any way you can. Keep it keep it cool. Keep the entire operation clean from, from bucket to evaporator. Keep everything clean. Um, that means when it warms up, get out there and rinse and rag out those buckets. It means you can't really do that in season. I haven't 
thoughtful way out to, to sanitize, you know, your, your 316s lines. But people are sanitizing their main lines halfway through the season. You have a, a big warm up. There are guys that are going out there and running a sanitizer solution through the mains, cleaning them out. It's not that much work once you get the thing set up. If you can drive on a on a on a side on a, on a, on a, on a you know, little four wheeler cart up to the top with 30 gallons of, of water and just run it through your lines, and put some you know sodium cancel up the in it, you're going to knock that microbial mass down, which is going to be on your side. So people are starting to do do that. They didn't do it earlier, and keep the sap moving. Keep, you know, put a little pump on it, try to keep that sap moving. Again, battery operated, 12 volt battery, little electric uh, charger. We're not talking about the money, but we're going to get some some real benefits in terms of in terms of flow on that. Yeah. Your spouts, have you looked into any of these silver impregnated? Yes, yes. And in fact, um, I'm, I'm going to pass this around. Thank you for bringing that up. And if you would like to be on my mailing list, I mean future generations, uh, we'll, we'll, anytime something comes out, we'll send it to you, just send you an email, all right? This, on the 7th of November, Les Over from Ohio and I are doing a session on spouts. You know, there are 12 different kinds, everybody's trying to invent the better mousetrap, and there's new things coming out. Let's take a look and see what's working for people and the advantages and disadvantages of each. They claim three years. We have found two years at max. Maybe only one year before those those that back spouts that the silver silver pregnant cells start to lose their efficacy. Most people I know are getting two years. Nobody I know in West Virginia is get, getting three years out. Is that because the power film is kind of coating the We have a study on that. Uh, Yang Jin is going to be doing that later in the season. She's going to be looking and seeing why they're losing their efficacy. You know, I believe that's the case, but we're going to do the work. Yeah. Are you also studying check valve files? Um, yes. I got this nice six-line thing figured out. Okay. Once I once I get those trees calibrated, I can do a different experiment each year. It's really going to be fun. I have. I talked to a producer up in New York who's running 316s. He swears by check valves. Most of the other producers that I've talked to swear at check valves. Okay? I don't know. But we're going to, we got a system set up, we're going to be able to figure it out. And that's, that's, that's what I want to do. But Howard up in New York says he couldn't, he couldn't run without check valves. How about you guys? What do you find? We like them. We like them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Question. So I have a question. We're new and really small in what we do. And the problem that I ran into last year was the wide variations in temperature within the day. And we're also 30 miles from where our trees are. So I'm going out early in the morning trying to get what may have been out at night, hoping like Hades that it became 65 during the day, that stuff's not spoiling right where it was at. And then I'm freezing stuff because I ran out of freezer space. But those wide variations, when you have a lot of sap, you just kind of you're like, oh, that little bit won't spoil the batch, or you're like, oh, this whole day is not good. If, if I've got an inch in the bottom of my bucket, or two inches in the bottom of my bucket, and sat there for three days, I throw it out. Yeah. And I clean clean the buckets on the warm period. It will it will spoil the batch. Yeah, there was a day that was like 65. Just to me. Yeah, yeah, it will spoil the batch. That's, that's, that's part of our problem, for sure. Yeah. Any other questions? I should have asked. You should have raised your hand. Yeah, any kind of, yeah. On your spouts, you're talking about, I've used, for 30 years, I've used the stainless steel spouts that I found in. Yeah. It seems like, you know, and doing just fine. If you have a stainless steel spout and you sanitize them, yep. okay. no problem. Boil them. Boil them in between time. That's just as sterile as what the surgeon uses. <clears throat> Sir, yeah. So my now, question is, they're expensive. Relative. Not because I use them ever. I've used them for 30 years. There you go. So yeah, they're not they expensive work. anymore. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But this year I'm looking at going to the stainless steel 516s and going to 
put drip lines in. Yeah. Gentleman over here said, you know, we're talking about well, what I see are the plastic spouts that people put in the trees. Mm -hmm. That's what most people use, but, but people, people who've got the stainless steel made the investment they love. But, but you're saying that those plastic spouts, they start to clog, you have problems. <coughs> if you're cleaning those and you're cleaning the stainless steel spouts, yeah. I don't get the difference. If you clean them, I, I'm, I'm not, not yeah, going to no, 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 question, but if you buy, I mean, you okay. Can't. Um, there are clear plastic spouts which are polycarbonate if you're getting a preview of seven, okay? Those get brittle over time and, uh, and you shouldn't clean them. There are also nylon spouts. They tend to be white or, or black or colored, not clear. Those you can, you can clean. And, and use them. And we're working on a process, you know, how do you clean it? Well, we're working on that, that process. So this year, I would say, replace them. Next year, might be bad. We may, we may have some, some good solid data on, on how to reuse. Obviously, reusing is a great idea uh, for the environment, for the, you know, for, for the time and everything else. But I don't know, I don't know now how, how, how exactly. Is it the 516? Oh, yeah. Stainless. Yeah, the they're fine. They'll last forever. For, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Make the investment and they'll last forever. Yeah. Heather. Thank you. Okay, so if you're mid season, you have high temperatures and you saw it sanitized during the season, mm -hmm. um, and you're running your tool shop through your lines, it's like ideally you're <coughs> taking it all out, it's coming all the way through. But there's going to be some that stays in there. How, what's the break time, breakdown period so that you're not in the middle of the and you're stacked? Like, how long does it take it to break down? Heather, we're starting that experiment at the office next week. <laughs> I'm always ahead of you. Yeah, you're always ahead of me. Yeah, how long does it take that sanitizing agent to break down? Nobody really, I don't know, okay? But we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna fill a line with sanitizing agent. We're going to check the chlorine concentration every week <coughs> until it's gone. And, um, and that, we're going to do that next week, yeah. Um, let's say that we use our sanitizer on our lines and then we did a, a thorough rinse of that line thereafter. What are your thoughts on maybe adding air or pushing air through the tubing system to take the moisture out? I think it's a good idea. I haven't done it, but I think intuitively, because you, you're always going to see sags, okay? You've got drop lines coming down, and if you can, if you can, if you can. Blast it, blast that stuff out, clear, clear it out. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. Yeah. But are, are you dealing with, a, I'd assume, an air compressor? Yeah. They're, well, because air compressors inside the tanks, if you ever look inside of them, they do have. Potentially a problem with that. They have oil buildup, they have metal residue, they have all sorts well, of Well, there's, there's, that, that, that's, that's why I, I don't, I don't know. It's, it, it is. It's yeah, you, yeah, and I, like I said, I don't know if that's the right answer. Yeah, that, that, that you could be putting more contaminants, contaminants in. You, you don't want to do that. Yeah. So that would be a procedure that would need to be worked out. Yeah. The, yeah. the bigger producers do that with vacuum. Yeah, they keep they keep yeah, it on vacuum. Exactly. You bet. Yeah. You bet. Pushing air. Yeah. You bet. Yeah, yeah. That, that exactly. Even the shirt looks like they work. Yeah. Yeah. You can also use hydrogen. Now, you, you, this study here, 40%. Word on the street is you get twice as much sand. If you, now, it all depends on, depends on where, how your lines are, okay? If, you're, if, you're, if your lines are on a steep slope and you don't have any, you know, Brandon will talk about this, as you get down to the bottom of that slope, the vacuum on those lines decreases. That's where your little sure flow pump or your vacuum pump keeps the vacuum high in the bottom, the bottom there. So if I've got a slope that looks like this and I don't have any trees for 30 feet before my collection tank, I'm, I'm gold, okay? But most people don't. Most people have a tree right next to their collection tank and then the vacuum level on that is, is, is much, much less unless you go with a hybrid system. Yeah? i got a crazy question. I don't know what anybody else's setup is like, but Ours, the top of the line is 
inaccessible except by foot. Yes. So the question is, when you start flushing these lines, how are you accomplishing that? Are you going to the top of the line with a five gallon pail of the sanitizer and vacuuming it down? I'm going to the top of the line with a, a uh, spray that I bought from the Ace Hardware yes. that I was, you know, put uh, insecticide or, pet or herbicides in, fill it with water. I've got it set up so that there's a little bit of 5 sixteenths tubing on the end of it, and I just stick my spout into that, give it a pump, and, and flush it on down. Okay. Yep, and that works really well for those inaccessible lines. And you do that for two minutes, so that you get that two minute cover. Oh, no, no, I'm, when, I, when I'm sanitizing, I'm filling that line, okay? So, 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 yeah, okay, okay. What we do is we have, we have all of our spouts on their pegs or in their cups, and then we, we go down to the bottom of that line, and, and then we got a clamp on the bottom so that so the, the, the sanitizer solution can't drain out. And then we pull that first spout and down it comes. And once I get sanitizing solution, I can smell it, I cap it off, I go to the next one, spout. You know, how are you filling the line to begin with? How are you getting it all in? If you can get to the top of the line, all right, I'm, I'm, you know, there's a couple different ways. If, if, you can get a, if you can get a pump up there, just get it going and it'll siphon. You don't need to, you know, just get it, get it. If you can siphon it into the line, you know, you're, you're, you're golden. We, we, we have a little backpack pump and then we basically run it that way. Somebody's up on top and somebody goes and pops all those spouts. When you get the sanitizer solution, you put them back on the, on the, on the carrier. Yeah, it works, it works pretty, it's quick as you can walk through the woods. Yeah. But something we do, we're, we're flat. And when we, when we go to sanitize, of course, I'm able to put a bug on the bucket and back on the side. And I have a bolt primer that goes from the motor to the gas station. Of course, I got a new one. And um, uh, I made this little adapter that goes from the primer bowl to the holes on, on the tubes. And I can just squeeze it and it pumps it up. And I start at the very end of the line. Once you, once you got that siphon going, it's this happening, yeah. Yeah, however you figure that out. Yeah, looks more. All right, next slide. We're just about down here and lunch is just about ready, so it's probably all working out well. All right, um, maple production challenges, where we live. I'm gonna make the statement that um, the distance between Vermont and Kentucky is getting less and less and less. What do I mean by that? What's that? The weather. The weather. Yeah, the weather is looking more and more like Kentucky as you as you move north. There, and I'm going to make a statement here that uh, the work that we're doing down here is very important for the folks up north because as we figure some of these things out, they will be very interested in. And, and both Kentucky and West Virginia have received ACER access grants to do research and work down here. And people say, wow, why are they giving a grant to these guys? They're not that. If you want to make maple syrup, give a grant to Maine, right? Okay. But my contention is, and I know this is true, there are a lot more people down here who don't know about maple syrup than there are in New York. I go home, I got a place in the Adirondacks, I go home, every gas station has got a display case selling maple syrup. In Vermont, you can't go on the block without everybody selling maple syrup. What you're doing down here, you're not, you're not, you know, as I said last yesterday, Vermont's not shaking in the shoes because we're down here talking about making maple syrup. But what you're doing is by exposing people to it, by getting your product out there, say, hey, this is nice, can I get some more? No, we're sold out. They're going to find somewhere else to get it, okay? And so when it comes to the ag marketing side of things of these ACER access grants, this is where the action is. The more, more we can teach people about maple syrup, the better the expansion of those markets. And then certainly the second thing is what we're learning down here, Kentucky, future generations, WV State, um, you know, is really things that are going to be applicable to, to what's going on going on in the future up north as they uh, you know, adapt to the changes that, that we're seeing in their class of fit. So 
a pitch for us all, guys. You're, you're helping to expand the markets and the, the innovations that come out of you all is what's uh, is really very, very important to the continuation of this, this industry in the future. All right, that's all I got to say. Any other questions? Otherwise, let's have lunch. Thank you. If you're a producer, you know the name CDL. They're a big um, manufacturer of naval equipment. Been around for a long time. Um, so Brandon's going to talk about tubing, vacuum, and that sort of genre. So I am Brandon Daniels. I know I know some of you. Uh, like I said I know Nate and I'm Dr. Reckland. We talk all the time. I know. Use the mic, please. So I know some of you all. Uh, Seth had actually, Seth Long was the president, he contacted me, I knew Seth a little bit, about two or three years ago and asked me if I would start trying to support you all in Kentucky and uh, provide you all the supplies and equipment or whatever needed, so, I, so I've met some of you along the way. So I'll just give you a little history on, on what I've, uh, uh, where I started to where we are now, and then I'm just going to kind of open it up, I'm not going to sit here and just do a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I've got some stuff on my phone. I don't know if I'll be able to project my phone on there or not, but but if not, then I can pull some stuff up on the computer. But I can answer some questions, discuss to me. Uh, Jeff has a little homemade RO that he built up here, so he brought it in for you all to look at. So he can come up and talk about that if you want or explain that. So we'll just kind of keep it open. But I started making maple syrup about 35 years ago, I think. Uh, I don't have any pictures or we don't have any records. That's about 12 or 13 years old. So over in Virginia, we're close to where Dr. Reckland is from, over in Highland County, Virginia, they have a big maple festival. So my, my dad worked over in that area, not too far from there. So every year we would go over to that maple festival. It's, it's enormous. Uh, there'll be 20, 30,000 people come through there in a weekend. And it's just a little one horse town that he built over in Monterey, Virginia. So when I was about 12 or 13, we had a lot of maple trees on the family farm where I grew up and I thought, well, I think I can do this. So my dad found where he worked at a paper mill in Virginia. And so he found a pan down there. They had the stock room for years, a little two by three stainless pan, and they gave it to him. Been back there for years. They didn't made it, never used it. So he brought it home. And so I thought, well, it can't be too complex. So I dug, so I had, so I got 10 taps the first year. I dug a hole in the ground. I put fire in the hole and I set the pan on top of the fire. <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> so that's how kind of how I started out with 10 taps. And, and so now today we have about, we're still just a little small operation. I have about 2,500 taps uh, on about five properties. And we have uh, two of the properties that have between four and 450 taps that are on you know, vein pumps with submersible releasers. And then the other three, there's eight properties total, but there's, they go into five different locations. And the other three locations we have, uh, last year we actually ran some, uh, uh, the guzzler pumps. I had two double diaphragms and then uh, Doug Riley, the president, asked me to test one of the quad pumps. I tested one of the quad pumps for him last year. So, so basically everything is on vacuum. I wish everything was on the, the uh, three properties that are on the, uh, which have about uh, 1,600 to 2,500 taps that are on the guzzler pumps. Um, they are run off the generators, they're remote. So, uh, and there are, there are three 16s. Most of the tubing's been in anywhere from seven to 10 years. But so that kind of gives you, we uh, run a, a we run a two post 1200 RO, CDLRO, and I have a CDL uh, three to 10 old fire evaporator. So we can process about, oh, um, anywhere from 1,500 gallons at an hour. So I run air injector in the front pan, rear pan. We try to make, but everything I make is usually 85 to 90 percent is really light syrup. I try to make all really light syrup because I can take a little bit of dark syrup and make it medium because almost everything we sell, it's all medium. So we'll blend it to get, but it's, it's easy to dark and light syrup, but you can't light and dark syrup. So, so that kind of gives you a history of where I'm at. And, and then go ahead, Jimmy. Yeah, um, Brandon, I was uh, earlier, Mike was talking about what he was talking about tubing and going, I guess, trying to change the gears a little bit. Can you explain to me what, like, a little bit more about a hybrid system and what that means yeah. in a, a tubing line set up? So, so I cover, I have five states for CDL, and so Kentucky's one of them. I also do North Carolina and Tennessee. There's really not much there. There's a few, few producers there, but it's, uh, it's, uh, 
it's uh, few and far between. So I'm you know available to help them if, as needed. But uh, so in West Virginia and Virginia, most everybody is on 316s, and Kentucky also. I guess a lot of Kentucky. I mean, a lot of West Virginia and Virginia and Kentucky is really steep. Uh, especially the eastern part of Kentucky is really steep. It's, it's pretty it's pretty steep down there, pretty mountainous. More so than I thought it was going to be. So. I haven't been this. I've, I've been through Lexington before, but I haven't been down south of Lexington. Really, I've been all the way down to the bottom, you know, further south, but right in this area. I don't think I've ever been in this area before. But the uh, so West Virginia and Virginia, like I said, Kentucky, most everybody's on 316. So that's what we ran for years. Uh, so the properties we have electric to, we're switching to a uh, wet dry system. Uh, but uh, the the difference between 316s and 516s, 316s has it's 36 percent of the volume of uh, 516 so it's way less volume as mike was talking about earlier one thing i did notice last year and jimmy referred to hybrid system hybrid system is we have some guys uh, that are uh running the vein pump last year one of the woods i didn't get switched out to 516s i ran out of time so i ran it the, i had the vein pump and the submersible releaser on the 316 so what a what a hybrid system is basically you're using a vacuum pump like a little uh sap sucker pump or a, you know, like a guzzler or sure flush sure flush is the other one a lot of people use those and so they use that to provide vacuum to the uh to the system we don't i have never had very little plugging i've been running 316s for 10 or 11 years tim wilmot and i used to talk a lot we were good friends tim's the one that originally designed it i started using not too long after that we would you know share ideas and talk about stuff but he's he's retired uh, but the, what the, the hybrid system is uses a vacuum pump to provide a vacuum assist. And so we did, three of the woods last year, we did put the Desert pumps on. We saw it made a huge difference. It really made a huge difference. We have, we don't normally have much plugging. I've got to add about 20 to 25 miles of it in the woods. We have, we might find three or four places a year where it was plugged. I think one of the things was obviously as soon as the season was over, we tried to get the taps out of the trees. We used to let them hang and dry. <coughs> couple of weeks and then go back and cap them off to dry the system out but with with the hybrid system last year with the vacuum pumps on about 2,000 taps there were 316s we didn't see any plugging at all so I mean I think that that would help overcome any plugging issues and all of our tubing has been out last year with had been out all the 316s have been anywhere from six to nine or ten years so that's what they're using a vacuum pump to provide vacuum assist to the lower taps and also to the upper taps and it, it does make a huge difference. What, what it helps is, is when the weather gets warm like it was last year, it helps keep those taps running longer and it also keeps that pressure on the tap hole. Even when the sap is quit running, it keeps pulling against the tap hole. So what that does is it, it doesn't let bacteria back up into the tap hole. And there was a couple of things earlier that they were talking about stainless spouts. Okay, I remember when those came out like 15 years ago in CDO, I actually was one that brought them out. They were the next new thing, and they last about three years, been everybody threw them away. Because the problem with stainless is that, you know, if you just got a few taps, it's fine. The problem with stainless is that they're, most of the guys are tapping trees and it's frozen. Stainless has no give to them, and it was busting, the, it was cracking the trees and splitting the trees really bad. So, I know somebody was talking about early use stainless spouts, but I don't know anybody in the industry that still uses them as far as any that's of any size because of that reason they're so hard that they, they make them on a tubing but but uh, they were going to be the next greatest thing because they would last forever they weren't porous and everything like that but i think obviously if you've got many taps on tubing i think uh, plastic is way better to go because it has a little bit of give a little bit of flex and it's you're if you're tapping a frozen tree you're going to bust that tree with a stainless spout you know, if you're if you're dead with a small amount of taps and careful i think it's fine uh, so, and another thing came up with a check valve we had Dr. Dr. I'm friends with Dr. Abby Vandenberg, and we talked from time to time. And she came down. Oh, this was 2016, I think. We had we had, she was down for a presentation in West Virginia, and she said, "I might get fired for this," but she said, "If you don't, if you're using check valves." She said, "The only way they're technically going to work good, and that's why there's so many people that don't like them anymore, is you have to turn the vacuum pump on. once you have to run vacuum. You have to turn them on before the season starts." And you don't turn your vacuum pump off with the <coughs> with vein pumps we do that we'll turn them on before we tap and if they run 24 7 you know, we'll turn them off so and that's the way they're technically designed so she said in order for them to work correctly because you know a lot of people this was seven years ago complaining about uh, 
uh, you know, the, the, the balls now either sticking closed or sticking open. And she said that's that's why, because people want to turn their pumps off when it gets cold, and but they have to have they need to be turned on and never turn the pump off. So all right, what else what else do y'all want to talk about? Jeff, you want to explain your RO here? I we we just came out, we got a couple of options. We just came out with a new one I had it up on the screen. I was hoping to have one for the meeting today, but I'll pull it back up there in a minute. But Jeff made this one so he can kind of explain how it works because this is more, I can get up and talk about, you know, the bigger machines or whatever. We got machines that I could run from my phone, you know, that were, you know, halfway across the country. But, you know, it's, uh, uh, there's really no sense talking about this. This is more applicable what y'all are doing and he can just give a couple minutes and explain how he made this and how it works. You might want to put it on the table or something. You want to set it up here? I better give you the mic so everybody can hear. Oh, up there, I guess. And when he gets done, we'll open it up and we can talk about whatever y'all want to talk about. Real quick, this is a, real quick, this is just a small unit. I only get about five gallons an hour out of it. You got three, three uh, 150 gallon per day uh, membranes in it that you run through. Basically, they're in series. Series. Sorry for my voice. I'm a little squeaky. But basically, they're in series. So you run through the pump into a pre-filter. It filters out. Then you run into your uh, units in there, and you filter out. Basically, you. You get a permeate out of it, which is water. You get the water out of it, and you'll you'll get about two thirds of the amount of water out on this this typical unit. I got about 380 bucks in the thing. Um, there are other units that uh, CDL makes that uh, Smoky Lake. I think you guys got one. Uh, we don't manufacture them. Uh, we're a dealer from Protect. Units, but okay, but yeah. what, what do they run? 500 to 1,000, something like that? Yeah, you might be thinking of the, uh, yeah, the smaller 4x40 is around 3,000, but this other ones like that, there's a RO bucket is a common one. Yeah. That home builders are small. Um, I've seen some around something. for a grand or something like that. Yeah. And that, they'll get you, what, 10 or 15 gallons? Yeah, this one, we just came out, this is a little bigger one here. This one, uh, I'll take up 29 gallon an hour and it'll go from two to five on one pass and you can pick it up and carry it. It's about, it's 1700, but it'll take out 29 an hour and you can recirc and probably get it up to eight. But I don't know if everybody's familiar with what our RO does for you, but it takes out water that you don't have to boil out. So you're not using as much fuel to, to get rid of the water. Yeah, and I, I'll talk a little louder since I don't have a mic, but one thing I was telling Jeff that he didn't realize, he said he's just recirculating his out of a 55 gallon drum. And I asked him if he had his hose, his suction hose up off the bottom, and he said no. So one thing, and I told him it would help him if he pulled his hose up off the bottom like six inches and held it up with a clamp or something, because sugar is heavier than water, so when you're recircling, that sugar's falling down and it goes to the bottom of the tank. So instead of you recircling, and we'll intermix some, instead of you recircling, if you're pulling it up off the bottom a little bit, and then, then you're not sucking in the, because it, I mean, you get the higher concentrate, we'll concentrate to 90 to 95%, so we're only boiling 5 to 10%. So, but when you can really see the sugar, I mean, it's, you just see it in there dancing. It's like yellow. I mean, it, it's a yellow collar, and you can see it just dancing. So if you are recircling, then it's going to go to the bottom, and it's just going to dance in there. So, it's, so you pull it by, so, you know, pulling your hose up off it will help you. Yeah, I've tried to recirculate on this one, run, run it back through and run it back through, and it just really gets real slow when you, uh, I'm, it's a, you get what you pay for. It's a small unit, but for me, it's good. I've, I've only got 55 taps that I do. Uh, I'll stick the hose in and 55 gallon drum or two 55 gallon drums siphon together and just let it run all night. I'll go to bed and let it have at it and put a 20 or 30 gallon uh, receiver tank for, this, for the concentrated sap and let the rest of it run out. One thing in, in, in maintaining these things, uh, the membrane filter, and I've got, I've got some handouts here. I've only got about 10 of them. I don't know if we've got a copier here. Not okay. I can take it. Okay. I, uh, there's about 10 copies here. Uh, if, if you run out of copies, so if somebody wants something, just give me your email or give me a text. I can, I can send you a PDF or a, a, a 
of the thing. But um, I like to say, let it run all night. You got to keep, got to keep your filters clean. When I'm done with running, I'll run the permeate, which is almost pure water. Run it back through and rinse every and rinse everything out so that. Uh, so it's, so it's ready for the next time. You, uh, you, and you don't want to let your membranes dry out. Good, and you don't want to freeze them either. So there's some storage things and some end of season clean out stuff that we've got in this handout that uh, is pretty handy. I'm sure Brandon will talk about that on RO systems. Um, but yeah, that is the biggest thing with the ROs is you gotta, you gotta take care of them. It's just like anything. Uh, the better you take care of something, the better it'll take care of you. Obviously, you can take care of stuff and it still break, but as a whole, you know, that's kind of the same way with our body. The better time, the better you take care of it, the better, the better you treat it, the healthier you are, the better it's going to take care of you as a whole. It's never a guarantee, obviously. So, so any other questions on RO systems? I mean, we can just, I'd rather just help you all and answer questions on what you all want to talk about. Go ahead, Brian. Do you notice any difference in the flavor if you cook the water out or if you run it through once or if you run it through twice or you run it through three times because wow. cooking seems like you know I mean I'm real happy with what I'm doing yeah yeah I mean it's all I, I to me I think you make and I don't take this the wrong way I think you make better circle than RX especially later in the season because you're as, as these you got such a short time window as the warmer it gets and the higher the bacteria and the yeast get and the enzymes in the later part of the season, the quicker you can process that mm -hmm. stuff, the faster. And we're, we're normally going 90, 92% on one pass. So we don't, we're not really recircling, but it, uh, it, yeah, I think, so it's not, it really doesn't, I mean, even, you know, 90, 95%, as far as if you, you know, if you could boil it as fast as you can process an RE, there's really not much difference in flavor. It, and I don't think there's any. I mean, it's going to be a little lighter, probably a little bit, because you're not Could boiling it well. to death. Yeah, I mean, you take, you take, uh, so say you take a thousand gallon and you, you know, and it takes you 12 hours to boil it, or you, or you boil it in an hour after you concentrate it. Obviously, the difference is that you got another 12 hours for the sugar to sit there and eat on the bacteria. So, yes, ma'am? Is the concentrate, does the concentrated sap have shorter storage? It, it does. It's a very good point. Yeah, when you concentrate, you need to boil. So, here's the problem. So, we're concentrating to 90% or higher. So, not only are you concentrating the sugar to 90%, you're also concentrating the bacteria to 90%. So, it's bacteria to heaven. So they've got all this bacteria all close together and they've got all this sugar and they don't have to work to get the sugar so they're just going crazy. So yeah, you, you concentrate, you need to boil. Last year we concentrated in the throat. Well, no, that's fine. We did. We just yeah. ran out of storage space and that was what saved us with the yeah. bucket. We just started running it through and sticking it through. Some, some people, uh, you know, do have like the refrigerated milk coolers. But they're not taking it down to 30 in the 30s. They're taking it to 26 or 27 degrees to be able to keep it. They're going five, six, seven degrees above freezing point to be able to to hold this stuff. That's how unstable it is. So if you want to concentrate the stuff and let it sit there until the next day, you know you'll probably come back and you're going to have you put that evaporator. You'll make ropey syrup probably. <coughs> yes, sir. If you just boil it, that kill the bacteria. Yeah, you could you could run it through and pasteurize it, I guess. And then, you know, I mean, if you don't RO it all, if you just boil it, right? You don't get to oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's that's the best way to do it. Is try to process it every day if you can to make the, the best, the highest quality of syrup. Uh, you're gonna make better syrup. You're gonna have you know probably a little better sugar content because the longer it sets, the more bacteria does eat your sugar. And if only it's 0.1 or 0.2 percent, then. You know, it still makes a difference. And most of our sap is we use the average like 1.1. .1. Um, why I don't know, but we do. So we've got a lot of sugar, mostly sugars, a lot of nice big trees, good soil, and, so. and we're quite a bit colder than it is here. What other questions do you have on reverse osmosis? Brandon, um, how much uh, how much rinse water does a guy need for like a smaller system like you were showing? You know, 
uh, as far as permeate for how long the rinse? And yeah, just depends uh, on uh, like a four inch membrane. You should probably have you know at least 50 gallon per membrane to rinse it. Uh, usually at the end of the day, you'll rinse. You'll just run them. Yeah, permeate through them for a minute or one to two minutes to flush the sugar off. And you'll go ahead and boil that so you're not wasting all that concentrate that's in there on your membranes. And then you'll rinse them for about 10 minutes. So whatever it takes on a system like this, it's going to take just a few gallon for 10 minutes. We're on a four inch membrane, it's going to take more on an eight inch membrane. Use on eight inch membrane. Use on four inches, we'll say about 100, uh, 100 gallon per membrane and then a couple hundred gallon on an eight inch membrane to rinse them. And, You'll rinse them for about 10 minutes and usually do a soap wash. They call it soap, it's sodium hydroxide. It's the same stuff they wash fruits and vegetables with. It's a food grade stuff, but you don't want to eat it to make you yeah. sicker. Our manufacturers that do not use um, tap water because of chlorine. And so, is that something that you would recommend to our customers? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We tell people, I mean, we don't put it on any of this, but you can rinse with chlorinated water, it's fine. What you can't do is you can't concentrate chlorinated water. Okay. You can rinse with it. To, you start up your, uh, you know, I keep water in my machine here around. My wash tank stays full because our, our RO room's heated and I've got a backup wall gas here, so I don't worry about it. It's, uh, but, so we, I'll kick my machine on and run it five or six times throughout the year for two to five minutes. Just recirculate down the wash tank. Because the worst thing in the world, especially on these bigger machines, we'll do the same thing in our vacuum pumps. We'll turn them on and let them run for a couple of minutes, just deadhead them for a couple of minutes a few times a year. Because the worst thing on maple equipment, and, and we see most of the breakage at the start of the season because the stuff's set there for 10 or 11 months and hasn't been used. And that's the worst thing on any motor or engine or anything like that. It's just inactivity. So we'll kick ours on and let them run for a little while, you know, just to. Uh, we don't put, we don't tell people to we don't put in our manuals to keep water in your machine year round. Obviously, we put it in there to drain it because we don't want to be liable if they freeze and bust. But my, a lot of people are going to that, especially the bigger machines, just so they can turn them on and just run, you know, run them a little bit. Just just keep those motors and everything you know, setting their season up. Can you run your RO sap that's been refrigerated, or does it need to come up to room temperature? No, it can be cold. Sometimes we're running, I mean, sometimes we're hauling, I have to haul about 80% of the sap in. So sometimes we're hauling the sap, it's, you know, it may have, the weather may have turned bad, it might be in the 20s and the sap's just barely about freezing or there's ice in the tank. So, I mean, I've run it through the RO in the low 30s. So, obviously, the, the uh, with ROs, the numbers you see as far as the published numbers are with 55 degree sap. Okay, so the colder it is, the less you're going to go through. So if you're running 32 to, or say 34 degrees sap versus 55, you're probably going to lose about 20 percent of your efficiency. Or if you're running 70 degrees sap through there, it's going to go through a lot faster. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Um, this is a question for you, but also kind of relates to the question back there. So for the water, we were trying to avoid the chlorinated water. So we re-plumbed ours at the beginning of the season with a carbon block filter in place of the pre-filtered mm -hmm. and it disconnect, disconnected from our membranes to make ourselves, I mean, again, we're small, so to make ourselves 30 gallons of mm -hmm. um, non-chlorinated water to begin, um, because we were trying to buy, the year before, I guess, we bought 20 gallons from the grocery store of distilled yeah. water to bring home. So I don't know if expensive. that's a good idea, but that's how we got around. Yeah, here. like I said, I'm not going to tell you to go against what they tell you, but, but if you're just rinsing, just rinsing, I mean, if you got preservative in your membranes or whatever, you just need to, usually you'll do a soap wash and a rinse before you start for the year, because you've already done your acid wash and everything in the last season. So you'll do a soap wash and then a rinse for, and it's fine to, because you're not concentrating. That's the biggest thing. When you start trying to shove chlorine through a membrane, then when you do start concentrating, I mean, you could let sap run through it for a couple minutes if you wanted to without concentrating, and run it down the drain if it, you know, or five minutes if it made you feel better, but it's, you're not, you're not, I think that's the biggest key is you don't want to concentrate well water to make permeate or, or city water. Okay, oh, thank you. Yeah, you're just running under real low pressure, so you're just flushing out the junk. If that makes sense. Yeah, it used to be there was a big you know, scare about, oh, we should never, you know, have, but I think that's the biggest thing is, is concentration. So.
people were like Dr. Reckland said, people were scared scared to death to use anything that's got any chlorine in it. But it will if you put it out in the open air, chlorine will evaporate off but then like I don't know what the time frame is a day or so. Yes sir? So I've seen TV filters put on training and water rooms so that uh, hopefully a kale mold, et cetera, and more premium so maybe increase in shelf life. Is it truth in that? Or? Uh, very, very minimal difference. The, the way RO of uh, the uh, uh, UV lights is what he was talking about to help increase your sap. Uh, if you had a like a whole house unit and you had like a little bilge pump or something you drop down in your tank and you just let that stuff sit there and just recirculate, uh, you know, all the time through that uh, UV light, and that that'll do more for it than anything. <coughs> That, that's the best way to do it. So that's going to help you more. Just continual recirculation. If that makes sense. While we're on that, has anyone tried it? Because I also read that it might warm up your sap a lot as it goes through the unit. And we were concerned about the heat. Like, we're already trying to cool it, right? And now we're killing off bacteria, but we're heating it with the light. So does anyone use UV and have a heat problem? Try to get this thing clipped on here so I don't have to hold it. Uh, I had years and years ago, I had one that I decided I was going to use a UV light, and I used the thing and a little bit, and then I, uh, maybe a year or so, and I quit using it. But I, somebody else had bought off of me a couple years ago, and they started using it, and they said it made a drastic difference. That's what they were doing, was recirculating. And they're down in, uh, down, in the, down south of Huntington, West Virginia, where most of you know where that's at. So they're even warmer than they are here, really warm. And so they, they said it made a huge difference for them. But they were just doing the research. Yeah, you are going to warm it up a little bit, but it's not. But if it's if you got sap in the tank that's 50 and the air temperature overnight is down in the 30s or 40s, running through that hose may actually cool it off a little bit. So it, yeah, it, it's uh, if you're just using like a small bilge pump or whatever. There's not a lot of friction there uh, to heat it up a whole lot. So I think your benefits are far outweigh any uh, uh, negatives. Yes, sir. Do you think it's best to soap wash on a regular cycle or just when performance drops off? I soap wash every day. So yeah, I use pure sodium hydroxide. And the organic stuff we sell, so I mean, a container will have $17 a container will last me all season. So I just, I, I just rather, I, I'd rather overwash than underwash. I, I don't know, there's two schools of thought there. I don't know there's a right or wrong, wrong way. Some people just do it every eight hours of use. I don't know. So what else? We can talk about we can talk about tubing, uh, we can talk about 316s, 516s, we can talk about vacuum systems. I mean, I'd rather talk about what you all want to talk about instead of me, like I said, getting up just giving you a presentation because that's what we usually see in it. Go ahead. <clears throat> what I have is on the side, I've got a couple of pretty steep hills. Okay. Uh, climbing up and down those hills, but and collecting daily is uh, tired of it. Yeah, I can't. You know, I, I slide uphill, I, I did that I slide downhill, time. and try to get everything out of the bucket and collect at the bottom. So, what I'm going to do is to go to a black like little tubes on the sides of those hills and have a somewhat of a central collection point, you know, it doesn't have to be one collection point. Um, and that's what I need to know. How many, so you're running a 3 16th line off of the tap. Mm -hmm. How many trees will you put together on one 3 16th line? They say up to 25 taps on a 3 16th line, but you know, I've talked to Tim Wilmot and some others on it. I think that uh, probably I would probably 20 should be max, 15 is better. In your 3 16th yeah. line, they yes. all come together mm -hmm. into a 3 well, 16th line. Yeah, when you say all of them into a larger line, <coughs> like a manifold. No, but you shouldn't be bringing a whole bunch of branch lines into one 3 16th line. It should be just some <coughs> gentle zigzagging right. like a drop line. Sure. Yeah, sure. not trying to bring a whole bunch of them. Well, the way it is, I could probably put six or eight trees here together and move down to six or eight more. So, can you prefer the... But it's better not to bring six or eight and six or eight together and then bring them into one three sixteen.
I've got, like I said, 20, 25 miles of tubing in the woods, and I just, if I had to stake tubing down, I'd quit tomorrow. <laughs> and, and just, if I had to if I had to make sort of reverse osmosis, I'd quit tomorrow. Or I'd go back to doing 10 taps and just doing make a little bit of my house for myself, because it just wouldn't be, it wouldn't be fun anymore. It'd be too costly, too. I did that for years and grew up raw sap for 25 years, I guess. Mm -hmm. I'm not, yeah, I used to do all buckets too. But I'm not getting any younger, and I try to work smarter, not harder. So, so do you get a, a natural vacuum uh, with a drop of elevation? Oh yeah. Yeah, if you have three sixteens and like the hills and stuff around here, you get really good vacuum. You get about an inch of vacuum for every foot of elevation you drop. So if your top tap is 100, say it's a 100 feet elevation drop between that and the bottom of your line, and if you don't have any leaks, you should be pulling. Uh, you lose a inch of you lose a inch of uh, vacuum for every thousand feet of elevation. So my, I'm, I'm at 24 to 2900 feet. So mm -hmm. 2900 feet taps, the max vacuum I can pull would be uh, 27 inches. 29.9 is absolute max you can pull. So. So, so 27 would be about the max that I could pull at that elevation. And which of the taps do you use for your 360? I, I use a clear, clear <laughs> seasonal spouts for everything. Yeah. And I don't like to waste more than the next guy, but I can, but those, spout, those spouts are so dirty and so nasty. There's just you can really see it in the clear spouts, you can't see it in other collars, but they're just full of crud and plastic's porous and that's the way, and some of you may not know this that are newer, that's, that's the way tree, the physiology of the tree works, okay, they're sort of like our bodies, okay, you put, you, if I take a knife and I cut my arm, well, it's going to bleed through, but the body's going to start sending clotting agents, okay, the tree's kind of the same way, you're putting, a, technically you're putting a wound in a tree, when you put a hole in a tree, you're technically putting a wound. Okay, so the more clean and the more sterile that tap hole is, the less bacteria, the longer it's going to stay open. So, but you take, I, I, I should have cut off those spouts, and I mean, they're just nasty. They got black, they got brown, they got green. I mean, that's an, they come out of the tree almost as soon as the season's over. But you take and stick one of those spouts that are just absolutely loaded with millions of bacteria in that, the tree's going to start sensing that contamination. Okay, it doesn't necessarily, if, as long as that tap hole stays sterile, <laughs> It would run for months if, if you had the weather, but uh, but when it's the more bacteria and stuff you it senses, the faster it closes up. It just kind of seals off the wall around. That's what it does. It sends clotting agents. So so putting a, putting a new spout in there, I think is is, is huge. You know, you can't you, technically if you're running vacuum or natural vacuum, you try to cut the spout off of the tea and take them back and clean them. Every time you take it, you're scoring that thing and you're creating a micro leak every time you cut them with a knife blade. So there's really no way to clean them either. I mean, they're, they're trying to get alcohol, uh, isopropyl, the food grade, which they should. Canada's been doing it forever. Uh, the reason the U.S. doesn't do it because 40 or 50 years ago when Canada was doing it, everybody in the U.S. is using buckets and they're like, well, we don't need alcohol to clean our buckets. So there's a lot of people already using it, but. Can I share a learning experience? <coughs> So when we went from buckets to uh, gravity fed lines, mm -hmm. like you're talking about, uh, I was not expecting that much increase in our volume. Really? So we ended up having in mid-season changing our collection tanks to bigger ones. So depending on how much you got, I would just go big to <laughs> begin with. Because it's like, very disappointing to go out there and see all your sap just overflowing. Oh your yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's so hard so that does bring up Thank a, you. bring up a really good point. You should, if you keep your, you know, you're probably going to get two to three times as much sap on like a vacuum system or a natural vacuum over buckets. That's due to a couple of reasons. Number one, you're creating vacuum, so you're pulling it. So what vacuum does? You're technically not sucking sap from the tree. Okay, so this is the way vacuum works. So what you're doing is you're creating an area of low pressure in the tree. So here's how. When a tree freezes at night, right before they, they freeze, that the trees are the way God created them. They, they'll sense a freeze, and they'll suck, right before they freeze, they'll suck sap, they'll suck up water out of the ground. <coughs> Why? It's just the way that nobody knows, and we don't know that until we get to heaven. But so anyway, but that's the way they're designed. And so, uh, 
So what happens is if you ever left a can of pop in a car or something at night and it freezes and just blows everywhere. So when they freeze, obviously you all know this, water expands. So when you freeze, the trees freeze and it creates pressure inside the trees because it makes them swell a little bit. Right? So, so when they thaw out the next day, the pressure inside the tree is greater than the atmospheric pressure outside the tree. So, the, so, it, so it's pushing that, trying to get rid of that pressure, you know, and once the pressure equalizes or gets less inside the tree and atmospheric pressure, they quit running. Mm -hmm. So what natural vacuum with 316s or a vacuum pump does, it creates an area of, lo of, lower, or of lower pressure inside that tree and it keeps sending that to that. It's not actually sucking the sap out of the tree, it's creating an area, of, it's pulling the tree, or creating this little area of lower pressure inside that tree and it just keeps pushing the sap to it. So that's one of the reasons that, you know, if you've got a, three, a 316, I've seen 316s and vacuum systems run for as much as seven or eight days, or even up to 14 days after the last freeze, if it's 100% leak free, because it just keeps pulling and pulling and pulling. Not sucking sap out of the tree, I know that's hard to, it doesn't, it doesn't sound logical, but it's actually, it's, it's pulling the tree, it's creating an area of low pressure in that, that small area of the tree. So you see, you probably will back to where I started, but you probably will get two to three times as much sap. She made a really good point. And another thing is that a lot of you people are, most people I sell to are just real small hobby people. Another thing you all can do too, that you use buckets that'll help you. You can actually get a five or six foot, you can get buy some tubing. The 316 is even better than 516. One reason that the buckets quit running so quickly is because the air is loaded with millions of bacteria. Okay, I was listening to some old bacteria. Every time you kiss somebody, kiss your wife or whatever, you're, you're sharing like 80 million bacteria. Okay, great. Let me gross you out. The reason I say that is because the air is loaded with bacteria. Okay, and so, so that's an open, open hole in that tree, and that air just keeps going in there. And that's why buckets quit running so quickly. So another option you all could do that would help you is that you can, if you had like a six foot piece of food, you can get some five gallon food grade buckets with lids. You can get just a plastic 316th or 516th spout. 316th is even better because it has 36% of the inside diameter of 516th. So the air, it's a lot harder for the air to get back up through that line. So you can get a five gallon bucket. You got a big tree, you put a couple dabs in, you can get your level spots, put you some rocks or cinder blocks or brick on top to hold it down. You can actually drill a hole. Don't drill a hole in the top because it's going to run down. But you can drill a hole in the side of the bucket, the same size as your tubing, about an inch or two down, and stick them in the side. And, you, and you'll get more, you'll get a lot more sap that way. Number one, you, they say you create an inch or two of vacuum on that little 316 tube. But what it does, it's, it's that's a much more sealed system. Okay, I'm gonna make a terrible statement. Then the season, throw that away because that's like 75 cents a tube and it's about throw it away. And next year, get you another one because okay. then you're starting over with a brand new fresh. I, I don't like to waste. I try to recycle everything, but. At the end of the day, you're starting off with a brand new sanitary piece of tubing, and that will run twice as long as buckets hanging on trees for three times. And you'll get a lot more sap that way. And it's going to be cleaner. It's not going to have, it's not going to look like somebody peed in your bucket when the water runs down the tree, or it's not going to be brown. It's not going to be full of bugs. No moss. There's nothing to get in it. It may be hard, maybe an ant that goes around that little tiny crack. But if that makes sense, you go to donut shops or whatever, Lowe's sells like about food grade white buckets and lids for like five bucks. You can go to donut shops or whatever, you can find them for a couple bucks. It's had icing in them. You know, just make sure they're food grade buckets and that's something that's not going to leave a flavor in your syrup. So that's something to help you out. It's cheap, it's easy, it'll get a lot more sap and be a lot cleaner. And you can also, one of the things I did many years ago when I was and lots of buckets on hillsides. I made me a little 55 gallon barrel with a food grade half inch hose or something. I just used that as a dumping station. I took everything to there and then it ran out of that and ran down the hill to the, to the tank. So that made it a lot easier also. And too many things I haven't tried over the years. I never had anybody to help me so I kind of learned everything in school art and so. I know this is probably off topic, but so last year I tried, it was our first year, we just tried all kinds of different things to see what worked. Um, and so I did sit in the bags on the trees, and it made my head hurt because in all the stuff that you're, you see, it's like, don't use any old buckets with lead, don't use any evaporators with lead, and every one of those fingers said, this has lead. So why are they not a lead-free thing? I don't know. I mean, the, they don't make any contact with the sap, technically, yeah. 
but then when you're pouring it out, when yeah, you're pouring it out, it hits it. Where, where, the, where the lead thing is, it, it sap is acidic, it is some acidic, it's when it sets in it first so in the time. Okay. You, you, wouldn't have, you wouldn't have two parts to a million probably with a two second contact. Okay. Yeah. I didn't realize that, I never used them, I've sold a few of them to customers. Hardly <laughs> hardly them, so. I didn't realize them, I bought them, except in the fact that they yeah, But Those are nice, yeah, I, I don't think ours do, I've never seen them. So. But uh, I've never seen that on there. But those are nice because then the season you throw it back away. But the disadvantage to them is we get a couple inches of sap in them and it starts gets windy and it freezes and they're sitting there beating around and it's gonna knock all of them. So, so what other questions do you all have? Anything you want to discuss? Anything I can help you with? I mean, it doesn't have to be. We can talk about anything you want to. I'm just here to help people. So, can yes, sir. Filtering options for Sure. What's the, like in my case, what's the next step up from the, the Oron column filter? Mm. I think Jimmy's actually, yeah. he's, he's, his presentation is next is on filtering. Oh, okay, so. we'll, leave, we'll leave that to him then. Um, I would say filter press is the best thing. Yeah. So, yeah, that's another thing. If I had to filter syrup without a filter press, I probably wouldn't. I probably wouldn't make syrup either. So. Can I ask a super new question? Yes. We have zero cats, huh? and I grew from the West. It's all come up the course, so I don't know anything about this. <coughs> um, he mentioned in the first talk that you could do red maples. Can you do tap all maples? You can talk, tap box elder, which are part of the maple family. Box elders, too. Mm -hmm. yeah, the silver maples. I did have somebody, a customer of mine, who made some syrup and he just kept the sap from silver maples. He just boiled the silver maple sap last year. I'll check this time. What are, time are you supposed to? 145, Jimmy, is that right? It's 133. Yeah, he used to have time. Okay. So he made some silver maple and it was totally different. I don't want to say it was bad. It was a good, really light, medium syrup. The quality was good. I don't think the sap had any had ferment or anything like that. It just. I think if you mixed it with regular, it would be fine, but it, I didn't think it was very good. Okay. And I've had syrup from Madison, uh, <coughs> Canada, from, I just can't imagine how many different places. And then he mentioned different sugar concentrations. Could you go over that again, what the difference in um, processing of it would be? As far as, it, what do you mean exactly? Well, he said that there was a lot more, in the sugar maple, there was a lot more syrup. And somehow it flowed different and it harvested it different. Yeah, I don't know if you're, I think you probably get a little bit more sap out of sugar maples. Proctor just did a big research on sugar and red. Dr. Abby did that. And she actually, uh, I don't know, I don't usually disagree with her. I don't know that, I, I don't see it in my woods, but our reds quit running sooner than the sugars do and they don't run as well. But, uh, uh, but she found out that the sugar was lower, but they produce more saps, so and in the long run, you got as much or more syrup from them. Okay. So I guess every locale is different. But, so normally sugar maples are probably gonna have, the sugars are black maples, which are basically just about like a sugar maple, or a real hard maple. People will refer to, they'll refer to a sugar maple as a hard maple, or red maple as a soft maple, so that'll help you out. You hear people refer to hard or soft maples, so that's what they're referring to basically and so but uh, yeah usually sugar maples are the best they're probably going to have a little higher sugar content but uh, i don't know are most of you all 60 70 80 to one in kentucky is that the ratio we're seeing for most people yep yeah we, we were 77 a couple years ago when we were 62 and i thought well this is 1.4 was our average for the season i thought this is incredible i had a customer in virginia i just redid it i've been over working and redoing his woods and it's all in wet, dry, vacuum, high vacuum system. But he uh, he averages 2.2 to 2.4, and he makes a half gallon syrup every year. <laughs> and he's running 26 inches of vacuum nonstop. How big do the trees need to be in diameter? Uh, we don't usually tap below a nine inch tree. Okay. So that's up to normally. I think that's kind of kind of where the it is the industry standard right now is about nine inches. So as far as the smallest. But that it's your woods, you know, you can tap I mean so I've seen people put four taps in an eighteen inch tree and I just want to reach. But we'll we'll go, I mean I've got a pretty big reach because I don't have it on flat here, so I can reach around the tree pretty good. My so that I don't know, that's probably a 22, 24 inch tree. If I can reach around and I don't touch, then we'll go two taps. But if I reach around and I'm touching I'm a bit of one tap. So but we're running vacuum on everything, so we obviously the research shows you don't get really 
you don't get a lot more sap for the extra one in your query on the tree. Yes, sir? It's a little bit off topic, but we're going to tap the uh, walnuts we have, too. Mm -hmm. uh, can you use the same RO for both if you rinse? Uh, no, that's really a, uh, nobody knows. I mean, yes, you can. Uh, Future Generations has been doing some with that, but they were using a centrifuge and spinning all the pectin out of it before they were running through the RO. So I... Yeah, you could use the same RO, but I, if it's going to plug up the membranes or whatever, I don't know. That's, there's just not enough people out there doing it. I got some customers over in Virginia that one guy there has 1,600 taps and he made 40 gallon of almond syrup two years ago and they thought it was like the Beverly Hillbillies. They thought they'd struck the master, they made 10. 1,600 taps. Anyway, so, I mean, it's, and, and he kept his pumps around. I mean, I talked to him. He kept the pumps running. So we, the one thing we want with the first year he tapped, and most of those were virgin trees, a lot of them. And this last year, they got 10 gallon. So yeah, I, so what are they going to do this year? Nobody knows. We don't know if it's going to be a last long year. Well, yeah, but they were in a little better climate. They're, they're in a much better, they're, they're, yeah, they're where their glory's at. So uh, it's in a much, much, much colder than it is here. But still, even because those guys over there had a pretty easy year. But so we don't know if it's going to be uh, if it's going to be it's going to be time to shut up. So. What do you know about sick, tapping sycamores? It's a, walnut, walnut also requires pretty pretty good vacuum to get the sap out of the trees. They just won't, won't hardly run at all without vacuum. And sycamore is even worse, I think. Mean, Future generations have done just a little bit with that, but it's really, it tastes like butterscotch. That's what I've heard. It's pretty good. It's a couple years ago, I've tasted it, but it's just really hard to get the sap out of the trees. It's really? Yeah. That's what my brain is. Mm -hmm. right, so got about seven more minutes. Right, go ahead. Uh, I also built a homemade RO system like Jet, and um, I issued a bit with cleaning it. I called some different suppliers, and I how can I clean it? They couldn't recommend anything. I built myself. So, what do you recommend as far as if I have something like that? How can I, besides running, you know, permanent through it? Are you running or Jeff? Are you running sodium hydroxide? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, sodium hydroxide, yeah. So, also the acid. Yeah, citric acid is citric, citric acid, which is basically yeah. like a dried lemon juice. And then sodium hydroxide, it's it's the same, like I said, it's a it's a food grade stuff that they wash fruits and vegetables with. So. Yeah, so my membranes and uh, sodium bisulfide. Yeah, you want to. Sodium bisulfide. Yeah. What you want to use, uh, usually on a, on a soap wash, you'll go to about 11 pH. And on an acid wash, you'll get about two. <coughs> so you just have to figure out how much. So on smaller machines, I, just, I know how much it, I can tell you how much to use to get to it. Basically, real close to that pH. But on something really small like that, you just have to test. John, it. I've got that in my write up what I what I actually do there. Okay. okay. Yeah. So he even said he had this with him, and I was like, well, yeah, I get it. Bring it in because I mean, it's a lot of you know, a lot of hobby people. They'll build their own machines. That's why, I, you know, when he told me he had it out his vehicle, so bring it in, let people see it, and talk about it. Because so, that's what we're here to, I can get up here and throw scientific stuff at y'all there so they're going to move to a presentation, but I'd rather answer your questions and help you. So. Back to the butterscotch. <laughs> <laughs> you said sycamores taste yeah. like butterscotch. Yeah. But good luck getting any sap out of it. Okay. Luke found that out, right? Do you do the same thing with them? I mean, yeah, the have they, has he tried any on high vacuum? He hasn't, has he? I don't think he's tried any on high vacuum. Yeah, they just don't want to get sap. It's yeah. got a lot of pectin in it too. Doesn't matter. I'm not interested in making not anything. Not like long, but it just takes a lot to get. It's hard to get them to run like very well. Yeah. Um, it tastes kind of kind of like molasses. We've been doing like taste tests in one high school. Great school, high school kids. It's funny for each of them. Like most kids don't really love the six months because it kind of tastes like a bit of molasses. But when you get into areas where they, they a lot of forage and a lot of, they say it tastes like horse feet and sheep feet, and I think it's like a lot of horse feet and it's horse feet. And I don't know if they didn't say it tastes like I could show it. So I don't know how the, they don't have that taste. One thing that will help you, I don't know how the laws are in Kentucky as far as property taxes, but in West Virginia, if you're producing $1,000 or more in agricultural products on your property, it's about a 60% tax reduction. So that'd be something maybe to help you all that didn't know that. I, I, Virginia's the same, I think the same, but I don't know what the law is in Kentucky. I know somebody here that probably does know. Do you know, John? Mm -hmm. No. 10.6 acres or more considered agriculture. 
whether you produce or not? Okay, so in West Virginia you actually have to produce. You don't have to quote unquote sell, but you have to quote, produce. So that's kind of broad. I mean, people, you know, produce. I mean, some you know produce and just give it away, but they're still actually producing. You know, but sell a thousand dollars. No, you have to door neighbor. You have to produce. You can give it all away. You don't have to sell it. You don't have to have records. But you have to sign a. You have to sign a form every year. You know, like in West Virginia, between July the first and September the first, that you actually produce, and you have to tell them what the value of what you produced. And it doesn't have to be one product either. That can be yeah, it can make a You can do chicken and eggs, and mm -hmm. you know. So I guess you could produce and consume them all yourself. But you know, I don't think you can just grow a garden. You can't just grow a garden and say, "Well, I grew a thousand dollars vegetables." But technically, supposed to be producing something for you. Yeah. And you all, like I said, I'm. So. Like I know in Nichols County, which is about I don't know, an hour and a half from here, when you buy anything over 10.6 acres, they automatically put you in the agricultural category. Well, Kentucky's really friendly now. But I've got 76 acres that actually the borders, borders Interstate 64. Uh, I'm only a half mile from 64 where I'm at. And I've got 76 acres and property taxes on it. I, you don't throw anything at me, but it's, and I just bought it and paid quite a bit for it. The property taxes are less than $300 a year, and it's two different tracks. One's 46 and one's 30 because of, because of what I'm producing. I mean, I produce thousands and thousands of dollars a serum off of it. So, but, it, but it's huge. I mean, it would be it would be a thousand dollars a year if I wasn't doing that. So, that, that is big. I think my time's up. Any other questions or anything? I do have. There's a bunch of CDL catalogs back here on the table. There's some CDL Way magazines. Those are free. There's some hats back here that you're welcome to take for free. And I actually have some Kentucky pint jugs. I started on some Kentucky jugs. I actually have one of those back there. So you can look at those if you want. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, before we get to our next presentation uh, from Jimmy from Smoky Lake, uh, Spencer Gwynn is going to come up here real quick. Uh, I kind of introduced him a second ago, but he's going to tell you a little bit more about KCAR. Yeah, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, I won't be with just a minute, but I just wanted to, to say hello and, and say that uh, I've enjoyed, I've, I've been on, involved in this on the back side of things. Uh, just working on the group, helping get bylaws and all the fun stuff that comes with organizations uh, together. And, and really all I've done is just answer a couple questions and they take everybody on this organization is taking care of the rest. It's been an awesome process to sit and watch back and just see it go from coming back alive to where it is with you all here today. So I'm glad you all are here. I'm glad you all are interested in Maple. Um, what I do, I work for the Kentucky Center for Ag and Rural Development. Um, we do business plans and financial projections for farms. So a lot of the stuff that we do is you give us a call if you want to talk about your maple business, if you want to talk about your whole farm uh, or your whole organization, whatever it is that you're doing or producing. Uh, we kind of help you think through maybe expansion, maybe it's looking at, uh, we also have a grant uh, facilitator on staff. Her job is to figure out what grants are available and how people can apply to them and what rules you have to meet and follow to be able to apply to them. So some of the stuff that you all are going to be looking at today, even if you're just taking SAP, so, so there's, there's one grant that I'll mention, and you've got to be a producer for at least two years to be able to apply for it. It's a federal grant. Uh, you need to have some pretty uh, significant goals of growth in a three-year period of time to apply to make it make sense because it's about an 80-page application. Okay. Um, but if you, get, if you get the grant, it can help you really grow, and it helps pay for marketing and processing, okay? Um, so in the USDA's eyes, the raw product that you're adding value to is the sap that you're running through this machine and running through an evaporator to turn it into syrup. That's the raw product, okay? So if you're doing sap to syrup, then that's value added. If you're doing what some of the presentation is here in a couple hours about taking that syrup and adding even more value to it, that's just even more value added products, okay? So the sap is the, is the base material that you're adding value to. But what we do is look at those grants that are available, help you think through a business plan. Uh, like the gentleman said earlier, uh, talk to your banker about uh, loans. Well, we'll help you think through some of the things. Well, is this something that makes sense for me and my goals and my family? 
or is it something that maybe it, it's okay if I bootstrap this thing and don't take out a loan and it takes me five years instead of two? Okay, we can help you think through some of those things. Um, we, let's see, what am I leaving out? The other thing that I want to mention is that we have, I've helped put together some enterprise budgets. So I've heard, just sitting through here today, a lot of people talk about the size of the operation that they have. Whether it's five taps, 100 taps, 1,000 taps, um, with the help of UK and the Kentucky Maple Syrup Association, we've put together some enterprise budgets that help think through some of those costs. If I spend this much money to be able to make sap into syrup, what's my potential return? And what's, what's the price that I have to get from that to be able to make a return? So that's some of the things that we've already got. They're kind of cookie cuttered right now. All right, we've kind of baselined it from like, I think we did a mini, a small, medium, and a large producer. And that covers basically the full gamut from five taps to a thousand taps, okay? And I would encourage you with those numbers that we've got to truth it with what you've seen. So I put in information from one of the maple syrup equipment providers that was probably five years old now. Well, what's happened in the last five years? Prices have gotten up a lot for this equipment, right? So if you all have operations you're thinking about doing before you go spend money to do those, just get the quotes together from these equipment providers that are here uh, or others that you might have relationships with. Figure out what it's going to cost for a startup and then kind of use those numbers to see what it looks like if I put this in place in my operation. That's kind of what those are there for, is just kind of primers to see everything. Um, I'm going to head out here in a little bit, but um, again, KCARD, uh, Kentucky Center for Ag and Rural Development, is who I work for. Uh, if you go to our website, it's KCARD, K C A R D dot info, I N F O. Um, we've got ways that you can get in contact with each one of us. There's about 12 of us that cover the state of Kentucky. Uh, we only work in Kentucky. We only work with ag. Um, so if you're producing something on a farm or using farm products to add value to those, those are the kind of organizations that we work with. Uh, but if you all have any questions, you know, feel free to reach out to me. If you want to catch me before I leave, I'll be around for a few more minutes, 15 minutes or so. But I encourage you to listen and then follow up with us afterwards because we're always available by phone or email. Spencer, I want to mention to them about, uh, there's a couple different grants. Uh, okay. You want to mention about the soil conservation? Soil conservation. Right. Well, I mean, in, in Nicholas County, it varies. Yeah. So for each, each county, it varies. In Nicholas County, soil conservation distributes tape, tape but yeah. there's tape funding as well. And, and also, Kentucky State, State has the... Uh, Small, small, small scale farm small grants. Small yeah, so that's two, two things that are much easier um, starting point than the value added producer grant that I talked about briefly. So uh, CAPE is County Ag Improvement Program. Um, it actually, it, it's originated from tobacco settlement dollars. So whenever uh, they took away the tobacco quota in Kentucky and made it an open market, uh, that was also the time when the cigarette companies said, hey, we're gonna pay each state for the amount, of, basically they pay the state of Kentucky for how many people smoke, okay? That's where the, that money comes from. Um, and it's called the Master Settlement Agreement. So that Master Settlement Agreement, the state of Kentucky said, we're gonna take some of that money in the general fund, and it's gonna go, it's, it's just gonna go into our budget. We're gonna take half that money that comes in each year and set it aside for agriculture. So one of those programs started from that is CAPE. Um, and they have a subset in there that's a value added portion. So the maple syrup would be a value added product, okay? Um, you can apply for that. Each county is different. Like I live in Bull County. Uh, ever since I've been in Bull County, it's been, you spend four, you get two back if you're approved. Uh, they just changed it this year to you spend six, you get three back, okay? But every, every county is different on how they do that. Some do it every year, some do it every other year. Um, but it depends on how much tobacco was grown in your county as to how much money each county gets. So like the gentleman there said, your, start with your extension agent, probably would be the best starting point. Even if the extension office doesn't manage it, they'll know who does in the county, and then you can go from there. And another thing, if you're wanting to do a big investment in, in your area, so let's say you're wanting to, I guess, commercialize your cotton farm and into a, you know, like an on-farm market, um, the K, for the KAOP, K, or Kentucky office, KOAP, is offering grants or loans right now, 1% loans. So if you have a bank that you like to use, I'm just gonna throw it, let's say Farmer's Bank, uh, you can get with somebody from the KO, 
AP office and they can get with your bank and they'll cover half of that loan will be on one percent interest and the other half the loans whatever your bank's offer. So you can get a really cheap loan rate right now. Yeah, and so with that program, that's a, one that John mentioned that I also want to say something about is the Kentucky State University Small Scale Farm Grant. Um, that one is, you can apply for up to $5,000 uh, in the form of grant. There is no match for that one. So if you get approved, if you ask for $5,000 and you get approved, you get a check for $5,000 to go spend for what you applied for. All right, most of these you have to pay the money up front and then get reimbursed. This one actually gives you a check and says, hey, here, go buy whatever you ask to buy. You can get it twice, right? And you can get it twice. There's a lifetime cap of $10,000. What's it called? Uh, Kentucky State University Small Scale Farm Grant. It's now, a, all, all of these, when you say producers, like you actually have, you need to have income, so it can't be like a hobbyist that's just making it to get out to the families. Yeah, so, so with Kate, the application is going to ask for how much money you're making on the farm, um, and you, you need to provide that, okay? Each county sets it up differently. <coughs> Each county has kind of their own control there. Uh, they might have different questions, but they all want to get back to, are you a producer that's making money, or are you, you not? Okay. With KSU, you're going to have to self-certify that you have made at least $1,000 um, off the farm doing this type of work before you can apply. So if you're pre-revenue, if you have not made any money on the farm yet, then this doesn't apply to you. But if this is something where in a couple years, yep, I've hit $1,000, then this is a good program for you to look at. But a lot of people that I know have applied for KSU funds to build sugar shacks. It's a very easy transition. It's a very good use of the funds. Um, and um, uh, and uh, it has, uh, it's, it's been recently refunded. So it's a two-year cycle that this KSU grant works on. Um, but if you get into the end of the second year, they may be out of money, and they'll say, well, hey, we're out of money for right now, but until we get reallocated funds again, just hold tight. So I just say that to say, I don't remember where we're at, but if, if it's at the end of a funding cycle, you might have to wait until January or February to apply. You may be out of money this time of year, okay? Yes, ma'am. Now, is that on the one you talked about with the ADH application? No, so the AD page application, and I'm sorry, I'm throwing a whole lot at you all, and I apologize, okay? Uh, but, uh, but the AD page application one is once a year, an application period once a year. Uh, usually it comes out in about February or March, and it's usually the last about four years, it's due in May. What's that called? That's called the Value Added Producer Grant. And what are you talking about? That's sugar shack. That's $5,000. So, so the, the 80 page application that you need to, like you need to be figuring on spending at least $50,000 a year to make that value added producer grant worthwhile, okay? So the one that's $5,000 is Kentucky State University. And that's, you spend the 50,000 in that grant, you get that 50,000 back on? About two thirds of it. But you got, so with that one, and, and that one, so I, I don't like to lead with that one, I apologize that I did. Uh, it, it's a very big project, okay? Uh, you, like we work with, our organization works with about 10 producers a year that are interested in applying for that one. Um, there might be 10 producers in the state of Kentucky apply, there might be three or four that are awarded, okay? It is a very competitive national grant. All right, so that, that one is one that, you need to talk to us or someone like us to apply to that. And talk to him early, real early. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's a great program, okay? But there's a lot of stuff you got to do. I's dotted, T's crossed to make that one work. $300,000. No, that, that one, no, that, that one, you need to be producing for at least two years before you even apply. The $5,000 one $5,000 one with Kentucky State University. Uh, you need to have at least $1,000 in farm gate revenue to ask for $5,000. So that's a revolving application. So Kentucky State University, that's the $5,000 grant. Um, that one, you have a, uh, let's see, it's every other month application deadline. 
So usually it starts in February, so then you'll apply again in April, you can apply again in June, December and so on and so forth. Yeah. December 1st is the next one. December 1st is the next one. It's a really good one. It's a two-page application. It's really easy. You turn it in. There's a lady named Joni Nelson at Kentucky State University. You send it in to her, to her email address, by midnight on the day it's due. And she gets it, replies back to you, and you wait about two to three weeks for them to score applications, and then you find out if you've been awarded or not. That was really quick, and it was really easy. Yes, sir? Do you know of an affiliate that's a similar thing to you in the state of Indiana? Yes. Uh, so uh, we actually worked with them, and they just started a PIF, P-I-F-F. Uh, I'm drawing a blank on the lady's name. I just talked to her the other day. It's a really good program, though. Can I give you my email and uh, see if I can get some information from you on that? Uh, yeah, that'd be fine. Yeah, it's no problem. Yes, ma'am. What's your name? Sorry, Spencer Gwynn is my name. What's your last name? G-U-I-N-N. -N. <laughs> and what's your grand person's name? Uh, it would be Kara, C-A-R-A, Stewart, S-T-E-W-A-R-T. Uh, that's with KCAR, that's with my organization. Okay, um, so my name is Jimmy Brucktrop. I'm from um, Smoky Lake Maple Products, uh, and I am also a hobby maple syrup producer like a lot of you. Um, I have been doing syrups for about 15 years currently, and I've been with Smoky Lake for about five that will be coming up on that shortly. And so for a lot of you, um, when we think of, we're, we're here and we're talking about filtering. And who here thinks that filtering is equivalent to frustration when they commit the syrup? Right? Yeah. So this is the part where, oh, the tapping is great, I got my sap, I processed it, I boiled it, I stayed up all night, and then you, you notice that you have this stuff in the bottom. Right? And it's like, oh, what do I do? Now what? Right? And you're, you're concerned that your syrup doesn't look like the syrup you've seen on the retail shelf that's displayed in glass. And so, you, so filtering is a tough one. And I want to say you're not alone. Um, filtering is a big challenge for all producers. You can be as big as Nate is and be a commercial producer and filtering can be a giant challenge. Or you can be doing four taps next year and you're brand new to this and you're still gonna struggle with filter. So the, the idea behind it today is I wanna to try to leave us today with confidence on what we're, our abilities are and have some good expectations so we can get the most out of our maple equipment. So, next slide. I like to put the quote up here from Teddy Roosevelt. He's one of my favorites. So just believe you can and you're halfway there. Doesn't always work with me. Stir up in the cone filter, but know that you can get it there. It's possible to get the perfect clean syrup. So what are we filtering? And that's got a little short animation. Um, we're talking about something called sugar sand. Sugar sand is a byproduct, um, you know, of minerals coming out of solution when we boil and we heat up the syrup to a specific temperature. <clears throat> so as that sap concentrates, those minerals start to kind of get pushed together, and then eventually they get to a point where they start to fall out and become visible. And that, that's typically happening based on a process, based on temperature, and, and that boiling process that's concentrating the sugars. All right. So let's talk about how this normally starts. We're gonna go on a little bit of an adventure on uh, how this process normally starts for most of us. And I'll say this, I had humble beginnings like a lot of you where I started off with just a couple taps. And I started on a small, one of my early points uh, doing this was on a two by two flat pan, a basic unit. <laughs> And I had been going for many hours, and I knew that the batch I had done the year prior on the pot, it didn't turn out so good, but I wasn't giving up on this process. Um, and so 
with the, you know, the adventure that I'm taking you guys on today starts really small. And going back to that story, I'm, I'm boiling on this small flat pan, making a batch of about 60 to 80 gallons down into two. And so I thought, well, last year didn't turn out so good, so let me get a, let me get a cone filter because I heard about these things called cone filters. Now, some of you are shaking your head maybe the other way, but yes, this is the cone. This is where we start. And the reason why do we start? Well, I didn't have to buy anything but it, right? You don't have to spend a lot of money on the big fancy devices yet, and you're only making a gallon or two, so you're not ready to, to jump in. So we may start on the cone because they're easy to work with, they're economical, they're inexpensive. You can find them at most maple, all maple supply stores or even a big box store or hardware store might even have something like this. So what is it? What are we dealing with here? Um, and there's, so the first time I used this, I thought, okay, I didn't have this material, but I just had this Orlon material and I thought, Okay, my filter, my syrup is done, it's hot, and I'm gonna just pour it in here, into the cone, and see how it goes. Does anyone know how that story's gonna end if you just take syrup raw and just start dumping it in here? Yeah. It's gonna clog. It's gonna clog, it's gonna get filled up, and if you're like me, your dad will be standing there like this, looking at you, now what? And there's a pot underneath here with syrup dripping out because you didn't have a stand, you didn't have anything. You just thought, you thought it would have like went right through. And it didn't. And, and so that's why a lot of us might equate these and we start to lose confidence that this system can work. Well, a small improvement that we can make uh, with a comb filter is we can use another material. It's a paper-based material called a pre filter. <coughs> Now the pre-filter will stack, we usually stack these several, several deep ahead of the cone filter. And what this does is it's going to grab the larger particles of sugar sand that are being developed from that boiling and heating process. And it's going to get the main ones through and then allow it to work its way down before it gets to the thick filter which is going to do all the fines, all the really small particles. So a lot of folks may take this and put it on a pot, on a milk can, or on a stand of some sort. And what you can do as this fills up is you could take your several layers that are stacked inside here and you can remove them out and then dump them into the next uh, pre-filter and then dump into the next pre-filter. And it'll help kind of work its way down and through a little bit better. All right? Now, you're, you're thinking to yourself, is he going to talk about cone filters this whole time? <coughs> right? Because for a lot of us, we're going to outgrow this right away, if not instantly. Right? <laughs> so yes, if you're doing four taps, ten taps, just a couple gallons of syrup, that's what our reasonable expectations are for a cone filter. Some other tips we can come up with to get the most out of this is to pre-wet these filters, <coughs> lay them over in the steam. So there's a little bit of moisture already set with them that they're going to help and kind of push and get the syrup through. Uh, another, another tip with that, um, with dealing with filters, we do have to cons uh, concern ourselves with if we're using them, you can reuse these as well. But we have to clean them. And for us to clean these, it's very specific that we're only cleaning uh, this, these materials with just hot water. That's it. If we start cleaning these with bleach, what's going to happen? Or rock syrup. Yeah, you're going to have some nasty tasting syrup. Mike, was the earlier, Mike uh, was earlier was talking about salt, that's a residue that's left from using bleach in tubing systems. Can you imagine that flavor in your syrup? No, and I don't want to either. So, so keep in mind, if we're cleaning these, use just hot water. And, and also, don't wring out the filters. It breaks down that material and what, it, what this material is tightly woven so that it'll catch the sugar sand. If that breaks down, the sugar sand is going to get past the filter. So generally, I would use a cone filter when I was back at that point or stage, maybe two to three seasons, maybe three to five uses a year, and I discard it. The pre-filter material I might use three to five times, and then I would rinse it clean, but they kept getting kind of dirtier 
and there was like a brown stain on them, and then after a while you're just like, okay, let's toss it and get a new one. So that's all right. Um, so let's have a, with cone filters, a good expectation is maybe a gallon or two that we're going to get through this system. All right? But you're not doing 40 taps anymore because you've got your brother or your cousin talking to you and saying, hey, I found some more maple trees. They're just across the ridge over there. We can go get another 30. And before you know it, you're growing again. And then you're at the point where, okay, look, we're doing 60, 70 taps. Is the cone going to work for the 60 tap guy? This guy's shaking his head. He's like, absolutely not. No way. Get rid of that thing. Okay. It's like kryptonite. So maybe we want to move into the next stage, which would be a flat filter system. Slide. One more. Yep. And so basically, all right. So I'm at the point where I'm not making a couple gallons of syrup, but maybe I'm making 15. And my hobby's growing a little bit. I might want to move into a flat filter system. All right, and flat filters are going to do essentially the same thing as the comb, except for what might you notice that's different about a flat filter set? It's flat. It's flat. That's one good observation. Yes. It's square. It's square. Okay. It's not edible. But yes, surface area. Surface area. Yep. So exactly. That's what I was looking for. You're going to have maybe two to three times the surface area in a flat filter system than you might in a comb. So that there could be some gains to be had there. We also have another advantage with the flat filter system with how we might remove these layers through. Um, when used, a lot of times a flat filter system might be used in a, in a bottler. This bottle, it's, it's also called a filter finisher bottler unit. And so that means that this unit has three functions potentially. Generally, people are using it for two of the three functions, maybe not all three at the same time. So what that, what that is, uh, is you'll see on the top of this unit something called a filter tray. So this is a spot that will sit inside here and it'll actually hold, hold the, the, the paper in place. So this is a little better than your dad. Um, to hold the, that flat filter in that spot. And what we'll do is the same concept we did with gravity filtering with the cold filter. We're going to have the one thick filter on the bottom, and then we're going to lay in that pre filter over the top. All right, so I'm in my, now I'm in, now I'm, now continue on with the story here. Jimmy's in his third or fourth year at this point moving into a flat filter system. I got my batch of syrup hot. I got it perfected with density where it needs to be. And I'm going to take a gallon jug and I'm going to start to pour that syrup in over the top of this. Now, that syrup is going to start to work its way down and through. And I am just, I start to notice that, hey, this thing can handle some syrup, right? It's not one gallon. I was able to pour that gallon jug three or four times, and I got four gallons through on, on a fresh set of papers. I was tickled pink, right? I just quadrupled my filtering capacity with one set of filters. So that's exciting. When I got towards the end, though, there was still a little residual syrup still in that paper system. What did I do? Was still using gravity. If I have my four layers of this pre-filter material stacked on top, you can do what we call a shimmy method, all right? And no, we're not going to call it the Jimmy shimmy, okay? <laughs> but anyway, what you'll do in that scenario is that syrup filled up, you can slowly kind of grab that paper and slide it off to the side. And what you're going to do is you're going to start to slowly get the syrup to kind of move off this pre-filter and move on to the next pre-filter layer. And you can do that a couple times. <laughs> then you'll take this and put it in the sink, rinse it with hot water. But that will give that, that uh, syrup with all that sugar sand in more ability to kind of soak in and kind of work its way down through these layers. And I like to do one method one way, just because I'm real picky and go one way this way, and then the next time I go the other direction with the second layer. Because then it's kind of hitting a different spot on that filter each time. So I was totally excited. Let's say my confidence was completely restored in what filtering was with this 
system when I went to flat filters. Great. Now, it's the second session or the second bottling of the year. Same flat filter system. Ah, these were good. I put them, I threw them away. They're great. Now, they're clean. I had them stored in a clean, dry area. There's no weird smells on it. Well, I'll just, I'll just throw it back in, right? Is this going to work? Uh, sure. Does anybody see a problem starting if I'm a little careless in how I put these back in? What's that? Perfect, yes, absolutely. Which, he was saying, which direction did I have this where the syrup was? Because if I took the dirty side and I just put it down, because the dirty, all the dirty stuff's on top, and I just flipped it this way, let's push some hot syrup through. What's going to happen? Yep, I got sugar sand coming down into the bottle. So I just made that much worse for myself. And now a mysterious, some mysterious way, sugar sand got back into my syrup. And it was through no fault but my own because I was careless on how I took care of these filters. So when you do use your filters, fresh set for the first time, right on the top of the filters, right like a T for top, or put a little mark on it so you know that that side is always up. <coughs> and that's the way that you'll run them the whole time. So that gives us a little bit of an idea on how a flat filter system can work. Any other questions on flat filters or cone filters? Other specifics to that? How many of those uh, <clears throat> pre-filters are you putting in with the cones? Um, so usually four is my number. You can do five or six if you really need to, if you know it's some dirtier syrup or that it's got a lot of sand in it. So that's, that's up to you, but normally I'm in that four to five number for that. All right, I have a, the, let's say that we wanted to upgrade this bottling system though just a little bit, but we weren't ready for the very, the next step. There's kind of a half step for a flat filter system using a, a vacuum system. And in this scenario we're using, so this is, a, this is also a, an upgrade option for somebody interested in a flat filter that they can get a little bit more out of it. So this is some hot syrup using a vacuum system. Seeing a little bit of an advantage there. What advantage does this have? Let's say I was pouring gravity, uh, pouring syrup in here and just letting that kind of sit. What am I losing over time if it's just kind of hanging out in there? Syrup. What? Syrup. The syrup. Temperature. 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 Absolutely. Syrup. What, does anybody know what temperature they should probably be filtering their syrup at? <coughs> 180 to 190, I like to go right on the top end of that. 190 is about perfect. Sugar sand, that sugar sand process is happening just beyond that a little bit higher. Um, I'm not, the exact temperature, there's still a lot of people that debate that, but I've heard people say 193, but I just shoot for 190 because I know it's hot, I know it's effective, and I know it's a safe temperature to, to put this system through. This, this with vacuum gives us that efficiency, that speed element that we might need using a filter paper system or a gravity system. All right. But now you're growing again, and because like all of us, I just add a couple more. And now my, my brother and my cousin are talking about adding 75. Before you knew it, you're, you're doing 140 to 150 caps. And now we're not talking about 10, 15 gallons of production. We're talking about 30. We're talking about 40 gallons every season. How many filter sets is that going to be? A whole lot more. Right? They didn't want to join. Um, so when, I get, when we got to that point where we grew again, because I was, you know, the, the story on me getting to a filter press kind of went like this. <laughs> I, was, I was brand new at Smoky Lake, 
I had my bottler, had that for a, a season or two. And I go upstairs where all the supplies are and it's five, Friday at five o'clock and the family's gonna bottle tonight. So I gotta go get some new paper. I go up there grabbing the three by three sheets, you know, those real big ones in bulk. I can barely see over them, I have all this paper and I'm walking down the steps just as the shift is ending. Jim, our owner, looks over at me. He just kind of shakes his head. Then he looks over at a filter press being made on the floor. And then he looks back at me and I look and I'm like, got a filter. And so sure enough, I get home. My brother is there trying to pour a gallon of syrup through the flat filter. And he had already tried that and it was not working. I didn't come home to see him excited for the new paper. I came home to him on smokylakemaple.com shopping for a filter press. <laughs> I hear you guys have these filter presses. How come we just can't use one of those? And then I'm like, well, they're kind of expensive, right? And so are you in with me on this one or not? And, but long story short, the filter press was produced within two days and I took one home. And that changed things. Because it just, 30 gallons of production, this was not going to work anymore. So with a filter press, what are some advantages that we get that it's going to increase or make us, you know, what kind of expectations do we have? Now we're getting to some professional level grade syrup. We're getting supreme clarity, meaning we're getting at the very top end for the quality of what that syrup looks like and we're proud to put it in glass. Added capacity. A filter press like this unit here, on average, gets me about 10 gallons or more every time of, syrup, of cleaned up syrup. So we're talking at 10 to maybe 15 gallons of syrup at a time, I can get cleaned up, all right? And less waste. I didn't want to think about how much syrup I had put through paper over the years that I couldn't recover because I had to rinse and wash these out. So there was a noticeable gain in what I took home for syrup when I switched from the flat filters and the gravity into the press. But what is a filter press, all right? I had seen these things at Smoky Lake when I was new to them, when I, before I worked there. They seemed way abstract, right? Well, there's a little bit of a difference. I talked about these paper systems being gravity based. The filter press is a little different. The filter press is using pressure via a pump. And that can be, uh, in our industry, an air pump, a hand pump, an electric pump. You know, so those are the pumps that you might see. The, the one we have here is a hand pump version. And, but now, there's also something that those uh, that, of you that know, they might notice this. When you get a filter press, sometimes you get that paper that comes with it. But there's also something else that comes with it. What else do we use with a filter press outside of the paper? Diatomaceous earth. All right, so if I had a cup of diatomaceous earth in my hand and I have this filter paper for a filter press or pressure system, which one of those is going to actually have more filtering capacity? The paper or the diatomaceous earth? Now the question is, what is that? What is diatomaceous earth, right? So let me explain that one. Diatomaceous earth uh, is a material uh, that's used to aid in filtering maple syrup. There's actually an ionic exchange that's going on with sugar sand, and it's attaching uh, to the diatomaceous earth in that process. All right, so let's think about this. I got diatomaceous earth, or I got this filter paper. What's my real filter now? The diatomaceous earth, right? Does anybody know what it's like to run a filter press without diatomaceous earth? Anybody ever do it? You want to take that bad cone filter experience that you were brand new with and you want to multiply it to a bigger and bigger headache? That's how you do that. So this is no longer our filter. It says filter paper, it's not. Let's just call it DE holder. Let's call it earth holder paper. Maybe that's what we should market it as. So the idea behind the filter paper is to actually hold 
in this system, the diatomaceous earth in an open cavity. And I don't know if I can pull this one apart, but um, I was going to see if I could pull a plate so that I can show you guys a little bit with that if there's somebody that's got a, a wrench or adjustable on it. Anyway, we'll work on that. The guy up here looks like he needs a little bit. Give me a hand. So, I wasn't told you. I haven't had a chance to use it. <laughs> um, anyway, so, I'll see if I can get this gently. I don't, want to, I, don't want to, I don't want to mess that one up, but I'll have somebody else work on that in a second. But basically what we have here is an open cavity in this filter press. And that open cavity allows the syrup and the diatomaceous earth to inhabit inside that, that open cavity. And what passes through, there's a, there's a filter paper that's around each of those open cavities where that syrup comes in. And so the DE and the, and the <clears throat> sugar sand that's in our syrup is going to get locked up in, this, in these sections. And then the syrup's going to make its way through this paper and continue on. And that's when you're going to get that crystal clear, beautiful, awesome syrup that you see on a store shelf and get you to that kind of level of quality. And, and the press is an amazing tool for that. This is by far my personal top three for making syrup. Number one, Murphy Cup. Number two, Filter Press. Flu Pan, probably number three. Those are three really essential tools. I would not do it if I didn't have a filter press at that scale. It just uh, does not, wouldn't work that well from that standpoint. So where do you think my confidence level came back to Right? As I got the universe telling me that this, is, this system is done, I'm feeling really good about the filter press. A um, couple of things and areas where we can get in trouble with the filter press, where I've had, where, uh, where I maybe had an issue or a problem, and it's usually my own doing and not paying attention to something. So very often, you might put your syrup through this filter press. Let's say you put it through um, and you loaded it up into your bottler and you had somebody with an electric element these heat on what's called like a water tray or like a double boiler, very similar. But you turned your electric element up and you cranked it up a little too hot. And you come back after a half hour and it's boiling. Your jacket under there, it's not a steam bottler, it's a boiling bottler, it's boiling. Is there a problem with that when we talk about temperature? What does water boil at? 212. 212, 210, yeah. Depends on the height. Depends on the height, right? Am I gonna have a problem here? Yeah, I put it through the press. I had sugar sand show up a week later. I put it away in glass jars, I thought it was perfect. Week, two weeks later, I got that little film on the bottom. You wanna cry, right? Because you know how much effort you put into getting it clean. And you want to hand it off to somebody and show them this perfection and you're just like, oh, I can't, I can't. Right? So you might heat it back up, put it through the press again, and make sure that it doesn't get too hot when it's passed. So that's where that temp controlling temperature is still and will continue to be the biggest challenge for me as a producer, even with all the tools you know, at my, at my disposal for, for filtering and cleaning out that syrup. Another uh, problem that I see a lot of folks do, they don't, they're, they're very, very scared to put the diatomaceous earth in their syrup. This, you have to know how much filter aid or DE that you should use. You need to know your filter press. What does the filter press hold in those open <coughs> cavities? So an example like this press here, I know that it's gonna fit nine cups, nine to nine and a half cups, no problem, every time. So how much syrup does a guy get through nine, nine and a half cups? Well, that depends. In some scenarios, one of the worst experiences I had was very late season, years ago with the filter press. I only had nine gallons to finish up for the season, so I thought, no problem, I'm gonna get it through. Didn't happen. I used my nine cups and I pumped that stuff through and I got I had one gallon left. And I'm pumping it and I'm thinking, I could just do one more, right? 
and this thing is like locked. It's like not moving. Do I push for glory? Or do I break it down and take that, take those DE cakes out and start again? And that, and that was the answer, that was the right way. You, do, you push here and you do this, you're gonna damage something on the pump and you're gonna make a bigger problem and a new part you're gonna have to buy. So understand that the amount of syrup that you get through that amount of DE is gonna change. There are times when- We've had that has tried this, has complained that they've got a real problem with cloudiness from this. And everybody has that same problem, so what are they doing wrong? So most likely what they're doing is they're putting the syrup on direct heat is what I found is the most common. They're putting that syrup back on, not on this kind of water system, they're putting it back on direct on the stove and then pouring it into a bottle to keep it in that 180 to 190 range. 180 to 190 is what we need for bottling. And that's, that's the ideal temperature range that's pasteurized and that's hot enough that we hot pack syrup and like Mike had said, what happens when that syrup cools? It contracts and it pulls in a, like in a vacuum. And that's what you want on your seal on your, on your bottle. Also another tip, if you don't have a lot of air in your bottle, you're gonna have way less chance of any other issue with it either. And if you, knowing that the syrup's hot when it goes in and it's gonna contract, it's gonna pull down a little bit. But it's gonna pull that seal tight. When you open a jar of syrup, you should hear a little bit of air and a good seal. You should hear just a little shh. And that's something that's actually common in, in like a maple, in a, a tasting contest for maple syrup. They're that's one of the things that they actually check, that you had a clean seal on that syrup or on that jar that they opened. It's an unopened jar. But yeah, that, the biggest issue is normally that, or if you were like uh, I did, I was boiling the jacket and I had this thing cranking. That water in your jacket shouldn't be boiling. It should be, you know, at a reasonable temperature, just a little bit beyond the 190 or less. 195 is the maximum that I want to see in there, and usually 190 is more ideal to control that, to hold that temperature kind of constant. So that's for the water. Mm -hmm. In there. Yep. So you don't crank it all the way up to as high as it can go. When you when you use an electric system, make small adjustments here. Okay. Let's say your your syrup is like 180 and it's dropping. That's okay. But when you bring it up, so you, you, you want to bring it up. You want to bring it up slow though. You don't want to bring it up with a boil. Okay. So make a small adjustment. It might take a little bit. Okay. But it'll respond. Mm -hmm. it, these run where they'll kick on with a the thermostat as soon as they detect a certain temperature, depending on the setting. Now, it's not like a set temperature that it knows um, because it doesn't know the volume of water that you have in which can be different in each maker model. So, any other questions regarding filter press? Yeah? Does DE ever make it into the finished product? It does not, it cannot. The particle size of the DE to, to the paper does not, is not compatible. It's not gonna go past here. So when people say they see something past it, Normally, it's sugar sand from unstable syrup that was too hot, that was still falling out of solution after that. Does it have to be a certain temperature going into the filter? Filter press, I'm shooting for 190. Other uh, tips you can do, sometimes I will heat up my press plates, just put them in hot water, because if you have a cold filter press, it's gonna soak the heat on the first couple gallons through. So that, that's an important side of that as well. An another thing, that is a real important tip. And some of you, has anybody seen the YouTube video that I was on with my aunt there stirring? My poor aunt, I was making her stir, stir all day, right? Jimmy's really mean to his aunt. <laughs> what is the importance of that? Having one person on that pot, the temp serves the right temp, I've got my DE in, and she's stirring it. DE will settle down in the bottom of a jar, or settle down in the syrup very quickly, usually within a minute the DE will drop to the bottom because of the density difference. What doesn't drop in a minute? Sugar sand. It's different. Sugar sand is different. I, I'll get people that will come in sometimes and say, I got DE in my syrup. And I'll take the jar and I'll put it upside down and I'll shake it. Okay, if it's DE, we'll set a timer in a minute, all of it will fall back to the bottom. They take it and they shake it and it sits suspended for hours or days. That's sugar sand. That's the difference between those two. 
where okay. DE will, within a minute, it's going to drop to the bottom. So the, the only other, there's no other way for that to happen. The, and when you take this press apart to clean it, you don't take every plate off. It's not, do not take every plate off on this particular model. There's only one plate in this system that can be accidentally flipped on a Smoky Lake press, and that's the end plate. The, the very end plate. That might be the only scenario where you turn that one upside down and you had an issue with it. These are offset, unlike a lot of other filter presses, so they go a specific way. Um, if you don't have a Reuben around, there's a pneumatic pump for that yes. system there that is super nice. Yes. And it's also expandable, correct? Correct. This press here can expand from that uh, 10 gallon a session press to a 25 gallon a session press with an air pump that runs with compressed air. The advantages of compressed air are immense because there's a regulator on there that can regulate the flow of air to the pump and you could be pumping syrup through and then you get a phone call, all right, and you got to go somewhere. You got, if you've got kids that you, and you do this with, things happen. So you, you can just hit the minus button on the press, walk away for a few minutes, come back, and you can get back to where you were. If it's with an electric one, it's just still on. And when that electric one, it goes when it blows the paper, and then you've got a problem. Whereas on an air pump press, there's a, that regulator is giving you feedback when it's cycling with that air pump. Zero to 20. Zero to 20 is moving on the gauge. Zero to 20. Now as you build up, the, the cakes and the sand and the sugar sand starts to fill up here, it might go zero to 30, zero to 30. Okay, we're okay, we're okay. Zero to 50, uh-oh, we get a problem. And then zero to 50, zero to 60, zero to 80. Now what? Now boom, you break through this paper. And then you have a nasty mess. You take your papers off and you got a hole through here, yes, you put way too much pressure. Not possible with a hand pump. Guys at Bosworth telling me the maximum you can do with a hand pump is 40 PSI. With an air pump, that's different. Whatever the tank's going to. Yeah? How can it not change the flavor of it? So, um, that is a, a good question that I don't know if I have an exact answer to that. I can say that it will pull off flavors out if you do have that issue with your syrup. So if you have an off flavor, in my view, it the minerals are still there with the syrup. You know, um, it's a texture thing for the consumer. And if the consumer doesn't like it, what did they teach us earlier today? They gonna buy it? That don't, it's, not, it's not about what, you can explain sugar sand until you're blue in the face, right? Is it gonna matter to the guy in the store shelf when he wants to buy one if you wanna commercially sell? Nope, they're not gonna buy it. Just for concerns about DE, um, I'm in the food industry, food processing industry, and it's used in many, many things that we eat in the grocery store shelves that we're not even aware that they are currently using DE to process. So this is not like a foreign thing that's only used in maple syrup. It's used in food processing oils, juices, all kinds of things it's used. I don't know exactly what you're talking about. Um, yeah, but, yeah, it's a food grade based dietitian comment. Yeah. 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 What's the good ratio for the syrup to So syrup to DE. Don't That's think still of still that's a good question. Let's let's think about DE to press, and then will the syrup will kind of be what it is. Think of it that way. That's a better way to frame it. Because very often I'll say, well, it's always two cups to a gallon, or a cup to a gallon. And that's not the case. Let's say that I tried a lot less syrup in this system, and I only wanted to do one gallon in one cup, or two gallons in a cup. But I have, if I have syrup getting into this press, and the DE is not populated in this cake, it's gonna hit the paper. If it, if any time, syrup hits paper direct, you're going to have a problem with the pump that's going to lock up. Suspending the DE, recirculating it back to your vessel for some time to get the DE set. One of the ways I might do that, because um, there's times when I'll do nine cups or eight cups in three gallons. The first three gallons on my pot that I might have done for this, I might put eight cups in. 
But then the rest, I just put in a little bit. You know, I, I know that I have one and a half cups left in to, before I fill this up to its nine and a half. So my next three gallon pot, I put in a half cup, you know, or three quarters of a cup. Then I put another half cup in the next one. But I know that when I get to <coughs> nine and a half, no more adding DD. When you don't have the full thing, you don't have it filled though. Mm -hmm. But you have to have it filled before it starts doing its whole thing. So it, it's still cold, right? <coughs> the DE, that's what recirculating initially will do for you. That's so why the there's a little bit of recirculation time, time when we're starting up. I take it full time. Yep. yep. So let's say that I have that first three gallons of hot syrup at 190 Fahrenheit. I put eight cups in. I cycle that through here. It's going to put all the DE in place. Right back into yep, yep, exactly. It's coming right back into the same container it left. Okay. Then I know that, okay, my DE is set. I can take that syrup and I can connect it or hook it into this bottler and go from there with the hose on the outside from that, from that point. That, that's a good question, Bob. Is, there, is it possible to put too much? Yes, it is possible to put too much DE in. If we do that, we're going to have a similar scenario with the pump locking up on us. So it's really important to know your press, what it is, and know. We have like a thing in my, in, in my mom's kitchen when we're doing this, where we're like, one cup, okay, one cup down, two cups down, and you mark it. And you know where you are when you're bringing these batches and these pots through. And I get to nine and a half, we're done. No more. Yeah. So. <clears throat> This is kind of a technical question, but does that nitre have a charge? I know you said that the DE bonds with it. And Correct. It's on it. That means that that mineral that's in there, that nitre, has to have a charge yeah, already. Correct. So is there not some way to come up with a better, uh, a better system that so, uses that charge and sucks it out electronically? Uh, or, or electrically instead of filtering it this way? I don't know of anything specific electronically. I don't know how that application would come in. Um, I do know that sometimes with the vacuum system that I showed earlier where we're using that vacuum to pull through, some folks will use a little bit of DE in there as well because it'll actually help grab onto some of that sand. So there's a limitation to that because it has to work. That makes that, that vacuum pump work a little harder because it's got to work through that finer um, powder to pull the syrup through those, those that area, but um, I am not sure what I know that the filter press technology. I believe this has been around since the early 1900s um, or 1920s that this was applied with using for syrup. So it's pretty proven the technology behind that. Um, I think just slight innovations that we've seen with with filter press, but it's still one of the best de facto uses and ways for getting your syrup clean. Okay, so if you see a bottle of filter press with the suction, yep. and you see a bottle for the DE, and you're looking at the bottles, can you tell the difference? No. Can you taste the difference? I can't <coughs> physically taste the difference. My, um, that's, per, that's two professional tasters, too. Um, that's going to be hard to say. Like, I can't, I, can't they, quantify, can I can't quantify that. Can they tell? Have you ever seen it where someone says, oh, yeah, this has been put through a DE filter and this has been done Some, there are purists that will tell me that, you know, that, that are, are vehemently opposed to filter press. Um, but for commercial sellers, it, it's, it's hard for me. To, I, I don't have a quantifiable way because every tongue is so different. Yeah. And to have a professional tongue, yeah. So... We've been in our certain Use a filter press. 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 Use a this one has been using yeah. filter press, and then you probably say, yeah. now I can like taste something. If, if, this, if, this, if, the sand, if the sand settles, if the sand settles essentially over time, it would, have, it would be essentially the same surface mm -hmm. off the top. When the, when the sand fully settled and came to the bottom. She has a question. Yeah. So this might be a little bit of uh, a changing topic, but um, 
the sugar sand, the plexin, the comb filter, or the flat filter, mm -hmm. can that be saved and used like in place of cane sugar for something, or is it like a not usable product? Um, I it's pretty nasty normally, and it's not something I do much with. Okay. Maybe if that if I put it through that, and there's some syrup that just doesn't want to go through because I'm using cones. I know a lot of people that are uh, producers that will take that and they'll just make that into maple sugar. And that's one of the best maybe used products for dirtier um, that. But it looks like mud sometimes. It really does. And when you realize what you're pulling out and you look at that and like, I feel a lot better that I got more of the pure product that way. All right. Yep. Do you, can you or have, is it? Recommended or not recommended to use a paper filter before the press? You can. I, I do that. I have done that, and we typically do that off the evaporator to keep the bugs and flies. So I will use a pre comb pre filter a lot of times into a draw can. I, I draw into milk cans at my scale at 140 taps. We make two to three gallons of syrup a night, and that seems to work well. That might give me more legs on the press here. You don't have to, though. You can just let it go raw. And you can store it raw. Our, our owner, Jim, he'll store this uh, dirty, unfiltered syrup in 15 gallon kegs because they're easy to move. And um, he'll, when he needs to, he'll pull it out and, and filter it. Uh, there's not a lot of people that I know that do that. A lot of folks tend to filter right away, but if you have to reheat it again and you've got to go past 190, you're making more sugar sand anyway, so what's the point of filtering twice? Do some of the presses, do you actually put the DD in the press itself? Not, it not that I've seen, not typically. It's still just put in, and even large, the largest commercial producers, you see a big draw tank of syrup, and they're dumping big you know, one-gallon cups in there. Um, they'll run sometimes these presses in series, too. They have so much capacity. Well, this one gets starting to get full, and pressure's going, add in another one, and plug it on, and they can continue to have more... The more plates we have, the more capacity we're going to have in this system. Think of that filter, at that, that DE as your filter. More DE means more filtering. More filtering capacity. This may be really simple, by me, or whatever, but last year, we went from three trees last year, we're going to 200 this year. Mm -hmm. But we made our syrup last year. We boiled it out on the patio with a Hellfire thing. The turkey pot. Turkey mm -hmm. pot. Yeah. And finished it. I thought God had brought manna down from heaven again. It was so good. Mm -hmm. And up to that point, we had been getting organic maple syrup from Costco for years, and we're fat, dumb, and happy. Thought it was wonderful. Yeah. I tasted what we had that day, and <coughs> did not quit tasting it. And then I tasted what we had been tasting, and I wanted to spit it out of my mouth. So I don't know what happened with that that was supposed to be good syrup. I know it was mass-produced and everything. Part of it, my experience, is freshness. I feel like after a year or two in a jar, that syrup might lose a little bit of something. And I, I can't quantify it though. Yeah. Like I said, it was more than it's, that. Not a, it's not a quantifiable <laughs> it was, thing. It was so vastly different. Sure. I mean, it, this, was, this was amazing. So, was so the longer that the syrup sits in a container, like in a flat pan, the more that there's going to be caramelization of those sugars. And so it'll, it usually makes darker syrup, and then that usually means stronger flavor. Aren't you through a one? Or yeah, light? Oh, it's okay. very light. Okay. And that could still could be if it was or if there, with the amount if it's more sucrose than fructose that's still going to do that. When you get later in the season, you get more yeast and bacteria, and you get more fructose coming out of the tree. That's why it gets a little dark. That's one of the problems. Has everybody heard of people making birch syrup before? Yeah, yeah. birch syrup has a lot of fructose, so you can't take it all the way. A lot of it starts to burn at the end, at the back end of the cycle of getting it up to that 66 bricks which is what we're, we're doing. Which, um, that's another thing that may have an impact as well to a point on how the syrup will filter is how dense it is. Denser syrup may have a little bit, but I, I don't have any explicit evidence on that. For pre-wetting filters um, and other things, it's gonna be pretty close to the same. But it is important for a lot of reasons to get, uh, to use your, to get your syrup to the right density has anybody ever heard of a Murphy cup before? Yeah. So the Murphy cup is an is a innovation on density testing and, and a product that 
makes it very simple for you to figure out how to get the right concentration point in that syrup. When you draw syrup off, let's say I'm drawing off syrup on my evaporator. How do I know what temperature to draw on a given day? <coughs> you can maybe check the barometer, right? Um, who thinks syrup is made at 219? Raise your hand. Okay, good. I'm glad to see that. Everybody, we, I think it's good to let go of that and know that where is syrup made? Seven and a half degrees approximately over the boiling point that day. And so that was a problem that was very apparent for a long time that, okay, well, this is just a, a slight improvement on that process by we're taking a temperature of the sample live and now we're converting it onto the brick scale based on temperature. That's what this dial does. So this is giving you the target temperature. When you float the hydrometer in this cup, that's giving you the actual brick's density that it is, the, the bricks or the bomb. So when you, the idea behind this is to, sim to simplify this is if you match the <coughs> dial suggested to get to syrup to what it's actually floating at then you've nailed your density, your concentration point for your syrup. Because who, everyone, on the, on the hydrometer, there's two little marks, right? What are the temperatures on those marks? The blue line and the red line? Anybody know those? Cold and hot. 60 degrees Fahrenheit and 211 Fahrenheit. Well, when you pull it out of your evaporator and put it in the cup, what is it? It's not 211, it's not 60, but where is it? Maybe it's 190. The difference between, on the Murphy scale here, between 60 and 61 is 19 degrees. Can you put 19 tick marks between 60 and 61 on a hydrometer? It's not practical, it's impossible. <coughs> That's where this comes in to make that part of the process much simpler. All right. Any other questions on anything else? Oh. Um, do we have a little bit of time on the do it? Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. Does anybody have any last questions for Jimmy? Well, yeah. I know we didn't get to wood efficiency, but yeah. we're trying to say first. versus this. So here, here's what I would say. Um, this, is, this is still relying on the hydrometer as the better scientific instrument. Mm -hmm. The amount in the sample is superior. Mm -hmm. we're, we have close to a pint of syrup in this uh, a little less than that in this cup. When you use a refractometer, you're taking a drop. Where did that drop come from? How long was it exposed to air? Did it lose a little density in that time? Was that the densest part or not? So that's my issue with the limitation of refractometer. Also, all refractometer manufacturers will tell you that they are not effective over 180 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you're trying to do hot tests, you have to recalibrate and figure for that. Okay. And every single time, our owner Jim is a very, very picky, persnickety person. He wants it right, perfect every time. Seeking perfection. Every time he used a refractometer, it gave him up one point, down one point, up he was driving man. So he wanted it to be, it is what it is. It's exact with the analog devices. And the hydrometer is a superior scientific instrument from the refractometer. For sap, it's great. The refractometer is great for telling you bricks concentrate there, maybe for your, uh, your sample from your RO to see how high you're concentrating. So it has its uses. All right. This also does come in a Murphy float system where if you have a big batch of syrup in a pan and you're going to finish off 40 gallons, you can float the hydrometer and the Murphy float, a device like that, together. Huh. And that allows you, the advantage of that is now you've got a huge sample of syrup. And uh, as long as you have seven inches of depth, then the hydrometer will float and it will be effective that way. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Any other last questions, ones? Jimmy? Thank you very much. <laughs> so my name is Ben McKenney and I, uh, I own and operate Grandpa Joe's Sugar House for a North Falls of Maine. If you looked at a main map and you found the Lake of Sebago, Sebago Lake, we're on the poor side of it. So every time we flush our toilet, 
Uh, so maybe like it's another gallon of water. <laughs> that's what I tell people. So the rich side is like Wyndham, Raymond, Casco, that's where all the money is. We're over by like Hiram, Border, Arsonsfield, Cornish. We're on the other side of the river. Uh, so we're about 45 minutes from Portland, um, about an hour and a half from Conway, uh, New Hampshire, uh, hour and a half from Augusta. So that's where we live. This is my daughter Emma. She's a uh, junior at the Lake Region High School Culinary Arts Program. She's going to do the maple uh, maple apple French toast today that we've been working on. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I wanted to bring down to you guys that I brought down before was uh, making maple nuts. Um, to talk specifically about the value added. Um, just a second. Let's sit down. Let's sit down. So we want to get uh, the temperature up to 245 degrees on the uh, two, two cups of syrup. So two cups of maple syrup and a pot, you know, any kind of a pot you want to use. Uh, three pounds of nuts is the recipe. So you can use walnuts, you can use, uh, you know, mixed nuts, pecans, really whatever's on sale is the best, the best uh, price. Um, these packages right here, we retail at, our, at one of our fairs that we go to. It's the Freiburg Fair. It's um, probably the largest in the state of Maine. These retail for about $8. How much? $8. So there's 200 bag, uh, snack bags in one of those packages. So for $1,600, you can make a lot of nuts and a lot of money. So once, once you're starting at adding maple into product, um, that's when you're going to see a bigger return. Uh, about 2002, uh, myself and a bunch of other sugar makers formed the Southern Maine Maple uh, Sugar Makers Association. And uh, our focus was the Cumberland Fairgrounds in Cumberland, Maine. And um, one of the things that I did is I bought a cotton candy machine back in 2002. And um, as of last two weeks ago, uh, they made about 2,900 bags of cotton candy at $6 a piece. So that money goes directly to the association to do projects and all that kinds of stuff. So <clears throat> there's a lot of money in value-added maple. You just have to find out what your niche is. Um, what we do, uh, we have two events we go to a year. Uh, May Maple Sunday, which is always the fourth weekend in March. Um, oh, by the way, I don't pronounce my R's, so everything ends with an H. And we have interpreters in the back. <laughs> so there's no R's in me. Everything, everything is an H. Um, so this will be our 30th uh, May Maple Sunday weekend that we've done. Um, we started back in 1993, actually 1994, 93-94-ish. Um, We've made a lot of mistakes. Uh, we've got a lot of people to come to the sugar house. Um, sugar house. Um, the most we had was, I think, in 1999. And I think we had about 1,500 people. And the only reason I know that is because I bought one of those big uh, cases of uh, styrofoam cups for ice cream. And we went through all of those in another case full, half a case full. Because you give up samples, you do all the things you're supposed to do when when uh, people come to visit. So we added um, breakfast and lunch to our menu at the Sugar House. Uh, we have a separate building where we do that and people come up at about 30, 29 to 30 degrees and they'll order a big thing of pancakes or home fries or whatever and um, they'll eat in 29, 30 degree weather and there's no suits and their mud and all that stuff and we charge them bucks a plate. So that's one thing we've added to do. Um, what was the temperature? Uh, 229. Okay. So the other thing that happened was um, my daughter Emma was going to go to Costa Rica last year for her school field trip that we have tours and uh, she wanted a little spending money. So if anybody comes to my sugar house, they realize that I'm a procurer of a lot of stuff. We have a lot of junk hanging around. So one of the things that I bought was a uh, three head ice, uh, frat machine. And it happened to be that two of the three heads worked. So I said, well, if you want to raise some money to go to Costa Rica, make some fraps. So I gave her all the credit in the world. She set up her frap stand, and I gave her the syrup to use. We bought some ice cream. And this girl did $1,200 worth of frap sales in two days, maple Sunday. So 
You know, there's a lot of money in value-added maple, and it's just you, have, you just have to find where the niche is. Another thing that we sell at the fair is uh, maple pepper. This is the original maple pepper. We don't actually make this, we buy this in, but um, we get a really good wholesale price. Um, maple, regular, original maple, the rosemary, <coughs> the habanero, and the uh, garlic. So I'm kind of a garlic fan myself because I put it on my eggs in the morning. But you can do it for basting, you can do it for any kind of, you know, prepping for meat. But also, it's also good on other things as a single item. So that's another thing you can sell to, you, to your folks when you, they come to your shake house. Um, temperature. Okay. Yeah, so you want to talk about this real quick and I'll check the temperature. Okay. Um, so this is maple apple French toast. Um, I like to use uh, Texas toast, but we did not have it. But this is equally as good. Um, so first, you wanted to grease your pan. Well, I'll do a demonstration when he does his demonstration first. We use half and half vanilla abstract, salt, butter, five eggs, apples. More apples, the more sauce, uh, bourbon, cinnamon, and uh, brown sugar, and a bone syrup. And first, the, for the topping, you want to use brown sugar, cinnamon, bourbon, and maple syrup. For the like for the yolk part, you want to use uh, eggs, half and half, vanilla, salt. And I believe that is it. Well, in toast, but and I'll do more of a demonstration when he does his. We're kind of on a we're kind of on a thing where we need to make sure we don't burn the pot on the temperature. Um, is there any questions before we keep going on this this so far? Anything else? How much maple syrup is in the uh, pot <clears throat> So we buy a maple powder, which comes from Baskins, and we we usually do is when we cut it, we do it like a five to one cut. So five cups of uh, maple pie, white sugar to one cup of water. <coughs> so we'll, we'll mix it together and that way it's not straight maple sugar. Because if you have maple sugar on top of a cotton candy machine, it doesn't burn. So you'll, you're gonna wanna have something to, to expand that stuff. Um, and like I said, we, we do really well selling it at Private Fair and the association does really well as a fundraiser. So there is a little key about, about selling air though. You know, when you put the bag in, you, you put it in, but then you take the top of it. It's kind of an art because you don't want to scrunch the bag because it doesn't look as full. And then the day, the next day, it gets a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller. So hopefully you sell it off. You want to tell them what mash, how much you sold? You want to tell them how much mash sold recently? You were sure. 20, 2,900 bags they sold at Cumberland Fairgrounds. So that was that was eight days. At six bucks a bag. We used to sell it to three, and then, because we didn't want to, we wanted to compete with the carnies that we didn't. Then when people started buying it, they're like, oh, we really like this stuff. So then we went to five. And then this last year, we went to six. So it was kind of a universal. What was that you were selling? Maple cotton candy. Oh. 247. Oh, all right. I, I was going to add to that. You can buy a decent machine for about 200. And it breaks down if you buy the cones the sugar in the bags to 27 cents per cotton candy. So, and you're selling it for five to eight dollars depending on what your market is. So this is 245 degree syrup right here. I don't want to too much of this burn. So I'm gonna this is the walnut three pound bag, so I'll stir a little bit of time. So as you, as you put these in, it's going to look a little glossy. And then you kind of lose faith and say, geez, I didn't put enough syrup in this thing. But as you keep going. How much did you put in there? Two cups. Two cups of syrup. And it's 245 degrees. <coughs> so look, see how it's a little glossy on the inside of it? You're gonna try to coat as much of that those nuts as you can. 
Me and you might want to tell them, don't use a plastic spoon. Don't use a plastic spoon. <laughs> it's going to be stuck in there. <laughs> uh, I learned don't stir your um, syrup, and this was a little mistake. Don't stir your syrup with a cedar spoon if you don't like cedar, but it does taste really good if you like cedar. <laughs> <laughs> we made maple candy cedar flavor. So notice it still has a little bit of gloss to it. We're going to try to stir that gloss out of it and make it into a sugar. It'll stack the coat over. So how many cups of syrup did you start out with? Two cups. And you put that boil down to yeah. 45? I mean, I don't know. It probably went down to one and a half by the time okay. it was ready to go. How much you have in that? Three pounds. Three pounds of Fun, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Make sure you're in that $8 bag. Yes. <laughs> do you do salted or unsalted or I, Well, I use salted for most of it. So you see now it's starting to sugar over. See how it's starting to turn? Then the air starts to get introduced with it. you add butter to that? What I have done before is I put butter on the rim because sometimes that, that syrup boils up and you're afraid it's going to boil over. So, once I put butter on the rim, it seems to calm down after that. But this, is, this pot is pretty good for about three pounds. Um, just a little bit more. Ten more minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, the interesting thing about these, about these pots is that you can't get everything out at once. So, we'll go ahead and tip it into the tray. Like out here. There'll always be a little bit on the bottom that's kind of stuck. So all you gotta do is mix that in too. What are you making? Huh? What are you making? It'd be maple walnuts. You just sell them as nuts. Yep. Candy nuts, maple walnuts. Yep. Awesome. So this is my last bag of nuts for today. This is <laughs> so this is what you're going to look like when you come out with What I usually do is put them on a sheet pan and put them in the oven, but don't, don't turn the oven on so at least they'll dry overnight. They're going to be a little wet by the time you're done, but you're going to want to probably dry them out a little bit as you go. So that's the story on the nuts. Can we do that now? Yeah. Okay. Questions on the nuts at all? Well, she's getting ready. Would, would you tell us again about that hot candy, that mixture that you did? Yep. So, um, had it arrived, yeah. the maple uh, maple sugar that I had ordered from Baskin's, it was a maple powder, comes in a five pound bag. So, for every five cups of white sugar, white sugar, white sugar, we're going to do one cup of maple powder. Now, that you know, that's that's not the gospel. If you look at some of the stuff, sometimes when you mix it, and then white sugar is kind of weird when you when you use it, because sometimes it's a lot lighter. <coughs> but you want to have that that kind of that golden tint to it when you put it into the top of the cotton candy machine. So as you <coughs> add it in, you might want to throw a little bit more into color. But for the most part, the general thumb is about between four and five cups to one cup of maple powder, and it'll look just like confectionery sugar. It's just a powder. Um, and honestly, I'm not quite sure what the, the cost of those uh, machines are now. We haven't bought them in a while. Um, I think theirs was like 1800 1800 yeah. That's commercial. Yep. Can you we, do it in a non-commercial? Well, here, here's the thing. If you go down to the hardware store and try to rent one, it's not going to be the one you need. You're going to be very frustrated with it. Because usually they come in one band. There's a one band on them. The ones that we have, we use for the fairs and stuff are two bands. They're a gold medal. They're really the highest amperage you can use on a 120 of them. Um, I think they're called a Whirlwind. Yeah, when you rent right from the, they're what's they're that? Maple, they call it Maple Floss or something. Yeah, Maple Floss or, it's the one gold medal sells that's the highest amperage you can use. If you use one from the hardware store, you're gonna get kind of frustrated because it doesn't work right. You're never gonna get a good spread of cotton candy coming out of it, unlike the newer ones. And the other ones, the newer ones, you have to adjust the temperature too because if you have a really humid day, you're going to have to cut back on the temperature because otherwise it's just going to, it's going to stick to the sides and you're not going to, it's going to, it's going to be a mess. So 
What I always was told is that you know, all you're doing is selling air. You're bagging the maple, but you're selling the air. <laughs> so uh, it's really an art, but I would encourage everybody, if they have the opportunity in the market for it, to, to try it out because it's it's definitely it's definitely made a lot of producers be able to get that that cash flow to buy their equipment. Um, the way we figure it is that when we do maple, we maple pot candy at the fair, it helps us pay our rent. Our, our state association does it at the state fair every year as a fundraiser, and they, they give us ninety percent of profits the Department of Ag does. And so we use maple granulated sugar. We make it out of dark syrup. And so we use maple granulated sugar, and we use one cup of granulated one cup of white sugar, and it does really good. We got one gold medal. Uh, 30, 70, 70s are the length of loss, and it does really good. But, but yeah, you can make the granulated yourself. And we, we sell hundreds and hundreds of bags every year. Did you say one cup to four? We, you, yeah. It's yeah. 20, yeah. 20, 20, 20, 20, 80 mixed yeah. yeah. We did really good with that. It shouldn't run good. I've seen 25% and a five-gallon bucket of mix, the mixture. It's about 150 bags of hot candy. Yeah, I mean, for every... For every 20 pounds of white sugar, you could probably get about 200 bags out of that, roughly. I mean, that's all variable on the temperature and how good your, how good cotton candy is going. Ben, I wanted to make a little testament that uh, <laughs> when we went to Maine on our tour several years ago, that was the first time we'd ever had the maple cotton candy. And I don't know how many of you have ever had it, <clears throat> but when we came back, it was a little bit like a, a junkie going through withdrawal. <laughs> we knew that we wouldn't be able to get it again. And so if you've never had it, um, I don't know what to compare it to, but it's it's way better than what you think it's going to be. Uh, it's addictive. Yes. Uh, really, really good stuff. Yes. It, draws a, it draws a different crowd than you probably normally get from just a maple crowd itself. You know, the normal folks that would come and buy me just a, a jug of sugar or a jug of uh, maple syrup. This crowd, you know, you're, you open up a whole family, you know, so the like cash will flow once you start getting into that type of Do you think you could dry down the bourbon maple syrup to bourbon maple sugar and have bourbon <laughs> <laughs> I think, like Nate said, though, it doesn't, uh, your bourbon flavor comes out of the water. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. So we have to put the cotton candy on top of the cocktail. Okay. Or you could just eat the cotton candy half black. Yeah. Shot. <laughs> don't color. You don't color. You don't color. No food color. No, no, no. And that, some people have asked us over the years. You know, we wrench a machine out for a party, and I'm like, no. <laughs> the only thing that goes in this is maple sugar, because if you're going to make that kind of an investment on that thing, you really want to keep it just to maple sugar and not put cake and ingredients and all of that. Because otherwise, it's just going to it's going to mess up your product on the other end. You I do know, think I, the darker the syrup, the better. The darker the sugar is, the more maple flavor it does have. Yeah. So, yeah it does make a make a difference. So, good use of real of darker syrup. Um, back to the nuts, and you can show that little bag. Is that by weight, or do you, like? Usually, I go by cup. Right. You could weigh. Okay. I mean, you oh. could weigh them too. Yeah. Okay. Usually, what we do, we we use a universal dollars. label. We put for a cup. You know, okay. two cups, three cups, three cups. But and we've done really well. Like I, I believe when we finished out Maple uh, Private Fair this just last month, we went through about probably 150 pounds of nuts. Yeah, yeah. But that was mixed and pecans and it was just a bunch of everything. <coughs> you know, some people come along, they want like mixed nuts, as other people come along, they want pecans. So, yeah. You know, and almonds. Almonds are good stuff too. And I know Jeremy's favorite is chip cashew. <laughs> <laughs> He's a cashew fan. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, any questions on the nuts at all? Was it, it was 219 you heated the syrup? 245. 245. 245, and then take it right off, and then start mixing the nuts in. That's like what we did. That's, that's why I was a little nervous, because I didn't want to burn the pan off. I've done it before, and it really stinks. <laughs> so, yeah, and like I said, spread them out on a, on a cookie tray. Uh, don't turn the oven on, and just let them dry overnight, because they're going to be wet. It's going to take a little while for them to dry out.
Have you ever tried this peanut? Yeah, you know, peanuts we did years ago, but we couldn't sell them. And I don't know why, if it wasn't just because it was allergies, allergies but it was like everybody could get honey roasted peanuts. So when we started getting into like pecans and walnuts and all those things, and I'm not really a huge walnut fan because I think they taste pretty bitter, but actually those are good sugar on You want to start off your thing? Sure. So Emma picked out this recipe. So, so first you want to spray the pan so it won't stick at the very end, like a normal best recipe. And then for the egg wash, you want to add, I'm reading off the recipe, um, five large eggs. Um, one half cup of half and half, three tablespoons of maple syrup, two tablespoons of bourbon, if it's optional. Um, you can replace it with apple cider or ha um, half and half. One teaspoon of vanilla extract, um, one or one fourth teaspoon of salt, um, or you can use any type of bread. And then I already have it already mixed. So and then. Just take off the abs. You just dip it in your pan or your mixture. Bring it off. And then you just place it. Okay. And just repeat. So when she first started culinary arts, she did, the first two weeks of school, they came home with cookies every day. And I said, when are you going to come home with some meatloaf or something? <laughs> <laughs> so so when, she, when she's get done with this recipe, she's going to bring that back to culinary arts. So everybody in Lake Region will have uh, French toast. <laughs> we had a breakfast in it. I'm done with breakfast. <laughs> you just repeat over and over again until you want so many breakfast. So much fresh. <coughs> you can't really mess this up. I mean, you can. You can't really mess up the egg wash. You can put cinnamon in it. You can put. You can put whatever in it. There. I got all that. And then next is the syrup that I was talking about earlier. And that had, um, I had brown sugar. It didn't have the amount of brown sugar, so I just guesstimated. Um, maple syrup, bourbon, and cinnamon. And it's just, you just put in how much is your desire, and it turned out really good. You want it more thicker. This one is more soupier, but other ones that I've made are more thicker than the rest. So, it's more like a bronze color. So. Tell them how to tell them when you put it on. When you put that on, you get the put on right after you do those. Yeah, you put it on right after you. So much. Right after your egg wash, you just drizzle it on. <coughs> you want to make sure you get in between every piece of bread. Sometimes it just doesn't. So you have to like peel it back the bread. And then the apples. <coughs> And then you put this on, we um, had to get it like to go, you put it on medium to low heat. And then once you have everything on, you want to cover it with tin foil over the top, put it on for 350, in the oven it goes. After about 25 minutes, you want to take it back out, undo the tin foil, 
and then put it back in the oven for 20 minutes. And then it'll be all done. And then you can, until like the crust is about like that. Everybody gets something for it. This is what it's supposed to look like. And they can put I hope you guys are hungry. <laughs> Eggs, on top. How long are you cooking your apples in your start mixture before you finish? Um, eight minutes-ish. It depends on like how thick you want. <coughs> like yeah. Any questions? Yeah, what apples are you using? Um, we got dollars from Costco. We didn't know that the Highland <laughs> County representative was going to be here today, so <laughs> <laughs> we would have got some. <laughs> 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 Um, you make a lot of candy. We do. Now, what the common question I get that I don't have the best answers. I don't really make candy, but people ask about it going white versus not. What is where's the what's the what's going on with that? How do you make candy that doesn't kind of turn white on you? So the question was is that sometimes when you make candy, it does turn white. It just has to break down. Now, there's, there's two theories on that. The, the, the candy we make really is never meant for shelf life for a long period of time. So we'll just make a batch of candy, spread it out on the, on the, uh, the molds, let it dry, and then package it up and it goes out the door. The other theory behind that is, is that if you want it for a long-term shelf life, you can take like a pan and find a, something to submerge it in. So you want to heat your syrup up to 160 degrees for a coating. You'd submerge it in there and coat it, so it would create another layer on top of that other piece of candy. Um, and then you would take it out, you know, uh, strain it out, and then put it back on sheets. That's that's kind of like a a coating for a long term. We don't do a lot of that because the the events that we do are usually like day or two day. <coughs> Some of the people that are doing that stuff, you know, they'll wholesale to like a, a store or you know a seasonal place or whatever. Um, that's kind of what their thing is. We make candy, um, and there is kind of a stigma in the candy world that the lighter the better. But we made some really good uh, <coughs> candy out of medium syrup. Uh, you know, rich, robust, whatever you want to call it. Although I will say, I made some, some candy out of some really dark syrup, and it kind of looked like coal. <laughs> so uh, you got to kind of be a little picky on how, deep, how dark the syrup you want it to be. but. Um, and you can judge, you'll be able to tell once you make a batch of candy whether that's really good. If that's going to go on the, uh, the for sale shelf or it's going to go to Christmas presents. So, and it, the, the coating process takes kind of like a, another day to do. So, you know, when you're trying to whip out candy for a fair or a Sunday or whatever, you know, you got to balance whether it's worth it to spend the time doing that or, you know, putting up in the pints of syrup. So. Yeah. Oh. So I grew up in Vermont and we didn't have all this fancy stuff. They just pretty much had sugar on snow. Yep. I've seen anybody else that does that here. It's, uh, it's really not as much expense as you know, the snow is just shaved ice. It's a little cup of maple syrup, but it sells big. Now, what temperature do you put it on? That's a tricky thing. 260. 260? Exactly. Yeah. So, so you know one of the things that ended up the sugar on snow parties? Yeah. COVID. Right. So. The people that used to buy those, uh, I call them like a freeze tray, they're like a table, and they would create ice on them, and people would heat syrup up to 260 in this. But basically it's tap, yeah. you know, and they give you a, a tongue depressor and you roll it up and it's put it on. A slice pickle. Yep, yep, old school, good, yep. Um, it's, it's another person that, that's another job for somebody that, you know, that, if that's what their job is, you know, that's all they're going to do all day. The temperature of the syrup, I never can remember that. 260 is yeah, what we've, we've yeah, done. That's not exactly right. It won't work. It just melt the yeah. ice and it won't work. We've made, we've made taffy, but not on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was on a pan. And that was boiling up and bubbling up. Yeah, that was expensive. That was very expensive. Uh, anything else? Say we've had problems making the maple candy in the molds because we took the temperature too high and it was taffy in the molds. Yeah. And after it's taffy, it won't go on. You're stuck with taffy. You yeah, once, once you're there, you're there. You're never going to go back. Well, of course, sometimes you don't start and I have to do taffy also. Sometimes you don't start. Yeah. Usually it's not the temperature too high. It's probably not. Yeah.
Yeah. We stirred and stirred and stirred. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did try a dream version. It was so, so high that it wouldn't never count. It wouldn't never count until the ship was dissolved. How long can you store the cotton candy for it to stay fresh? Well, that's a good question. It all depends on the humidity you have. So if you're, if you're making bags and bags of cotton candy, it's kind of like a little iron to closing up the top of it. So you kind of like pick it together and then twirl it. But remember, that candy that's in there is going to shrink. So I'd say probably a couple days. I mean, if you go more than probably two days, you're probably going to want to add more to it. Which is actually not a bad thing because if you come in and your bags are shrunk a little bit, you add a little more and it freshens up, not like you have to throw it away or anything. You know? If you refrigerate it, it lasts longer. Okay. When we came back from Maine, it kicked because we had it in the back of a pickup truck yep. and it was very cold. And if you try to make it down here, it, you lose half of it overnight. You right. like, yeah. It shrinks right down. Yeah. So that's what we've been able to we've been able to do really well with, with our cotton candy sales. You know, <laughs> and during Nickel Sunday. Because if anybody has any opportunity to come to Maine, um, the fourth weekend in March is Maine Nickel Sunday in Open House. Uh, we used to just do Sundays, but now we do Saturday. And um, the funny part about it is, is that 30 years ago, the state never really recognized me Nickel Sunday because it was just a bunch of sugar makers that got together and thought they were going to show up stuff. And now that we actually bring revenue into the state, the state of Maine has a radar on it. So they do all these studies and justify jobs and all that other stuff. So uh, economic developments involved. And any newspaper that uh, wants that wants you to advertise with them will call you two or three weeks in advance to put ads in the paper. They used to advertise for free because there wasn't that many people. Now it's a different business. So once you guys get up and running on a big scale with Kentucky Maple Day, you're going to have more places that will want you to spend ads and advertise. And, of course, the best advertising is the free stuff. But um, we've had we've had pretty good luck with that. We've had a couple of news stations come out over the years and do some stories on us. So it's been good. <clears throat> Having the complaints there, but it does it does get pricey when you have to advertise. So I think that's it.